Yo. <laughs> Welcome everybody to your favorite open debate insanity feral wine mom slam poetry Virginia slam podcast where we open it up to the haters to the tomatoes to the wanna be debaters to come on and offer their best challenge their best argument their best critique as you know it always ends up being a very entertaining event that's just an added bonus for me in the midst of the lost art of debate that we try to preserve we try to try to promote try to maintain keep afloat we got some people uh, popping in We've got a few people requesting to speak already as you know the topic is not conspiracies Middle East politics it's not poetry it's not your bars you're not gonna beat me in a rap battle so just give up but you are allowed to call in and talk about your best arguments about the existence or the non-existence of God the transcendental argument what the logos is the logos logi distinction the essence energy distinction Roman Catholicism the papacy the history of the church the history of religion metaphysics all of those are on the table all of those are fair game as they say if you call in and you talk about other topics or you make non-arguments, I will make jokes. You will get your feelings hurt. You will cry. You will be butt hurt. You will make exposed videos about me. So just, I'm just prophesying and telling you what's going to happen if you disobey the rules. And it will only be to your own demise, to your own detriment. But you may do that if you so choose. No one can stop the freedom train known as free will. Anyway, as you know the way it works, you request to speak via Twitter spaces. I then let you on. Your job is to then make an argument, make a challenge, make a proposition a claim and assertion then you back it up with theses not theses a lot of y'all spit theses out of your mouth theses that demonstrate or prove the initial claim or argument it's that simple although hardly anybody in today's society seems able to actually do that so i want to give preference today to people that disagree uh, <laughs> if you have a Q&A question, that's fine. Keep that maybe towards the end of the show. So I already see people chiming in who agree and probably have questions, which is fine. But preference to those who disagree. So maybe you are an atheist. Maybe you are an agnostic. Maybe you are a <clears throat> Zoroastrian. A Zoroastrian. Maybe you are a... I don't know. What else? What's the other options? A Muslimist. <laughs> Maybe you are a, a, a Discordian. <laughs> Maybe you are a, a Hindu. A him, though. You was a he do, a she do. Now you a him, though. Maybe you're a Papist, a Roman Catholic, and you're going to prove the papacy to us maybe i don't know what's what's all the world religions can you can we list them all do you do y'all remember them there's a jim jonesian maybe you're a jim jones follower you're like the last two or three jim jonesians and you got you got issues because you think you're the keeper of the true flame maybe the maybe the jim jones had it all right 
And we just misunderstood. He just misunderstood when he when he Kool-Aided all them people. You just misunderstood. <laughs> Maybe you're an Orthodox Redditor. We got some people in the YouTube chat talking smack. Maybe you're a Neo Gagan. Excuse me, a pagan. Maybe you're a Ast Astafarian. You can come on. Maybe you're a 33rd degree Masonics person. He wanted them Masonics. Anyway, maybe you're an ancient uh, Carthaginian and you believe in human sacrifice. Maybe you're an Aztecian. Maybe you're a thuggy. Remember the thuggies? Some of that Temple of Doom action. Om Nam Shiva. Om Nam Shiva. About to break my heart by ripping it out. If you're still a thuggy out there. Calling all my thuggies. Not thugs. We got a lot of thug healers on TikTok that Tristan and I have been calling out. I mean, we did a baller ass stream yesterday about the history of rap music. AKA the history of my music. My background. Y'all know I'm the first greatest rapper in the world. Tristan Haggard is the second greatest rapper in the world. <laughs> anyway, we're going to open it up <clears throat> back to the topic because, you know, I'll just sit here talking a bunch of damn, damn nonsense about thuggies all day long. Kalima, Kalima Shakti Day. That's the traditional thuggy right liturgy. So maybe some of y'all were at the traditional thuggy right liturgy today. If so, let me know your best argument for why we need to be thuggies. Alexander calls in. Now, we had a Gnostic man. He said, I'm on it. He said, I'm there, dude. Uh, I don't know where, where you at, dude. Let me see if he's, uh, he's, he's like, I'm ready to debate you. He says, I've figured out 5,000 years of religious history. And he says, I'm ready. Okay, dude. As you know, we give you the floor, dog. So here you go. I would start making jokes, but you know, people can't handle jokes. See that that's the other thing. People think, oh, when I come on there, he's mean. We've always treated this in a very lighthearted manner, in a very humoristic way. You know, we joke around. It's not a big deal. Hey, a lot of people can't handle it. I made a serial killer joke. One dude said, got mad said I was calling him a serial killer. It's just, man, people don't understand jokes. They don't understand humor. They, it's just, it's getting crazy. So anyway, I don't know where the Gnostic man is. Alexander's on the scene. Unmute. We got a t-shirt made that says unmute. Oh, um, am I audible? Yes, sir. Hey, um, Professor Dyer, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I really appreciate you for that. <laughs> Oh, it's fine. I'm not. I'm not a professor, but that's fine. Oh, okay. Um. Anyways, I guess I'll start it off. I'll just ask you a, a question, and then, and then I guess if you can justify it, maybe you can prove God. If if God's real, I guess my question to you would be: Is why why does He allow so many bad things and tragedies to happen? Right. So, have you ever looked at responses to the problem of evil? Like, evil meaning like... The objection that you're giving is the problem of evil objection. So I'm just wondering because it's kind of been... Basically because I'm, because I'm saying that I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I was, I'm thinking in the concept or the extraction that there is evil. I'm considering that there's good and that there must, and that must come from like the divine, like God. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just asking if you've ever looked at any of the responses. I mean, there's a lot of different ways people approach the problem of evil objection. But one objection that I tend to use is just simply that if God doesn't exist, then we're going to need a basis for the standard by which we judge good and evil. So there are correct implications for when we deny the real metaphysical existence of the good. 
one of those implications would be that we no longer have a standard by which to judge either good or evil. And that standard came from God. In the Christian worldview, yeah. Well, then I guess my next question, outside of the Christian world... No, worldview. Yeah, yeah, that that worldview. I mean, I apologize. My first time on the show, so I'm a bit uh, jittery. Um, So outside of that view, my question is this, is that then if if that's not the case then there there can be no good and evil and then one act doesn't mean anything so then how do we define anything that's then then i then i'm just like a little bit confused how do how, how do how does anyone make sense from right and wrong then no it's not saying that there is no it's it's a hypothetical you understand you understand what that is right Yes. Right. Gotcha. So it's, it's, it's just saying that the comparison is between two paradigms. One paradigm has an account for good and evil as metaphysical things, or in the case of evil, not a thing, but a privation or a move of the will against the good. The other worldview, which would be like the atheist materialist paradigm, typically doesn't have any account for and is really premised on denying metaphysics. So the problem is that when you deny metaphysics as a whole, and that would be things like good, bad, the will, um, you know, meaning, um, even ethics ultimately would be part of metaphysics because we're talking about value judgments. Then there's not a there's not a basis to make an argument or even a sentence at all. So before I will hear out the argument, but the the transcendental argument is an argument prior to predication, prior to making claims at all so you're gonna have to give an account for how you have values at all because to say that the christian worldview is a violation of uh the paradigm of good and evil right or that it's a violation of some ethical norm that god violates by permitting free creatures to commit evil actions we need a basis for the standard by which you're saying it's evil or what is evil What's good and evil if there's not a God, basically? Yeah, and that's where it kind of gets gray, because, uh, like, one thing I was just thinking of, and then I'll guess I'll mute, I, it, is that basically when, like, for example, uh, and this is kind of like a, a side thought, but a lot of times I notice or I observe, like, a lot of atheists for example, they say, oh, I don't believe in God or this, or, or whatever the, you know, the reasoning is. A lot of times I notice they have, like, a lot of, like, hard trauma or yeah. something that's, like, not right in their mind. And then it's, like, they hate something, and I don't even know if they know what they know what they hate. Right. But then they just, that that internal, like, war Mm-hmm. It's used out like a lot of times I see it like maybe like kids or like say yeah kids or even young adults like teens out on their parents because maybe maybe their parent was you know they they hold those beliefs and it's like oh well you know it's like this whole confusing like thing it's almost uh-huh, like they're yeah. at war with God and then that then now they're at war with everyone who doesn't think just like them. Yeah, I think that a lot of times that's the personal psychological motivation for atheism. Of course, they'll say, well, that's that doesn't really disprove my position. And that's true. There's no there's no psychological report that proves or disproves any position. So positions stand on their own objectively, whether they're true or false, based on the actual argumentation. But yeah, I think you're right about that being a common psychological trait. But what we're getting at here is just basically that in order to make the argument about the problem of evil to argue at all requires the requires giving an account for something more fundamental and that's what the transcendental argument is doing is that it's saying that the things that you're using to argue or make sentences at all can only work in a worldview or a paradigm where god exists there's metaphysics there's an external world there's objective standards there's universals there's laws of logic all those things have to be the case for you to even make a sentence. So that's what, what, what I'm saying is that the problem of evil argument doesn't work because it's not addressing 
the transcendental argument and how the transcendental argument points out that if you if there is no god or good then there is no basis for good or evil does that make sense or not really um yeah like yeah i just feel bad for those people <laughs> like i don't know how it's like they're just gripping for straws i uh, there's one uh Many years ago, you probably didn't see this, but um, Michael Savage was on the air with um, Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've seen and, those interviews. Okay, yeah. And um, he just came out, like, he just got um, side swacked by um, Ben because uh, he took over his show or whatever, and it was some, like, dirty dealing going on, and they were talking about it. But also, he had a new book come out. I forget the name of the book, but the book was basically kind of him searching for God. And a lot of times, uh, it was just kind of about, uh, I'm trying to remember, but it's like the whole point of his, like many experiences in his life where he's just searching and searching and searching. And it's like, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I haven't really heard any real actual proof or evidence for God, but it's like, I'm, I'm in, I'm stuck in that same paradox of like, uh, I, is it in the clouds? Is it in the eye of this child? Is it? in this art is you know but i'm i'm in this big universe but uh just the fact that i'm i'm seeking for this but you know like i don't hear anything back and uh, i don't know it's maybe this is kind of like christian paradox or i i don't know what how to preface it but it's just like my last little like comment on it yeah just me okay yeah those are good good questions i mean <clears throat> I guess my answer to that about the way God speaks is through, first of all, divine revelation. So that would be, you know, what's contained in the Orthodox Bible and the teaching of the church. It would be uh, eventually more and more of a direct interaction and sense of God's presence. But that's something that comes after, I think, you know, a time of purification, repentance, and so forth. And that's what, what we do as part of our life in the church. So I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just pointing out that the problem of evil issue is rather a consequence of the reality of free will and the reality of secondary causes that creatures can engage in. So why God chose to uh, permit the world to be that way there's not any obligation on God's part to reveal to all of his finite creatures, all of the infinite variations of created causes as to why it's this way. And if you read the book of Job, the answer is more so we can't really in this life comprehend all of the different created causal chains and how things work together for the good, as Paul says in Romans eight. So there is a, there is an element of mystery there with, uh, you know, how does pro divine sovereignty and providence and free will all work together. And one thing I would say is that this is an expectation that no worldview can actually answer. And Christianity is not a worldview that gives you every answer to every problem. It's a worldview that gives you a, an account of knowledge, ethics, and metaphysics as possibilities to even use or to engage in. That doesn't mean that every aspect or element of the physical world or science or knowledge or metaphysics is immediately knowable or demonstrable. So the transcendental argument is addressing the preconditions to knowledge, to making sentences, to making meaning at all. And that's why I think it's the more, I mean, it's really the best uh, philosophical argument for God's existence, right? Uh, it's not the only reason that people come to believe in God. There's many reasons why we come to believe what we believe. But it's in terms of the domain of logic and philosophy, I think it's it's the best argument. But um, anyway, thank you guys for those uh, super chats. And those are good questions. Now, uh, the guy who wanted to come and chat, uh, Jeremy is in the chat. So Jeremy, if you want to, you can. I'll, I'll invite you to speak. And, uh, you know, you can have the floor and make uh, whatever arguments you'd like about, um, 
your specific your specific uh, religious position. So, did you want to come on, Jeremy? You got to have your uh, mic turned on or whatever. I think I need to leave. No, there you are. Okay, I'm going to give you the ability to speak. So you just got to unmute yourself, and then you can <clears throat> make whatever arguments you want. Hey, Jay, thanks for having me. Sure. Um, I have a quick question, and the question is, why do we call him God? Um, I would say in our position, ultimately, because of the characteristics of what he's revealed about himself. So, you know, God for us would mean the person of the Father and the attributes that go along with him, being omniscient, being omnibenevolent, being, you know, uh, omnipresent, omnipotent, uh, etc. Okay, so what I'm getting at is his name in the Old Testament is spelled yod heh right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, this is really more of an etymology question. In the English Bibles and throughout the world, why do we use the name God instead of whatever, however you pronounce his name? That's where I'm going with this. Well, I think the Greek term theos is usually what is used, and it's just the word in the Greek that stands for Yahweh or the Lord or whatever. Okay, so you're getting close. Theos is the Greek word, but it's also used of the creator of angels, of demons, and sometimes of men. Right. The Hebrew, the Hebrew equivalent is Elohim, and mm -hmm. Elohim is also used directly of the creator of angels, of demons, and it's also used of men. That's Correct. Where... So can, can I respond to that? Yes. Yeah, so I'm aware of that, and that's that's because the term G-O-D is a generic term. It's not a proper noun unless it picks out a specific person. And this is an argument that we've made many, many times to Muslims, for example. So I'm familiar with what you're saying, but um, capital T, Theos, uh, for us, is picking out the person of the Father. But it, you're absolutely correct that Elohim or uh, gods in the sense of when Jesus says, I've said ye are gods, that could refer to an angel, uh, a demon, or a human. We agree. All right, sweet. So with that being said, what we're translating as God is either Theos or Elohim. But yod heh vav is a different word. So whenever we, in the, in the Tanakh or in the Old Testament, when we translate uh, yod heh vav Elohim, we translate that as Lord God. So we're not even using the term God for the creator's name. We're using a title Lord. Well, I mean, in our view, God is, again, a term that picks out either a divine person, the divine nature, or the divine energies or operations in the Old Testament. We're, spe we're speaking here of, of God, the triad, the Trinity. So I believe in the Trinity as an Orthodox Christian. And in our view, uh, Jesus is called the uh, face of Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh, then he's given the name of Yahweh throughout the Old Testament. So uh, it sounds like a, a what we call a word concept fallacy, where the idea is that a word has a single referent. But in the case of Theos or Lord, um, it could refer to a created Lord or it could refer to the uncreated Lord or God. Okay, so I'm with you on all that. So, And, and by the way, you know, Jesus died rose again three days later, so at the right hand, and his father's name is, you know, yod heh so I'm with you on all that. You don't think that oh. Jesus is Yahweh? Well, he's divine, but he is not the father. No, I think they're different aspects. Look, there are things the father know that Jesus doesn't know. Well, are there degrees of divinity? Yes. Well, in, in the sense of the divine nature, there can't be degrees of it, right? So the divine nature, for example, is simple. It's uncomposite. It's outside of time. It's impassable. Uh, it's not acted upon. These are all classic ideas of what divine nature or the uncreated nature of God signifies. So there couldn't be, if Jesus is fully divine, there couldn't be degrees of, of that. Or a quarter or a half of the divine essence or something like that. Right, but angels and demons are divine beings, yes? Divine in a different sense. So there are different, you just contradict yourself, right? No, it's not the sense in the first sense. <laughs> okay, so there's so two different sense no, divine. Not in the sense of God's divinity. Okay. So when we call a an angel Elohim, or when they're called gods, it's picking out a created thing. We're talking about uncreated nature. So you understand it's a word concept fallacy. It might be, 
except every demon in the Bible that's listed, and I've got every one of them up here. I can I can uh, go through the whole list for you, both in Greek and in Hebrew. They are all translated exactly as they are transliterated, meaning. They are all translated in our English Bibles exactly as they sound in their original languages. Would you agree with that? Translated as they sound. What do, what do you mean? So I'm going to give you a few for instances as an example. So Baal is sounds like Baal in the Hebrew. Baal Perith sounds like Baal Perith. Uh, mm-hmm. Hold on. Yeah, the, and we believe those are fallen angels. Yes. Merodach is Merodach. Nebo is Nebo. A mm-hmm. Jermelech, a Jermelech, so on and so forth. Right. Now, there are two demons in Isaiah 65, 11 that are not translated. Their names are completely untranslated. Have you ever looked up that verse? Yeah, I've read Isaiah many, many times. All right. In Isaiah 65, 11, there's two demons in there. They're either they're translated in the King James or the Geneva Bibles as troop and number. But in every translation post-1970, they're translated as fortune and destiny with capital F and a capital D. And the way that I found this was I was researching the origins of hard determinism in Christianity. And so I chased that from Lorraine Bautner in, in 1936 with his tulip thesis back to John Calvin, who got all of his ideas from, and Martin Luther. They got their ideas from Augustine of Hippo. Augustine of Hippo got all of his ideas. I, from I used to be a Calvinist. I've studied at Calvinist Seminary. I'm aware. Yes, sir. Good. So in Isaiah 65, 11, you have two demons that are translated as fortune and destiny. Do you happen to know what their names are? Well, how is this going to prove your point? Because, I mean, I agree that they're demons. Um, if, if these are demons in the text, when I look at Isaiah 65, 11, I mean, you're saying that it's the, quote, modern translations, but, uh, okay, I mean, demons are created. So how, is this, how does this prove your point? Because their names are God and Manny. They're spelled G-D, Gimel Dalit, and M N Y Mem Nun Yod. Okay. It looks like, and their names are technically pronounced God and Money. You mean you think that the English terminology of the meaning in English of a Hebrew word is the same? No. What I'm telling you is in Hebrew, that is how you pronounce that word G D is okay. God. <laughs> this is a word concept fallacy. So you think that the modern english term god is referencing that that that's predicting that we worship quote god but it's a demon is that what you think so so that comes back to my first question is what is the etymology of the english word god it just means theos it just refers to it picks out theos when we're talking about god the father but it also refers to other things yes that's what that's that's how we define it but i'm talking about etymology where'd it come from that's etymology now, etymology is it came from this word and this language and this vernacular, and that's how we all say it. Okay, isn't that what you're asking? Right. Well, so can you just say what your can you just say what your position is? You're asking me all these questions. And just what's the position that you're arguing for? Sure. So the hard determinism of Christianity, which is Calvinism, comes from those two demons, God and Manny, the demons of fortune and the demons of destiny. One's a male and one's a female. And they just change their names every now and then, i.e. God and Mary. And what happened was the demon God... God and Mary? Mary? Yeah. Yeah, you just change you just change Manny a little bit and you get Mary. So what happened was yeah, this the is, demon God... This is Looney Tunes, man. I'm not trying to be mean to you, but... <laughs> All right. Changing Thank it... For having me. Changing one letter... Yeah, it makes all the difference, right? Correct. So how do you jump from that to Mary? Because the demons God and Manny are, it's the same cherub in different civilizations. It's Amun-Ra in Egypt and Horus. It's God and Manny in Babylon. It's Jupiter and Pluto in... And you think that's the, you think that's the Virgin Mary? Well, I'm saying that's the cherub that's presenting himself as Mary for the Catholics. How would you ever come up with Yeah, how would you, it's just, this is, how would you come to that? Because I wrote a 93,000 word book on it and I researched it. That that doesn't explain how you came to the conclusion. That just tells me what you did. Well, what rephrase your question. It's a non sequitur. So first of all, changing one letter in many words gives 
very different conclusions and reference to as to who the word is picking out. So the fact that you're saying that, well, I just changed one letter. And it's really close to Mary. I mean, that's this is like, you don't see why that would be a problem. Well, if you look up Mem Nun Yod in Hebrew, Nun is a letter that's used to change a name and to disguise a name. Okay. So are you familiar with like the way, let me give you an example of where this would be a problem. Like the way that Freemasons talk about Solomon. Have you heard this argument where they say, well, look at the name Solomon. It's Sol, it's Om, and it's On. Sol is the Latin for the sun and the sun god. Om is the, uh, you know, hint, the, the Buddhist uh, Om, right, chant that they do. On is the Egyptian deity On. Now, the word Solomon is a English transliteration of Shalom. Has nothing to do with soul, om, and on. Okay, so there's there's a tendency in a lot of esoteric-minded people, um, or Masonic-minded people, various Hermeticists or whoever. I'm not accusing you of that. I don't fully know your position, but I'm just stating that it's all kind of based on. If you're familiar with Jordan Maxwell, for example, the famous conspiracy dude, right? He would always kind of come up with these creative um, switching of reference to show that. Uh, because the in one context the word means this, in another context the word means something very di very different. The word then is meaning both things or can be uh, identified with one referent. So do you do you know what I when I'm saying that it's a word version of word concept fallacy? Do you know what I mean by that? I agree with you 100 percent. With you spot on. But how would you agree with me if that's what I'm saying is the move here that you're making that's a mistake? Because you can find God in the text, in the Hebrew text, and it was covered up. If you'll indulge me just for one more quick point before you can me. I'm listening. All right. So let us let's assume that God and Manny are the demons of Bab or the Babylonian demons of luck or fortune and destiny or fate. Um, and I stumbled upon them. You asked how I found this. Let me answer that first because you did ask that question. The way that I found this was um, when I was researching the elect, I wanted every time the word the elect, choose, or chosen was used in the Bible, and I was going to put it in an Excel spreadsheet so that I could show you that it was just a mundane word where somebody was choosing something. There's 224 instances of that, and the way that I found Isaiah 65 11 is because the Creator chose Israel for destruction because of something they did. That's how I found Isaiah 65 11, was just by doing my homework. So let's assume that God and money are the demons of luck and fate. Um, in Luke, whenever Jesus is telling them that you cannot serve both God and money, assume our proposition is true. The reason that he's telling them that you can't serve them both is because you either live your life as if everything is chance or luck, or you live your life as if everything is fate or destiny. That's why you can't serve those two masters. I mean, again, this has nothing to do with the Virgin Mary. Where do you, I just, this is, I can't, I just don't understand. How do you conclude that that's Mary? Mary Mary's a tertiary item anyway. Yeah, but it demonstrates the the wildness of this. Do you don't see why this would be a problem? Oh, it is, it is absolutely wild. I agree. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, so what is the true religion? Like what, what is it to you? the way I and mean, that is what well so in here's my opinion that you're not going to hear anywhere else i think the way which was home groups meeting in their homes your your pastor your evangelist your apostle those were all functions that people did they were not titles that were given to them by professionally credentialed organizations the gnostics eventually infiltrated the way and eventually turned it via augustine of hippo uh, and Jerome and others, and eventually turned it into what we call the Roman Catholic Church. And then a, they used half of the Gnostics beliefs to do that. In the 1500s, the Protestants used the other half of the Gnostic beliefs to consolidate power away from the Pope. And what you call church right now is the great harlot of Babylon, because all churches worship God, and his proper name is the Babylonian demon of fortune. Yeah, again, your entire thesis is built on a word concept fallacy. Are you from a Protestant background? Both Catholic and Protestant. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So the word God can pick out different things, right? And your argument rests on the word God having the single referent of this demon. And the Correct. way that you got to that was the creative interpretation of Isaiah 65. Is it creative or is that you the just real said you had to change a letter to get married? No, that is what, that God. is what you said let's, to get married. The proposition that did it's you, God did you not say that to change a letter you get married because it's close? Yes. Okay. So again, why do you think that that is valid or a coherent move to do? From what standpoint? <laughs> it's not talking about Mary and you admitted it by saying that. I have to change a letter to make it be close to Mary. Yes, and that's the middle letter of Manny's name. None is Manny? a letter that is used. Yes, M N Y Manny. Nothing to do with Mary. Where do you Correct. conclude that that's Mary? Because the demons can change their names. That's what he does. He's yeah, that <laughs> that doesn't prove that the referent is is Mary. You're just assuming the position and saying. Yeah, but it is because it's a demon changing his name. How do you know that it's a demon that changed? You don't think, I mean, do you know what Ephesus taught, for example? On what? On the on Mary. Tell me. Well, are you familiar with church history at all? You talked about Augustine. You were correct about his background. Oh, a little bit, yes. Okay, so, but well, wait a minute. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to know about what the first four centuries of Christianity taught if you're going to put this position forward? Sure, go for it. No, I'm asking you, what do you think they taught in those first four centuries up to Ephesus? About whom? About Christ and Mary. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, so you don't know about this topic. I thought you wrote a giant 90,000 word book or something. 93,000, yes. Okay, so but you don't know about the topic. Well, the, the book doesn't cover the encompassing of everything in Christianity. Yeah, but... Mary is very important at Ephesus and she's given a certain name at Ephesus. And so this would be very important to your thesis if you think that she's a god, a goddess or a demon. I didn't say that Mary was a god or a demon. Maria, her name was Maria. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on. Uh, I appreciate your arguments. Uh, interesting thesis, but it's a word concept fallacy. It's open forum. If you want to present your arguments, you can. Uh, I will hear them out. Um, Anika Tsuki. We're giving preference to people who disagree today. Hey, man, what's going on? Yo, how's it going? Um, I already sent a couple super chats in, but I was just going to ask my questions this way, if that was okay. I, did, yeah. I didn't know that I could do this. Yeah, either way, it's fine. Um, all right. Um, so I'm newly Orthodox, my wife and I, and we've been taking our six month old. And um, I was wondering, um, what do you think would be the best argument towards my Protestant friends and family who equate icons with the uh, with what it says in the second commandment about not making images of what's in heaven and on earth and in the sea below and all that? Yeah, I have an essay on that that's a very simpy, simple sort of response on... Uh, I Just go to my website and type in icons and you'll get it. Okay. Um, my second question, if I may, um, um, I've got the uh, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by uh, Seraphim Rose. I've got Against Heresies. I've got um, On Holy Images. And I've got... Um, the Orthodox veneration of Mary, the mother of God by St. John Maximovich. Yeah. Are there any other starter books that you recommend? For Orthodox theology in general? Right. Yes. Yeah. Mystical theology, of the Eastern church by Lossky is a good place to start. Um, Orthodox church by Meyendorf is a good place to start. Uh, Byzantine theology by Meyendorf after you've read those. Now, the, the article that I wrote is called Biblical Defense of Icons. It's just a basic go, going through the, the text of the Bible. Um, and I've got that linked in the chat. Okay. And uh, you can also just find it on my website. Awesome. I appreciate it, Jay. Yeah. Hey, can I just add one thing real sure. quick? So um, when we're reading Exodus uh, and the command to, you know, not have any graven images of anything on earth or in heavens 
Um, obviously, it's in the it's in the context of such that you would worship it as if it were God. Because yeah. think about how silly it would be. It would mean if it says no graven image, which is a th- typically means a th- three dimensional image. Uh, it would mean that we couldn't have any statue. I mean, outside of religious context, uh, you couldn't have any statues or any three dimensional art or anything like this, which you'll see that even like, I think the Amish even um, try to take it that way or something like that. So you have to say, well, well, the verse, the verses can't actually mean that. So what are they saying? They're saying within the context of worship, such that you would worship it as if it were God. And um, I think it's just a, a typical move that Protestants um, struggle with. First, the word concept fallacy, and number two, that there's a general overall kind of context of what's going on. So a, a Protestant might often think, well, the, you just read the verse, and the verse says what it means, and means what it says, and it says what I mean. And we see that's not the case. Yeah, that's usually where my argument goes it, whenever I speak to my Protestant friends and family is, well, let's get down to what 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 an idol was and let's get down to what the word graven means. And usually usually that's, that's the limit that their brain can handle and they just shut down and just refuse to hear any of it. Yeah, because you could ask, well, why would that be wrong? Right. Why would God say not to make graven images um they won't give an answer to it oh because god said so yes so they've got some type of weird kind of um divine command theory that god's dictates are arbitrary and whatever he says um that's just what it says you've got to do what which is a terrible god to follow I mean, right all right Appreciate that question, Matt. I'm, I'm guessing that you're the guy that sent the super chats. Appreciate that. I'll read those super chats here in a second. Um, let's see, Thomas, Thomas Guzman. We're looking for uh, giving precedence to people who disagree today. Got to unmute, man. Go ahead. You're unmuted. You got to turn your mic on too. I don't know if you, sometimes you have to go in your settings and turn on the mic. If you haven't done this before. Are you there, Thomas? Uh, We'll move on until you get that. Sometimes you have to come out, come back in. So Thomas, if you come out, come back in, I'll put you back to the head of the line. Hilarion, what's up, dude? Yo, yo, yo. No one can say I was mean. I just said the position made no sense and it was based on a word concept fallacy. And of course, what was happening at Ephesus is the term Theotokos is what I was looking for. So people that aren't aware of that, I'm not going to listen to them telling me about the secret history of Mary. Hilarion, you got to unmute. Or not. Moving on. Moving on up, moving on up, David Reed. On move, dude. On move, dude. Hey, Jay, what's up? Hey, yes, sir. Hey, um, I was just, I just had a quick question. I'm Orthodox, by the way. Yeah, I, I've called in before. Um, I was listening to the iconic vegan debate with you, Tristan, and the ask yourself dude and vegan gains, you know, mm-hmm. the train wreck. And you at one point brought up a point that he, he was saying something about something being abstract or it was not tangible. So we couldn't investigate it. So something along those lines, you know, kind of normie empiricism. Uh-huh. And you said nothing was purely abstract. Right. And you said you could read Heidegger in, um, to basically realize what that means. And I was wondering what you meant by that, uh, in, that nothing's abstract, that is. Nothing's purely abstract. Yeah, Heidegger makes the point that 
So Husserl wanted to bracket reality and come up with these uh, neutral uh, ways to read objects. And famously, Husserl took his uh, class uh, outside and they studied a mailbox for an entire semester. And the reason they studied the mailbox was because, for example, you can't, you can never, a single uh, person's vantage point is always limited to the their side of the object. So this is called in Mariology, the horizon of objects. So you can never see the other side of the object. And uh, Husserl basically had them focus on doing this for like a whole semester. And Heidegger made the joke that this wild attempt at trying to find this purely neutral starting point to read objects is outlandish, mainly because it operates as if we read objects as pure abstractions and not through life being not through the entire history of objects that we bring to the interpretive experience. So I'm never going to have a purely neutral interpretation of the mailbox because anytime I come to the mailbox, I'm bringing with me my whole history of all my life, all my interpretive interpretation of objects, including all my past history of interpreting and experiencing mailboxes. So it's an unrealistic, uh, it's not the life being way that we interact with objects is what I was getting at. I got you. Okay. It was a way for me to combat and refute the idea that uh, there's such a thing as uh, non-theory-laden interpretations of reality. Got you. Okay. And then, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. So, so the, this is some, I don't know if it might be somewhat related. You were talking in previously with another detractor about divine conceptualism. Uh Uh-huh. And... You were saying that the Orthodox conception is different from the Roman Catholics. Yeah, they have a platonic the, move, and we make them energies, not the divine essence. Okay. okay. So, so universals oh, are created things in the Orthodox view. Maximus makes this argument very clear multiple times in the Ambigua. Roman Catholics don't typically uh, make this clear. So then you might find a Roman Catholic who reads Maximus and comes to the conclusion of that. But really, uh, this is because, for example, Aquinas identifies the divine ideas with the divine essence. So that would make, if you say that universals are divine ideas and they're the divine essence, then now universals are the divine essence. So that's a platonic view. Got you. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I'll look at that. And so it, was there a particular Heidegger book? That I could pick up I'm not actually I'm not a, no I'm not even a he- I'm not a Heidegger scholar uh, I just had one class on Heidegger in uh, grad school and it was really contrasting Heidegger and Husserl was that whole class so uh, Father Deacon and nice would be a lot better for that topic um, Dermot Moron was my um, professor that's uh, one of the world's leading Heidegger scholars so he has some books on that also hubert dreyfus um i believe he's out of berkeley um, yeah, we we used dermot moran and, and dreyfus in my in that class so yeah they're they're like the two leading scholars probably off the top of my head um Durham yeah. goods because he has kind of uh he has a book called Phenomenology that's really good that covers kind of all that stuff that's going on with Husserl and Heidegger. And he does some books that are kind of um, a more general approach. Um, a lot of scholars will pick some specific aspect out of Heidegger to write about. Um, so that's why I recommended uh, Dermot Morin or uh, Hubert Dreyf was just kind of a good... Um, overview of Heidegger. Sure. All right. And then just well, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. It's fine. Go ahead. Move on. I, I it's just a, we we li- we'll lose all the related. all the listeners. will leave. I'm not I'm not mad at you. I'm not fussing. It's just that nobody knows about Husserl or Heidegger, and right, not. right, right. This is totally unrelated to that. In in the Eric Yabara debate from a while ago, mm-hmm. you had on with my on Michael Lofton's channel. Yep. So y- you were. He was kind of saying basically that he was building kind of a case for the papacy from like the ground up. Right. And and you were saying basically the problem with that was that it's ignoring all the constituent 
doctrines that come with it, you can't just argue from the ground up. Was was that the issue? Correct. Because he seemed to be saying that, like, look, let's just take this one piece at a time. Yeah, he has an evidentialist pile up the papal quotes uh, approach. And then eventually, if he piles up enough quotes, it'll tilt the scales over and it'll maybe even make the papacy true. Right, right. So what's like, what's the problem with isolating one aspect and being like, okay, let's just deal. Because he has already, this. because he already said elsewhere that if you could show one dogmatic contradiction, the system would be nullified. Oh, and oh, so okay. the whole yeah. point of my argument in that whole debate was that Vatican II's teaching post Vatican II contradicts previous Catholic dogma. And Eric says in the debate, uh, we'll have that debate another time. I don't want to go there. Let's just work through the evidences piece by piece. And it's not that I'm against evidences, but those guys are Thomists and they're evidentialists by virtue of being Roman Catholic. I mean, 99.999% of all of them are that. And uh, so that whole approach is flawed and, and it's uh, self-referencing and arbitrary, which is ironic okay. because because they would say, well, but you think tag is self-referencing and arbitrary. Yeah, right. but that's why I'm not an, uh, a classical foundationalist like you are. Right, so it's always an internal critique when you're making those arguments pretty much against them. When I'm, when I'm making like... that argument, it's an internal critique, <clears throat> but not every argument is an internal critique that I make. No, I, ma I make arguments all the time like, uh, you know, here's a quote from Maximus that, you know, doesn't make sense with Vatican I. Right, okay. But I, again, so, you know, yeah, that, that's the point, is that the reason that debate is so odd, I guess, is that he wanted to do one thing, I wanted to do a different thing, and so there never it wasn't it was never what I was arguing he never addressed and can't address it because he would have to give up his whole paradigm you know, in order to ultimately what would happen is that it would become an epistemology debate and he'd have to he'd have to argue that there's self evident truths, basically. And right, that's if you they, and if you want to see that debate, that's the debate with Trent Horn. Right, right, and it, it kind of it seemed like I'll, I'll be honest, it kind of seemed like that went over Trent's head. It did. Like I, I hate to say it, of course because, it did. Uh, he, Trent, Trent's pretty sharp, which was pretty surprising, you know, honestly. But um, but yeah, they kind of bring that debate up a lot. The Roman Catholics I I talked to, the one with Yabara, you know, the kind of like, oh, well, he got schooled, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what Roman Catholics say to cope about that debate. I didn't get schooled. Uh, Eric never addressed the argument that, uh, and by the way, you'll notice everything that I said too about him and uh, Lofton, like that's all come to fruition because they don't, right. they don't like each other anymore. But no, it's a, it's a very simple argument that the papacy has a structure and a system by which it doesn't allow any dogmatic contradictions. And Ibarra admits that. So the argument was just simply, let's address the Vatican II teachings that contradict pre-Vatican II teaching. And he said, we'll have that debate some other time. I don't want to do that right now. So there you go. And um, again, am I not vindicated with uh, fiducia supplicans or whatever Francis's uh, Skittles encyclical is? I mean, come on. So, all right. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate yeah, great question. It. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, everybody is noting that I seem to be in a chill mood today. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm in a chill mood. I didn't get mad at anybody or I'm not even typically mad in a heated debate. Um, but I just now understood that my suspicion is correct, right? Because the text says for that other guy, those that forsake the Lord, forget my holy mountain, prepare, prepare a table for Gad and many. And in the Orthodox uh, study Bible, right, that's translated as pagan gods like fortune. Okay, but Gad does not equate to the English terminology and usage of God. I mean, this is that's why it's a word concept fallacy. This reminds me of the, guy, the dude that came up to you um when we we're in california remember <laughs> yes <It's... sighs> yeah uh, by the way i wanted to point out first of all etymology is not the be-all end-all of of meaning it, give, it it can give us insights words change 
words don't have a single referent. And two, the fact that you can spin a story with absolutely no evidence. And what, what did he say? If it's true, wouldn't this kind of make sense of that's not that's not evidence. That's not justification for your position. Yeah. Um, and I find it bizarre, too, that. So God's going to keep all of this hidden and and until one man 2000 years later writes a, a big book and does some fancy stuff with etymology and switches some words and stuff like that and then discovers the real truth. Right. And God's going to allow that where everybody's just been deceived and it's all been hidden. Um, and nobody had the, the truth. We had to wait for this one man to. Uh, all right. Yeah, exactly. Let's go to Scott. Uh, Scott Grace. You got to unmute when you come on, Scott. Yeah, I don't I don't think that he did understand the point about word word concept fallacy, uh, because that's really that's the point here. It's the same move that Muslims make where they say that God can only pick out the, you know, single Tawheed. Um, the word God can pick out different things. Scott, you got to unmute, man. Hey, how's it going, Jay? Good. What's up with you? Nothing much. So uh, I was interested in discussing perseverance of the saints with you. Okay. What? Why are you giggling? Do you, are you going to troll me? No. I'm just. I, I'm just excited. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about it a lot and, uh, the Orthodox position is obviously anti-perseverance of the saints from my understanding, but maybe, are there any Orthodox people that, that take that belief? Uh, no, uh, Orthodox theology teaches that you can participate in grace and lose your salvation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I guess what I struggle with, with that idea, and obviously I think that there's Christians that can fall away from the faith. I mean, the Bible is pretty explicit about that. Mm -hmm. Um, but when we talk about like believers that have genuine faith, I guess some roadblocks that I have with that idea is that, you know, obviously you, you understand that God has foreknowledge of who will be saved before, you know, we even come into existence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, like if God knows that the Apostle Paul is going to be saved or that Peter is going to be saved, it seems that we can kind of say that they are going to persevere to the end. Like that is something that has already been written. Yeah, but, in but that doesn't make God the cause of all of the events or the sole determinate cause of their salvation. So God creates a world where there's secondary causes and those people can participate and synergize in the process of deification. So the fact that God has foreknowledge is not equivalent to the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, which is that God infallibly ensures that the predetermined elect are saved. And this is all because uh, Calvinism uh, and the predestinarian view of even Augustine places soteriology before Christology. If you look at Paul's epistles, in Ephesians, for example, the letter is not written to the fixed number of the elect. The letter is written to a visible church in Ephesus who has uh, apostolic succession. So that fact alone really undercuts this entire model and paradigm. Do you think it necessarily matters whether or not like Christ has made it so that they'll persevere? Like, Don't you think the fact that God would have foreknowledge of their actions that they do to earn salvation that by default, it's almost like they are predestined to live in a certain way that will lead them to salvation? No, because God is not the direct cause of all events. Do you, I, see, I guess I struggle with, does God have to be the direct cause of all events? Well, if he made them that way so that they would become saved and persevere, then yes, he has to be. That's why Calvinism typically ends up saying that the divine decree is the real basis for salvation. In the divine, also, in the too. divine decree doctrine, it would mean that God is the direct, immediate cause of all events, and there's not proximate and secondary causes. Well, you would agree that God obviously made us the way that we are in general. So, like, how would you explain how people reach salvation then? Because, like, couldn't you just say, like, well, God made someone in a certain way where it's like they do enough repentance and they do the proper things to be saved anyway? Again, uh, it hinges on the doctrine of anthropology that we have, where. There's a distinction between nature and person. 
So human nature is not determined. It has its own proper willing and energy that never goes away. Even after the fall, human nature retains its will and energy. And we know this from Christology because Christ assumes our, our nature and heals it. So at no point does divine grace supplant, destroy, or replace the human will and energy. So the paradigm of Christology is the same as the paradigm of soteriology. So another thing too with that is I believe that you could come to the conclusion of perseverance of the saints or like perseverance of the believer without necessarily having to completely forego free will. I don't know if you agree well, I, with that. I mean, I, yeah, I understand that all Calvinists affirm verbally free will, but they don't consistently confirm and or, uh, affirm the idea that human beings are their own uh, causal agents. So that's the problem here. And the, the way that we can nail that down really quick is to talk about Christology because both Augustine and Calvin uh, are inconsistent on their Christology. And I can ask you the same questions as well. I mean, do you think Jesus was predestined? Pre no, because he's always existed. So no, I don't even no, think no, no, no. Predestined to... When he becomes incarnate, is that is he a predestined man? That's a term that Augustine uses. I would say no. Why is he not a predestined man if you're a Calvinist or an Augustinian? Well, I don't consider myself a Calvinist or an Augustinian, so I don't really know like what their response would be. Okay, well, I thought you were arguing the Calvinist position, so I misunderstood. Um, again, so maybe you don't understand what secondary causes are. Do you know what that means? So explain that to me. Yeah. So primary cause, God, like, are you familiar with Islam at all? A little bit. Right. So the uh, Sunni Muslims, for example, like they have this idea that there's no created causal agents in the world. And the reason that you can't say that, they think, is because it would detract from God's sovereignty if there were other beings that could be causal agents. And so this becomes the term, the term is called occasionalism. And this is the idea... This is the idea that at every second, uh, every nanosecond, God is destroying and recreating the world. Now, some Calvinists also adopted this position like Jonathan Edwards because they thought it was more consistent with the idea of God's determining decree. So, if we say that there are secondary causes, that means that agents that God creates in the world have a real ability to be their own causal determinants. So God is not the direct determining cause of all those events. So if that's already if that's admitted, that would preclude what you're arguing about foreknowledge entailing perseverance of the saints. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I think that obviously I think that you can reach something like an idea that someone will persevere to the end. Without the fact God that God knows that. it does not make God the cause of every one of those oh, events. Oh, I agree. Okay, I then, agree that then foreknowledge doesn't, doesn't entail perseverance. But if he Why knows are you laughing? Doing, I'm not laughing. I'm, I'm like breathing. Okay. Um, if God knows that something is going to happen, then I'm not saying that he necessarily foreordained it, but just the knowledge well, that's Calvinism. that someone... Right. Right. Yeah, I see. I think you can come to that conclusion without Calvinism. Like, for example, I think uh, I forget what verse it is, but uh, it's talking about the characteristics of. Faith. Yeah, but again, so God foreknowing the events of Paul uh, persevering to the end does not mean that God is the direct, immediate cause of every action in Paul's life. Yeah. Which oh, is, yeah, I I completely agree. Okay, so how? Maybe you're misunderstanding then what we mean by um, participating in grace, because there's a lot of people in the New Testament, for example, in Hebrews 6, who are said to be washed with, uh, with uh, baptism. They partake of the heavenly gift uh, and they fall away. Jesus talks about um, seeds that fall on stones. They spring up to new life and they, they wither away and die. So those are people who really experience grace uh, and do not persevere until the end. Yeah, for sure. And I would say this, like, I think you can come to that conclusion from like a free will perspective. Like when it's talking about faith, one of the things that it says is that it involves love and love always perseveres. So like, I believe that if someone truly loves God and it is the biblical definition of love, that that love and faith in God will always persevere if it is truly love. 
Well, I mean, this is just redefining terms to make, uh, you know, once saved, always saved be the case. I mean, the, oh, the, the sure, text. for sure. <laughs> okay, well, if, it, if that's the position, then then you just admitted that right. you're wrong. <laughs> well, for sure. I mean, I argue that perseverance of the saints can be, can be derived from something other than like a very like five point Calvinism type view. Like, I think you could have that view and not be a Calvinist. Like, for example, like Molinists believe in that, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. Again, like what what does any of this have to do with like Christology or the arguments that you know like so if you if you're redefining truly loving God to just mean I mean at that point then um it's just you're still not escaping the issue because don't you think most of those people who um fell away, for example, in the texts that are mentioned, don't you think if you'd asked them before they fell away, do you truly love God? They they probably would have said yeah and and like, you know, maybe maybe they even believed it. Right. And I, I would say my argument is they might have like loved God, but I don't think that they loved God enough. Like you need to truly love someone. Like, for example, like if you're in a relationship with your wife and and I say to you, like, you know, you love your wife. But if I say like, okay, so well, I'm not trying wife, to be, I understand. I'm not trying to be rude, but if you're just redefining all the terms to fit your position, then uh, then what is the position? Well, what, what terms would you say that I've redefined? I mean, you just said that now what it means to persevere is to, quote, truly love God. So it sounds like well, just a way well, to... Oh, yeah, let me explain that. I'm sorry if I wasn't super explicit there. So what I mean to say is I believe you're justified by faith. And so I was describing the characteristics of what faith is because faith leads to salvation. And involved in faith is more than just knowledge about God. You have to trust and believe and love God. And the definition of love is that love always perseveres. So if you attach that to what it means to be a true uh, Again, so you're believer, redefining all of the terms to make your position work, because that's not what these terms mean in the New Testament or in patristic theology. So like... So I you have a presupposition about what perseverance of the saints means, and once saved, always saved. And any objection that I bring up, that everything is redefined to make that that view still work. And the point is that where are you getting these ideas about what that truly means? It sounds like this is just your position. So I think there's several verses in the Bible you could pull up that describe what faith is. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Faith? No, no, no. About about because... the fact that when I bring up texts that talk about really apostatizing, you redefine that to mean that yeah, and that just means that they didn't truly love God. Well, how else could you explain it? Because how could they have been a true by what believer I said? How how else what? How could they be? How could they have been a true believer if they walked away? By everything that I've been arguing to you, it says that they tasted the heavenly gift. It says that new life sprang up in them and that withered away and died. Right, but and you're saying you that it doesn't mean that. that it means away. that they never were really alive. Is essentially what you're saying. I'm saying that you could receive gifts and not experience. It doesn't say just receive gift. It says receive new life and they died. It says that right. they apostatized from the covenant. They tasted of the heavenly gift. So I guess the point would be if you taste of the heavenly gift, you have new life. Mm -hmm. The question is, can you give that up? Can you have new life? Obviously, because that's what the passages are saying. Right. So I guess I would struggle with the verses that says love always perseveres because then you run into roadblocks like that or the fact that certain people you it's know, not a, it's not a roadblock god. because if you truly love god you won't fall away meaning that you will continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling correct. as paul says correct and none of that is once saved always saved or is the the perseverance of the saints in augustinianism none of that is that Oh, yeah. And I think that you can well, then, believe in that idea without being haughty and saying like, oh, I'm persevered. So therefore, I don't have to live in fear and trouble. Okay, but anymore. if you're admitting, oh, yeah, then that's not the position that you took a minute ago. Well, I never said that I applied. All right, we're moving on. So this is not going anywhere. All right. Ethan Bracken, what's up? So people who want to debate the topics listed today uh, can come into the chat. Of course, you can lose love. Exactly. Like, Go ahead. Ethan. Right. 
So it's a, a lot of um, linguistic misunderstandings. It seems like as a, as a recurring pattern. Um, do you want to come back, Scott? I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm not. I'm trying to be patient. I'm not trying to lose my patience. You can come back and make a point. Go ahead. Scott, go ahead. I made you a speaker. You can come back if you want. Or not. Don't speak. Thank you guys for the super chats. Appreciate that. Uh, Thomas Guzman is trying again with his microphone. What's up, Thomas? Got to unmute, man. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right. I've noticed there's been a lot of movement with the whole neo pagan crew over on X. Uh-huh. Now, I'm, or, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I've been Orthodox for three years now. I've repented of this, but I had been involved in the occult, uh, deeply involved in the occult for years in, in neo-pagan circles. I was a theosophist, like the real deal. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I consistently noticed with neo-pagans, both when I was involved in this highly sinful lifestyle and now is there's like really a totally complete lack of any theology basically sure so so like as an example you know usually neo-paganism like if you look at some of the classic works of uh let's say wicca so like the witch's bible or anything by scott cunningham like today because they basically set up a theology which is hindu light right if you go to a neo-pagan circle and you want to talk about pagan theology, it'll immediately just stop and someone will say, well, I don't agree with that. So like literally there's there's no real theological basis sure. within of the occult neo-paganism. What it kind of reminds me of is, you know, fandom, like if you go to a convention, like a Star Wars convention, like yeah. you're, just part, you're just part of the community. Uh-huh. That's basically what neo paganism is like. Real. Yeah, I, I did a video uh, from Florida in 2018 making this very critique. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Now within neo paganism, it's usually a lefty movement, and uh, they now they police themselves really hard. There are quote unquote right wing neo pagans like the Asatru neo pagans. Okay. But. It, like, what these people fail to realize is, like, the, the Vikings, like, they weren't Nazis, you know, like, and they didn't attack Christians or monasteries because they were doing it for Odin. They were just doing it to steal stuff. That's why. That's a great point. By the way, um, they they were released, the, the especially the right, uh, the right wing, as you called it, uh, neo-pagans were released and attacking me all week. And one thing that they're all part of uh, Rabbi uh, Adam Green, as I call him, um, Colt. Um, but what's really interesting, they have very thorough modern um, ideas that are not paid, like biological determinism, um, Darwinian kind of. <laughs> so I just, I wanted to comment on that because it, it's actually true. Yeah, well, like, it, what we find out is it really is. Nazis. Yeah, it's just another way to be uh, an atheist with uh, different costumes. So, um, but remember, remember, we are on YouTube as well. So uh, we're gonna keep it to you know. Let's not get too s sassy with what we talk about. Did you have any other issues you wanted to get, uh, get to, Thomas? Before we move on. Yeah, one thing I want to say about uh, right wing neo pagans or a lot of neo pagans in general is I. I view them as non-practicing atheists. That's how I yeah, describe Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. It's got the same spirit. They've got the same arguments. Yeah, spot on. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to be rude or uh, know-it-all or like, but uh, yeah, if you go watch my 2018 video critiquing paganism where I'm wearing a, a wig and uh, I have a sword and I'm singing pagan songs, the original one, not the not the skit I did a year ago. Uh, yeah, I was I was making that same critique. Now, the reason for that is that I was arguing with and act, interacting with uh, the pagans even back then at that time. 
Uh, and no, those arguments are never going to change or get any more sophisticated. Yaru, what's up? Yeah, there is no like pagan tradition to go join. And, uh, you know, remember the Bog Lord deba Dave debate, right? We did the Bog Lord Dave debate back in 2017, 2018. And what we noticed from that debate was it's just sort of atheist arguments, relativism, subjectivism, and uh, materialism, but maybe a little bit of mythology, uh, you know, basically the same type of mythological view of Jordan Peterson, basically. So, um, yeah, there's, there's no there there, so to speak. Yaru, what's up? Hey, can you hear me? Yup. Um, so I think I have a problem with uh, tag. Okay. Um, I'm wondering how exactly God could play a justificatory role to epistemic norms. Because I thought the only thing that played justificatory roles were epistemic standards norms. Yeah, but this is talking about the preconditions themselves. How are they justified or how are they made coherent? So raise the bar to a, one higher level of meta justification. And that's why it's God, because it's not just any old God, but specifically the metaphysics of Christianity and the epistemology that Christianity offers is that is the justification. So um, why exactly is God a precondition for logic? Because all of the transcendental categories uh, have to, in the words of, for example, Thomas, uh, or excuse me, Dr. Ed Fazer, they have to be uh, housed or interrelated in some way or in some, in some place. And so that's the function that the divine mind plays for us, which is to string all of this, uh, all these golden, uh, string the pearls together, so to speak, on a single string. Does that make sense? In other uh, words, in other words, the, the categories don't like function on their own as independent, discrete things. So, universals ties into uh, logic. Logic ties into ethics and metaphysics. Um, you know, all of these things kind of hang together as a specific type of worldview. And the only worldview that has the solution to those problems is the Christian paradigm. Yeah, why can't it be just the the good? what there's no account for just what the good is so to, t to say that it's something that's sort of impersonal or abstracted like that <clears throat> doesn't work because you need an <coughs> excuse me intentionality <clears throat> in other words for example to have telos or to have a, a, a universe that's purposive you need uh, an intentional being so it can't just be some abstracted platonic idea like the good uh why does it need to be intentional to have purposiveness and to have telos. Uh, and think about it this way. If it's not intentional, um, it's accidental. In which case... Everything is disteleological. Yes, and everything um, is meaningless. It's an oxymoron. The, the accidental laws of logic, the accidental laws of physics, um, accidental meaning... So, in a world like that, there are no arguments. There's no meaning. There's no semantics or anything like that because it ultimately is accidental. That's why, by impossibility, the contrary, it has to be purposeful and intentional. Okay. Yeah, I think that's good. I might want to go back because I think the skeptic could maybe say something earlier. Uh, they might want to say that Oh no, all these things like logic, the soul, uh, objective morality or whatnot, those things are actually all disjointed um, and they all just exist on their own. But notice what he's, well, he's making a statement about yeah. that in a world in which statements are impossible. Yeah, so how are statements possible in his worldview? How are statements possible? Yeah, sentences are only possible in a certain type of world, namely the world that we are arguing for. So when he makes sentences, he's using preconditions and categories that don't make sense in his worldview, and so he's unjustified in using them. So he can't even argue or make sentences. So, yeah, that, that, might, that might be right. Um, what does he just say something like, oh, a monkey is able to communicate to other monkeys in the same way that we are? Again, well, I'm saying he's making statements yeah. about a monkey in which statements are not possible. So okay, he, gotcha. he, he can't even get off the ground. Um, yeah, that seems right. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah. Really good questions.
let's see. Uh, so we're giving precedence today to people who disagree. Uh, let's see. Pakistani psycho. <laughs> That's an awesome sounding name. We got to go to that guy. Thank you guys for the support. Our support the show via super chats. You can call in via the Twitter link that is linked in the show description and in the chat. It's the X link that you see there. Everybody always asks, how do I call in the link that we share and tell you about literally a hundred times throughout the chat. Uh, and then you can also support the stream via Streamlabs super chats. And that is this link right here. Did you want to talk, dude? I don't understand. Like, like people request to speak and then they sit there silent for and won't talk. I don't know. Open Eye Institution. What's up, dude? Shout out to the chat. What's up, you guys? Thanks to the mods. Keeping it real. What's up, Paul? What's up, Bell Sprout? What's up, Greedy Speedy? Go ahead. How you doing? Yes, sir. Can I talk? Sure. Yeah, uh, well, you got to understand religion is made by civilization that thinks they could set all the rules that they are the authority of God. Mm. But the original, uh, the name of God was uh, these aliens coming down on spaceships and they, we call them the gods, okay? Uh, but did you read, the, did you uh, watch that on the History Channel? You've been watching the History Channel? No, no, uh, I'm the one that sees. I'm a psych. I'm a scientist and stuff, and I do field research out there in the field. But um, mm -hmm. what 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 field of science do you study? Uh, invisible dimensions. Herbology. Ah, herbology. Yeah, I'm the number one scientist of the paranormal uh, thing. It's kind of like uh, yeah, all I believe the it. You know, you that's fly. weird because I'm actually the scientist of the scientists of. Uh, paranormal. Yeah, I mean, this guy studies you guys, so he's trumped you. Yeah, well, let me uh, explain to you. Uh, the prophets and the gurus that fly, y'all flying so high, right? But then you find out you're flying so low, because I'm seeing y'all flying really low, and y'all wrecking into the mountains and telephone poles and shit like that. That's wild, dog. Hey, listen, I appreciate yeah. it. You're, you're the number one paranormal, paranormal science man on the internet. So I will concede that you win the debate. I, I concede to you, dog. Uh, let's see. Houston. Hoot hoot. What's up, hoot hoot? Number one science man on the internet. I studied the psychosphere like, like Rush Cole. I'm you, bro. Houston. Houston, we have liftoff. <laughs> Where you at, bro? Where you at, dog? He's trying to connect. He got a, he's got a kind of a a little bit of a a bara look going on to him. You know what I'm saying? He got a little bit of a bara face. Houston, where you at, dude? Try coming out and coming back in because you, you're not you're not connecting, man. Just try coming out and coming back in. I mean, you got to eat bar of face. I'm ready to bring you on, man. Punk giver. Punk giver. Mm. I said, oops, up, side your head. 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 Unmute, man. Pecking boogers. I put a booger on the basketball and I pass it to him. Tristan didn't even know who Biz Markey was. Can you believe Tristan didn't know who Biz Markey was? I'm like, what? That's awful. How do you not know? Oh, baby, you, you got what I need. Will you say you just a friend? Anyway, uh, Biz Markey has the song Pickin' Boogers that was on the first tape I ever bought as a kid. Had Biz Markey Pickin' Boogers on it. You got to unmute, dude. Punk, unmute. Hey, how's it going, Jay? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, well, I've got one question. I'm a theist, 
and I've got a question in regards to Quran. Uh, I watch a lot of apologetic debates, apologetic debates, and I found one argument by myself. I've never seen it anyone anywhere else, and I would like you to rate it and check its validity. What do you think? Can I go for it? Well, hey, I mean, uh, sure. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in Islam, so, you know, for example, you know, Ridvan, he found that really good argument against uh, Daniel Hakikachu about the name Yahweh. So, yeah, it's it's always possible to find a, a, right. a new argument. All right, all right. So let me try. Okay, I'm going to talk about a Surah 18, which is the Surah, uh, so-called cave, yeah? Uh, it talks about a narrative where uh, Jews from Medina try to uh, understand or know whether Muhammad is really a prophet, right? So they instruct uh, some people from the Quraysh tribe to ask him three questions. Uh, the first question was about a group of young men of ancient times who had uh, an extraordinary story. By the way, I'm reading a commentary from the study Quran, page 728. Uh, the second question was, about a man who had journeyed until he reached the east and west of the earth, uh, who was supposedly to be uh, so-called do, do yeah, meaning two-horned one in Arabic translated. And the third one was about the spirit. Well, uh, the question uh, in regards to the first question, uh, they're known in Christianity as the sleepers of the cave, supposed, supposedly venerated um, saints who slept yeah and, i brought this uh, up in the debate with daniel hikikachu because it's in the yeah. it's in the gabriel saeed reynolds book yeah 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 uh, that's it well uh, well it was a trick question right jews do not believe this at all uh, mm -hmm. it was a question of whether they wanted to know whether they uh muhammad aligns more with christian narratives or or their narratives and they asked him this trick question okay that's the first one the jews couldn't answer, accept this answer because uh, Muhammad basically affirmed uh, those sleepers, right? Uh, the second question, which is more interesting, uh, is about Do Kornain. As I said, it means literally two-horned one, right? And my assumption, the first assumption is, when Jews ask this question, when Jews ask this question, they, they must have known about this Do Kornain, right? That's my assumption. Well, no Wait, one, which, which verse is this? Uh, I'm going to tell you right now. Okay. Uh, give me a sec. Sure. Uh, Surah Al-Kaf, uh, 1883. Quran 1883. Surah 18, verse 83. Okay, right? go ahead. So so they, they asking him about this dul name. Well, uh, no one of that name is in the Bible, right? Or is there? Uh, well, let's step out of this question for a second and let's ask ourselves right if you were a prophet of god or god himself for example and uh a christian uh, wanted to know you you would ask him who would you wanted to know about right who, who would an average uh, christian wanted to know about more more than he already knows let's say jesus uh, i mean Exactly, yeah. Who would an average Muslim want to know about? Muhammad. Yes. And Jews, uh, as my assumption goes, wanted to know about Moses. Moses. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's it. Uh, well, the thing is, <clears throat> sorry about that. The thing is, there, there were Latin and Hebrew manuscript, Latin translation of Hebrew manuscript, that had a copyist error found in Exodus 34, 29 to 35, where Moses steps down out of the... Uh, Mount Sinai, right? The horns. Yeah. And the, yeah, 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 exactly. And the original Hebrew words in Exodus uh, describe the radiance, as you said, as as uh, horns. But it was a translation error, right? Yeah, right. So uh, from that point onward, uh, a lot of Roman Catholic art and like with Michelangelo. Yeah, Moses has other, horns, right? Exactly, exactly. And uh, then Muhammad basically uh, proceeded with some bogus story about Dol Koranain when the Jews wanted to know about Moses from the start. <laughs> and that's basically it. That's basically, I, I've never really heard about no Christian apologist to 
talk about this. And I wanted to know, what do you think about this argument overall? So you're arguing that um, the Quran is therefore not uh, very perceptive because if it was from God, they would have known that this was a mistranslation. Exactly. They, sure. uh, Muhammad and, and Allah would know what Jews mean by, by that little Quran name. But uh, Muhammad, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's basically it. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, it, it, it fits very well with, uh, I think, Gabriel Said Reynolds in his book, he lists about 10 discrepancies like this. Um, I don't remember him mentioning this one. So, yeah, I think that would be a good one to throw into the, the pile there. But there's quite a few, there's quite a few of these, you know, weird versions of things in the Quran that, that make no sense in terms of the biblical story, or they've mixed up the details, or they've got it reversed, or it contradicts. So, yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for this review. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Take care. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how, how Muslims would... Uh, they're probably just going to say, oh, no, Moses really... W or this whatever really is a two-horned person or something. I mean, who knows? They'll, they'll just say, oh, the Bible's full of errors. So they, they roll out the Bible's full of errors until, uh, you know, they realize that giant portions of their religion are built on the Bible, right? And then their religion says also that the Bible didn't have errors. So storage uh, file. Got to unmute. Hello. Yes, sir. What's on your mind? Oh, just, uh, just wondering about, you know, like the, 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 the sacrifice or the, the horns or whatever. Did you ever say that Moses had horns? No. Moses who doesn't had have horns. horns. Or who, who had horns or what? The Quran is using the mistranslated text that thinks that Moses had horns. It's a mistranslation of a word. So the, the Quran okay. wasn't aware of a mistranslation. It's similar to the argument I make about the papacy. Um, how come the papacy didn't know about the forgeries that they based themselves on? I would think that if they were a divinely guided institution, they would have been able to know and spot forgeries, uh, but no, they didn't. So. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just interested in, like, uh, yeah, like the Orthodox um, church and, like, how, like, mm -hmm. you know, the Copt, I was like a little bit just into it, like the Coptic church and how, like, the Coptic people, how the, was it Mark that uh, went and founded the Coptic Church? Uh, well, St. Mark went to Alexandria, but what's nowadays called Coptic, we would say, is a schismatic church. And that's like a uh, middle, we're like, they, they use like Arabic, they use like Arabic or like um, something like that. Well, eventually they use Coptic but Greek and then now Coptic. But thank you for those questions. We're going to move on to people who disagree. So remember today's discussion is primarily if you take issue with my approach or arguments for God's existence, Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, the papacy, Vatican I, church history, Vatican II, Islam, etc. It is open forum, so feel free to come on, hop on. But if you agree, today is not for you guys. Um, you're welcome to hop on and uh, ask questions later on another stream or via the discord or whatever people can ask questions to people in the discord i'm not usually in the discord but sometimes there's people sometimes i'm in there maybe once every few months uh well, thomas i was gonna go back tyrone baggins what's up tyrone does anybody have any arguments or disagreements today is we're giving preference to people who disagree Tyrone. I see that one guy left and never came back. Houston. He probably got his feelings hurt because I was making a joke. I'm just saying you have, you kind of look like a, a bar. I'm not saying, I'm not being mean to you, man. It's just people can't even lose their mind if you make a joke. Aiden, what's up, Aiden? Alexander Solonichson sends $5 and he says, what do you think about Nikola Tesla? I think he's pretty cool. He definitely had some insights. Uh, I think he went from Orthodox though and kind of got into theosophy or theosophic type ideas so um i know that the serbian priest uh, wrote a book about him i've heard of this um but i've also heard that later on in life he kind of went into theosophy 
But uh, yeah, he seems like a very cool science, uh, esoteric science, metaphysics, metaphysics man. Aiden, what's up, dog? You gotta unmute, man. <laughs> Aiden, do you want to talk? You came on, just unmute, dude. Cody, what's up? Cody's coming on. Cody's the next up. So remember, guys, if you try to come on and it has an issue connecting, maybe weird cell connection or whatever, just come out and come back in is the way to do that. And then hit request to speak again. So looks like Cody's having a hard time connecting. Uh, go ahead and unmute, Cody. Hey, Jay. Uh good to talk to you yes sir what's on your mind sir yeah i was just interested um i read the you know about a bible believing christian and i believe the bible was tampered with like um apparently like there was different books in the bible like the book of enoch which was taken out of the bible but it it, it was in the bible for over 500 years and it was taken out uh it's quoted in, in jude the right. chapter of I'm, jude I'm before aware. revelation i'm, I'm aware Right, so it was in certain. Can you mute one? It was in certain churches in their copies, but yes. there's not one Bible until about the fifth or sixth century. Probably not anymore. Yeah. No, I'm saying that there is. You said that it was taken out of the Bible. It wasn't taken out of the Bible. Well, I believe, like um, in the Council of Nicaea, didn't the Catholic Church take certain books out of the Bible? No, they did not. And Nicaea did not determine the book of the Bible. Well, uh, do you know who did? Yeah, it's uh, the Council of Trollo, which is uh, many centuries later, and that's affirmed at the Sixth and Seventh Ecumenical Councils. Do you uh, do you believe like the Book of Enoch was ever in the Bible? It was in certain traditions. Sorry, man. It's there's too much feedback. We gotta we gotta go. So. Punished something. What's up, dude? And then they drop off. Interesting. Joseph Alcuri. Joseph Alchemy. What's up, Joseph? Unmute. Unmute. Joseph, do you want to talk? Just got on mute, man. Yes. Yes. Hi, Jay. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, Joseph Al-Khuri. It's, uh, it's an Arabic name. It's uh, I, I'm, I'm I was making a joke, right? So yeah. obviously Al-Khuri is not alchemy. It was a joke. No, <laughs> I don't, that's, that's fine. Uh, I joined late. I'm not sure whether my question is going to be relevant. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about uh, uh, the uh, uh, Daniel 7. Where, where you have a, you can say, let us say, is speaking broadly, uh, as as it, you have two divine hypostases. Sure. You have someone called it the, the uh, ancient, ancient days, of right? Mm -hmm. What about it? Yes, and the son of man. I'm, I'm wondering. Uh, I, I agree with the with your approach that all the divine manifestations of the Old Testament are that of the pre-incarnate hypostases of the Son. Uh -huh. And 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 uh, the the son here is is manifesting himself, and and usually, uh, broadly speaking, it's because uh, is um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it that because the father will not manifest himself, and only the son takes that kind of role? And if that is the case, is there is there going to be some sort of tension with Daniel seven if we take that approach as somehow axiomatic because you have ancient of days and the son of man approaching the ancient of days and is standing before him and he has yeah so this is why in the orthodox iconography of this event the image of christ looks like an old christ and that's because in ezekiel 1 and 10 and in revelation 1 and 2 the description of christ is having white hair and a radiant appearance same as the ancient of days so what that means is that as jesus says the only image and icon of the father is the son so there's two hypostases there, but we don't have an image of the hypostasis of the father because he has no image other than the son. 
So that's why the iconography of the Ancient of Days pictures him that way. Okay, so in this case, the figure of Son of Man is, is going to be... A, what is the identity of that figure in this case? Jesus. It's the ascension. Jesus is ascending, and this is called the session, where he comes to the throne of God and is given authority over every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's what's described in the book of Revelation when he comes before... Uh, I mean, it's the same description in the book of Revelation as well after the ascension. So it's it's the Son of Man. Who else so, can be the and, Son of Man? So in this case, in Daniel 7, both hypostases belong to the to the hypostasis of the Son? No. I'm sorry, the... the no, two, there's no the, image the, of the Father physics. there. It's the Father speaking, just like when the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son. There's no image of the hypostasis. The, an old man didn't appear to baptize Jesus. A voice is heard, Right. And, yes, that's correct. And so that, in, in our theology, just like we never see the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit, we see an energetic manifestation proper to that person. So there's an energetic manifestation of the Father granting to the Son all authority, power, and dominion. There's an energetic manifestation of the uh, Holy Spirit as a dove and as tongues of fire. But those are not the persons of the Holy Spirit or the Father because we never have a direct hypostatic image of either of those persons. All right. Energetic manifestations of them, just like the voice. So there's two hypostases present. Doesn't mean there's an image or a visible form of the Father. Mm. So it's it's more of an uh, uh, it's, it's it's a physical description, but in essence, it's more of an audible manifestation. Is that's like a, like a more of a? Well, that's what a, we see in the baptism of Christ, right? Yes. Nobody sees yeah. an old man in the sky, right? They hear a that's voice. Correct. That's Right. And, yeah, G and you notice old. Jesus says there was no, no one has seen the father at any time. Right. And when Moses talks about, uh, Mount Sinai, he says, you saw no form, but you heard the voice. Jesus is the visible manifestation. He is the voice. Yes. Um, my, 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 uh, my thinking is, uh, when we take that back in the old Testament, the figure of the ancient of this, in this case, the physical description is there for is it, is it going to be for literary purposes but the essence of the manifestation uh is more of an audible in tandem with the with the scene of the transfiguration and the baptism in this case let me let me pull it up here Yeah, so the, again, like, let me find a image of. You have to, we have to find a. Yeah. Hopefully that's not like a weird heterodox. So. <clears throat> the way that it's describing the Ancient of Days here, right? His hair was a uh, garment white as snow, right? Th fiery flame of fire, right? That image is the way that Christ is described in Revelation 1 and 2. And, also, right. and also in Ezekiel. Uh, right. And that's depicting the hypostasis of the Son as the icon of the Father, right? It's not... It, it's, it's the Father in verses 9 and 10, right? giving the dominion and the power to the son of man right when he ascends but in our theology the only image of the ancient of days is the son of man does that make sense yeah i i, I understand what you, what you're saying but but in this case uh, uh by the way bro like I'm, I'm an orthodox like you but this this text is one of the one of the one of the texts that that's still in a sense I, i'm uh, I'm still trying to, in a sense, come up, come with terms with it because, because when when I read the text, it it seems that you have, uh, uh, like, as, as as we both agree, there's two divine manifestations, two divine figures, mm -hmm. but uh, in this case, yeah, but I, that I first that, that first Father, divine figure is the image of Christ, so it's not two Christs, it's the Father, as the image of Christ speaking to the son of man christ does that make sense it's not two person it's not two jesuses 
it's the only legitimate image of Jesus. It's it's a in other words, it's a, what you said originally. Yes, it's it's a figurative description outside of time and space that is the person of the Father as the image of the Son, speaking to one like the Son of Man, Christ. Does that make sense? Oh, so yeah, yeah. So so the okay. okay it's not two Jesuses. It's yeah, I, I the Ancient you, I of Days, the Father. But he's only accurately described through the imagery of the sun, right? Mm. Okay, I need I need I need to think more about what you. So this is, if you want the explanation of this, the Icon Council, the Moscow Icon Council, deals with this issue, and it's a uh, it's called the Ancient of Days dispute. There's a big dispute at the council over who the Ancient of Days is, right? And there were some people who said. Well, the Ancient of Days has to be Jesus and the Son of Man somebody else. But then the passage where it says one like the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days and is given dominion, that's mirrored in the book of Revelation where it's clearly Christ being given dominion over all the tribes, songs, and nations. So the, the, the identity of the Ancient of Days is the Father, and I think St. Nicodemus or somebody points this out and uh, notes that it's, it's the, the only accurate descriptions of the father are the images of the son but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that it's not the father in the first description does that make sense it's the father so yes yeah. okay I'm, I'm 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 back i'm, I'm confused again so the this, this the ancient of days in daniel 7 if if we take let us say the try to come with it's the father with, so verse 9 and 10 is the father okay okay now, so when, that same, when, when, but listen, the descriptions of the Father in that passage are all descriptors elsewhere in the Bible in Ezekiel and Revelation that are referencing the Son, okay? Yes. yes so, right, yeah. what that means is not that there's two Jesuses, it means that the description of Ancient of Days has similar deified, transfigured imagery of Jesus because Jesus is the only icon of the Father. So in it's, this case, uh, in this case, the Son of Man is going to be like a, the uh, a prophetic vision about the incarnation. In this case, the, the it's the ascension, uh, the ascension, the ascension. Okay. So listen, yeah. in the Book of Revelation, Revelation is describing after Jesus has ascended and he's in heaven, incarnate. Right? Yes. Yeah, okay. that's right. That's the Son of Man, and it says that he is given dominion over all tribes tongues and nations that's the very thing that daniel 7 is describing okay that's right so daniel 7 verses 13 and 14 i behold one like the son of man coming in the clouds of the heaven and he came to the ancient of days he brought him and was given to him glory dominion and a kingdom his kingdom will not pass away this is the same yeah. text in the book of revelation describing jesus's ascension mm, okay gotcha so yeah, it's no, jesus no, yeah. being coming to the Ancient of Days, the Father in Heaven after His Ascension. But the imagery of the Father is only going to use Christic imagery because there's no other legitimate icon of the Father but the Son. So it's not two Jesuses. It's the Father with Christic imagery and symbolism presenting, uh, get, granting the kingdom to the Son. It's not two Jesuses. It's just using symbols and imagery that John and Ezekiel see about the resurrected, glorified Christ. Does that make sense or not? You still confused? Yeah, yeah. Partially, okay. I would say to be to be in complete transparency with you. Okay. What What's confusing? But, but I, I, well, hold on. Let's slow down. What's confusing? Yeah, because I'm I'm still if if and I, I agree with you. The the descriptions that that we have in the issue of the Ancient of Days in Daniel seven. Are applied in the New Testament of uh, on Jesus, but but I'm, I'm still if if so uh, as you said in Daniel seven in the verses uh, verse nine when when the first uh, uh, yes. appearance it's the, the Father divine, Daniel nine example. Daniel seven that's, nine is the Father yes that's the, that's the Father right and when 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 the Son of Man is presented before the Ancient of Days that's that's gonna be that's that's a reference to the ascension of Jesus Christ yeah. to the to the highest heaven. Yeah, because it's I'm, in the I'm Book of Revelation too, when he's ascended. Yeah, yeah. So, so, in, but, 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 my, 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 in my mind, and still, in, in this case, I, I, I'm, I still have to listen. Divine. 
the symbol and imagery of Jesus as the white haired glorified being that's applied to the father does not mean there's two Jesuses. No, I, I agree with you. Okay. Like I'm, I'm ruling this out. I'm, I'm ruling the two Jesus. Uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, right. So what? Conclusion. So what's unclear? My 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 issue is still if in verse nine we have the ancient of days, mm -hmm. and and in this case the ancient of days here strictly with verse nine is mm -hmm. that a reference not physically the physical de description but the the figure himself. Is that a reference to the hypothesis of the Father indirectly through the image of the Son? Is that is that what yes. I understand? Yes, yeah, okay. correct. And indirectly there is the is is a good way to put it because sometimes in the uh, nuances of the icon dispute, the question arises: Well, if it's not the person of the Father, what's being signified? What's being signified is the idea of the Father, or it's the energetic manifestation that points to the Father. So there's never a direct incarnation or manifestation of the person of the father or of the person of the holy spirit then what is it it's the energetic manifestation proper to the person of the father now i know the energy signify nature but they come and they appear hypostatically in hypostatic so in the mode of the persons that have them so it's the person of the father manifesting the energies proper to him to signify him to point to him but it's mm -hmm. not his hypostasis that's being incarnated or imaged here. It's it's indirect, as you said, is a good way to put it. So that's why he uses the imagery of the Son to point to the Father. That's why Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. No man has seen the Father at any time, Jesus says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for that. appreciate that. So there's not and two said, ancient of days, there's not two Jesuses, there's one ancient of days here that is the Father, as St. Nicodemus says. But the imagery that's used to signify and point out the idea of the Father is imagery that is appropriate to the glorified Christ. Because in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, the form of God and the glory of God that appears is one like the Son of Man and one that rides the chariot. He is the image of the Father, the image of the invisible God. Yeah, yeah. And you said which council goes more into details about this this uh, dispute? You said the that. Moscow Icon Council goes super deep into this. Read the Lasky Ospensky book, Volume Two, Theology of the Icon, mm. Volume Two, goes into great detail yeah. about just this question. Moscow Council. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that. Yeah, those are really good questions, and I'm not trying to be, uh, you know. Um, impatient with you it's it's good it's a it's good questions it's a little confusing at first uh houston is back what's up houston uh let's see try hitting on mute matt belcher says five dollars what's the best argument for protestants protestants about the second commandment uh yeah i, I link the uh, icon article um matt belcher how do i call in if you guys want to call in it's through the x twitter link there uh in the chat in the show description go ahead houston what's up Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. I can hear you, man. What's up? Dimitri, what's up? Dimitros. Hey, what's up? Yes, sir. Hi, right, how's it going, buddy? Good. What's on your mind? All right. Filioque. Ready? So if we go to Ephesians 2, and Ephesians 2 says, Grace and peace be unto you from the Father our, of our God and the Son, Jesus Christ. Passages like this can be used to say, look, the Holy, where the uh, grace and peace is the Holy Spirit, uh, people that are, are not on the Orthodox side of the Filioque argument could point to this and say, uh, you know, here it is. Now, that being said, my ultimate question is, has this theological argument ultimately become irrelevant? And No, reasons, and this passage has nothing to do with the Filioque. So well, it's, here, here's right. the second thing, and then, and then I want to hear your, your thoughts on okay, it, basically. Okay, sure. Um, another argument will has been made, like, there was a misunderstanding at the Council of Florence. For example, they would say the Orthodox were thinking about the structure of the Godhead as far as this, as this filioque sure. and 
and the Catholics were thinking to as how it translates down to the man in the street, which this passage could be again be used to support that. Your thoughts? Okay, so what you're describing is called economia. So the first confusion about the Ephesians passage is about the economia. So nobody nobody denies Orthodox or Roman Catholic that Jesus sends the Spirit into time and space through being incarnate. Okay. Uh, clearly, he says, I will send you the Holy Spirit as the comforter. He breathes on them. The Spirit comes uh, at Pentecost and so forth. The question is the hypostatic origin of the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Council of Florence clearly does, designates that, citing the Council of Lyons and citing St. Augustine before him, that them, that there's a double eternal personal procession uh, uh, from the Father and the Son is from a single principle. So that's what the Orthodox disagree with because the only single principle in the Godhead is the person of the Father and by extension the single divine nature that he communicates. Gotcha. So that way you can't say that the Holy Spirit uh, proceeds from this from the from the Son because the hypostatus already exists in the Son. Well, if the Father generates a Son whole and entire then the Father must also spirate the Spirit whole and entire because there's nothing, there's no splitting, there's no parts. So there's nothing that the Son could contribute to the procession of the Spirit that the Father uh, doesn't do, right? So it's whole and entire. There can't be a composite uh, procession here. So, and there's no principle of unity that two persons share as a Father-Son principle of the Spirit that would then degrade the uh, divine nature that the Holy Spirit has. So there's no property of causation that father and son have that the spirit lacks. Causation is precisely the hypostatic property of the father. So now if you give the father's hypostatic property to the son, you have a father-son, which is a dyad, as uh, St. Uh, Photius says. All right, I'm going to have to go dissect this a little bit more but i appreciate it yeah we have uh really we have a three-hour talk on the filioque from the uh Sashinsky book uh houston you want to try again hey jake hey what's up hey uh i had a question about orthodox theology so i'm i'm a protestant i'm from the my background is church of christ Mm -hmm. If you're familiar with them. I am. Yeah, so I'm coming out of the Church of Christ, and, <laughs> you know, I've been listening to you for a while. But, okay. Um, they are credo-baptist, uh, you know, and so they, you know, they don't baptize babies, and but they also believe in baptismal regeneration, although they wouldn't, they wouldn't use that term, I don't think. Right. Um, so <clears throat> infant baptism makes sense to me, and baptismal regeneration makes sense to me, but also with... Orthodox teaching, would you say it's accurate? Uh, my understanding is that infants are born you know, without the guilt of that. So my understanding was, like for Catholics, I always thought, well, they baptize babies because they want to get rid of original sin. And so with Orthodox theology, you know, you don't have original sin like Catholics do. So what's the reasoning for baptizing infants uh, with an Orthodoxy? Because uh, infants have the effects of original sin, not the guilt of original sin. So they still are deprived of grace. So the, the nature that they have is good, uh, but they're, not lack, they're lacking the uncreated grace. And so that's the status of all of us. So that's why we baptize, is to, to bring them into the kingdom. Um, it doesn't mean that they are guilty of actual sins. This is why both Orthodox and Roman Catholic theology distinguishes uh, what, what's called original sin from actual sin. Actual sin, sin, strictly speaking, is only something that you can commit as an individual uh, choice by will. So there's no state of sin. There's no state of guilt. It's a, it's a, it's a action of the will. Uh, even according to James, James says that the desires that we have themselves are not sin. He says, but desire when it's given birth desire when it's consented to gives birth to sin so when you go against god's law is the sin that's an action of will it's not a state of being so roman catholic theology has uh, over many centuries tempered its view tempered its augustinianism to where nowadays in the roman catholic church you don't even have to believe in infant limbo you can discard it or believe it if you want to it's made optional 
uh, via the Holy Office a few years ago when I think Ratzinger or somebody put out that document saying that you don't have to believe in limbo. Um, so that's the key thing is to just uh, uh, distinguish um, original guilt from original sin. Uh, most Roman Catholics agree with Orthodox on that specific point. Uh, but I think that a lot of times Roman Catholics still think of it in the terms of original guilt because they talk about it like it's a stain. I mean, a stain is something that has substantial existence. And a, a, something that's a deprivation of grace is not a stain. So it's bad in right. analogies that they use. Right. So the, the argument that you know my Church of Christ friends will use is infants do not commit sin. You know, they're not guilty of sin, and therefore they don't need baptism. They don't need to experience Yeah, but baptism is not... Uh, salvation and baptism are not just a, a situation like all Protestants think of... Like a one-time transaction. No, yeah, changing your right. status of legal status. Right, okay. That's yeah, the mistake. That it's an ongoing process. That's why... It, yeah, well, it's not just an ongoing theory. process. It's also regaining the Holy Spirit. So the, the, the ongoing process has as its goal the attaining of... The life of the Holy Spirit, uncreated life. And no Protestant teaches that. True. Yeah. Well, okay. they'll say, we teach that. No, you don't teach the Orthodox view of participating in uncreated grace. Almost every Protestant teaches a form of created grace. Yeah. What's the... Uh, I've not really looked into the... I've heard you talk about the you know uncreated grace versus created grace. And a lot of it's going over my head, I'll be honest. So what what should I read to better understand that? Well, I mean, as you get into Orthodox theology, you know, if you read, uh, Lasky has a great book. Um, it's the it's not uh, mystical theology. It's the other one. I think it's Vision of God. There's multiple chapters on um, grace being uncreated in that that are good. Um, but, uh, you know, really, it's just the the essence energy distinction. It's the same. It's the same thing. Read the debate between uh, Palamas and uh, Barley Might. Dialogue between Orthodox and Barley Might. Because the whole debate. The debate shifts away from essence energy distinction into what do we participate in. So either okay. we participate in another creature, which is the Roman Catholic position still to this day, or we participate in an uncreated reality distinct from God's essence, which means there has to be an essence energy distinction. So, Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, good question. And uh, I was joking when I said that I just saw a little face with a beard. So you don't literally look like Ibarra. So don't take that personal. It's just being silly. Um, flame two, what's up? By the way, a lot of people in the chat, shout out to you guys. We got up to 900, almost a thousand. And then of course, every time I get, every time I get close to a thousand, it suddenly YouTube has an error that there's not enough data and it drops down to 700, but that's okay. Uh, if you guys want to hop on the link to call in is in the show description there. It's the X link, Twitter link you hop on. When you request to speak, you will be muted. Unmute yourself. Hello? Hey, what's up? So, I've quite, I kind of learned a lot from our last conversation, and I was thinking like... What, what, uh, what was our last conversation about? Um, it was about morality and figuring out what the good was and things like that. And what I was wondering is... How can we truly figuring out what's true? Because I thought about this for a long time, and I thought that, um, like, we can't figure things out. Like, when it comes to spirituality, we can't figure things out empirically. Because let's say somebody had a vision, and they saw an angel. Let's say they can't know if that was their mind making it up, or if it was a demon, or whatever. So okay, we, so can't we start with divine revelation. So what's the problem there? Well, okay, with the Bible, how do you know it was from God? Well, there's a lot of different ways that I might go about that. I could take a philosophical approach and consider the transcendental argument and the type of theism that's presented in the Bible and what's unique about that theism. Or I could look at, say, Messianic prophecies, dozens of them in the Old Testament, and how they're fulfilled as an attestation to divine inspiration. Those are some of the ways. Yeah, but even in relation to prophecies, how do you know it wasn't... Um... How do you know it wasn't some hyperdimensional beings or humans from the future? Like, how how do you know it was actually God? Hyperdimensional. Why would hyperdimensional beings from the future teach that well, Christ is I don't Messiah? Know they, 
that they might. So, I mean, I don't know. Well, like, well, it, no, you're, I, you're misunderstanding. So reading those prophecies gives you specific dates about a certain type of religion and a certain type of Messiah, a certain type of Jesus born at this point at this time, and the religion that he founds as part of those prophecies. So in other words, the church is also included in the prophecies. So why would, why would the church teach the theology that I'm talking about if ultimately, secretly, it was interdimensional being? There's no reason to believe in interdimensional beings from that. There isn't, but there's no way to prove that it was actually from God. Why wouldn't the fulfilled prophecies be an attestation to the veracity of the Bible? Well, because it's ultimately still guessing, isn't it? It's what? Guessing. Why would it be guessing? I mean, it would still be guessing because you're still inferring from something. So, okay. for example, in um, in your worldview, don't you, you think it's impossible that aliens would exist, right? Uh, it's not logically impossible, but I've not seen any evidence or be- reason to believe in aliens. So, if an alien appeared to you and you're able to touch it physically like Thomas, you would believe it exists? Are you equating Jesus' resurrection to aliens? Do you understand that there's a, an entire thousands of pages of books describing the meaning of the arrival of the Messiah? It has nothing to do with aliens. So it would it would be absolutely nonsensical to bring in aliens when you've got, you know, a few thousand two thousand years of pro- prophetic literature and revelation describing the specifics of the arrival of the Messiah, and then to say, well, maybe it's aliens. There's no what, there's no reason to conclude aliens. Okay, but even in like relation to these prophecies, so I mean, just for one quick example, what would be your strongest example of these prophecies? Well, I mean, there's just descriptions of when and where Jesus would be born and what he would do in his lifetime, like Genesis 49 or, or Daniel 9 or Psalm 110 or Psalm 23 or Isaiah 6 through 11. I mean, there's there's literally probably hundreds of prophecies if you want to be specific about it. Well, the location of Jesus' birth with like, um, I mean, it was talking about a tribe, Bethlehem, Ephrathah. I, I don't I'm even. Sure th- I don't think you're even familiar with any of these prophecies or the Bible at all. So how are you? Compl- how are you uh, qualified to speak on what it's talking about? It wasn't Bethlehem, Ephrathah, a tribe. Would not be. Would Bethlehem be is not a tribe. David, do you know anything about what you're critiquing? I mean, if you want to make a critique, you should know about it. Have you read the Bible? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You've read the Bible. And you think Bethlehem is a tribe? Well, Bethlehem Ephrata is mentioned in the Old Testament. I believe that was, was it one of the tribes of Judah, I believe. No, Bethlehem is not a tribe. So so you don't know what you're talking about. You're not familiar with any Messianic prophecies, even though you've read the Bible? Um, I'm familiar with some. Okay, like what? Name one. Well, it was said that the uh, Messiah would come and save the world, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so you're not. Okay. Exactly. So, again, people that come on and they don't, they, they're not familiar with this stuff, but claim that they are, claim that they know this stuff. So, again, if you, if you don't want to go the route of knowing or looking at biblical prophecies, then I would say the transcendental argument for God would be the next uh, philosophical. If you want to go into the domain of skepticism, which is what it sounded like, um, yeah, okay, then let's talk about the transcendental argument and refuting skepticism uh, philosophically. Layman, what's up, layman? So I don't know anything about the Bible, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, well, maybe it's aliens. Okay, but if you had read the Bible, there would be, you know, no reason to think that it's anything to do with aliens. What's up, man? You calling me from Pakistani toilets? What's up? Dude, um, so I wanted, uh, are you on a child's play phone? Like, what are you calling me on? Yeah, I can't hear anything you're saying. I can just literally can't hear anything. Uh, let's see. Bob, what's up, Bob? Yeah, Elam, that's why I always tell people to unmute at the beginning. You're supposed to know to unmute. 
Okay, so Bob can't connect. Come out and come back in when it uh, when it does this. I don't know why it does this. So if you can't connect, come out and come back in. Fresh tap. What's up, fresh tap? Guys, guys, I want to remind you too to head on over to chalk.com. That is the show sponsor. I've got a nice sexy ad I'm gonna show you here in a minute about chalk.com and boosting your testosterone through supplementation. Uh, what's up, man? Fresh tap. Pop pop. Are you there? You're on. John Q. Taxpayer. What's up, man? Gonna set us straight. Lay down the law and set us straight, John Q. Taxpayer. Unmute yourself. Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's up? Hey, wanted to ask you a question. Um, I've been just watching uh, a little bit more of a guy on YouTube, uh, Michael Heiser. Um, he had an interesting view when it comes to, I don't know if you've ever heard of divine council theology. Uh, I was wondering if yeah. I could get your opinion on it, if you've heard of it or not. Yeah. I mean, I, he, before he passed away, he was a subscriber to my website. Um, I read his materials 20 years ago. Yeah. From the Psalms. So anyway, thank you for that. Appreciate that question. Uh, fresh tap. Do you want to talk or not? I guess not. Gonna remove you. Uh, Ricky, do you have a question? Uh, I mean, excuse me, do you have a disagreement? Because t today we're taking people who disagree. So I'll bring you on, but uh, today it's disagreeers. Got to unmute. Tanji, Tanji, T A N J I. What's up, Tanji? No, set us straight. Hello. Hey, what's up? Yeah, so I'm um like a Southern Baptist kind of. I don't actually align theologically, but I'm trying to look into orthodoxy, and I just have a few questions. Um, okay. I know you've been getting a lot of non disagreeers today, but I didn't know what else I could ask. So is that alright if I ask some questions? Uh, about what? So do you think that um, non-Orthodox Christians go to hell? Uh, I mean, we don't make personal judgments on people's destiny because we're not told that. Um, but we do tell people that they need to become Orthodox because that's what we're told to tell people. Okay, and then um, what exactly is the Orthodox doctrine of ancestral sin? That everybody who descends from Adam has the consequences of his sin, uh, namely the... Uh, death and the inheritance of the passions but the consequences are not themselves the sin sin is defined as an action of the will against the good and so there is an age of accountability uh, by which we do begin to sin uh, in terms of personal actual sin uh, but that is not the same thing as original sin and that's not original guilt so that's what we reject I see. okay do you um in the orthodox church is confession a necessary thing like confession to a priest absolutely yeah how does that work exactly? Because uh, Jesus says that whoever, he, when he breathes on the apostles, he says, whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they retain. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good questions. Bye-bye. Yes, sir. So, uh, dude in the chat, bro thinks he's the voice of region. Do, do you want to come on? You're welcome to make your arguments. Um, I don't know if you're talking about me or somebody else that was debating. But uh, you're welcome to come on and make your arguments there. What was his name? Farhan. Did you want to come on, Farhan? You're welcome to make your case, your argument. So we got uh, Lorna. Lorna, what's up, Lorna? Just unmute. Are you talking about about me just unmuting? So I yeah, just I want to you. honor you, um, Mr. Dyer. You what? Uh, I'm not a dissenter, so I may be inappropriate for requesting a mic. But with the previous person's um, question, is not so simple as um, where it says in uh, Genesis chapter 5, when it's talking about the uh, genealogy of Adam, that... Um, that um, that that Adam lived a hundred. So chapter five, verse three, 
And Adam lived so, 130 do, do, years. Do you, do you have an objection or do, do you have an objection or a disagreement or topic you want to get into? Yes, sir. I just want to say um, that that it is a common thread that people say that we are um, created in God's image, but that was Adam specifically that was created in God's image. And so in Genesis no, all, chapter all 5. All human beings are created in God's image. Right, but if we go to Genesis chapter 5, um, when it's talking about the gene genealogy of Adam, um, it says um, specifically that um, in verse 4, in the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years and they got sons and daughters and um and Adam, okay wait no sorry so verse three and adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and that was after he had sinned in the garden mm -hmm. so therefore with he begat a son in his own likeness after his image mm -hmm. And called his name Seth. Would that not perpetuate the um, that we are no longer creating God's image, but in the image underneath original sin? No, original sin is a deprivation, not an image. Uh, and many texts describe the fact that we're made in the image of God, um, even after the fall. So again, thank you for that. Not trying to be mean. That's the the, the spirit of Franzia hath spoken. Friesen, what's up, Friesen? We're taking disagreeers today. Appreciate your comments. Pop, pop. Got to unmute, Freezing. Hey, how's it going? Yes, sir. Hey, I just had a quick question. Um, so, like, at, at these ecumenical councils that decide doctrine and refute heresy and stuff, like mm -hmm. Chalcedon, Nicaea, mm -hmm. how do they decide... Like, like what's Christ? Is it all based on scripture or like oral tradition or like what, what are they, what are they mostly going off? Well, I mean, they to, explain like in the councils, answers. the sources and typically the sources are kind of uh, laid out in a structure of the scriptures and divine revelation through tradition and the arguments from the church fathers that preceded them and the councils that preceded them and arguments from reason. So that's typically the structure they use. Okay, sweet. So it's not just, it's not just mostly based on scripture it's oral tradition and other stuff as well the first most important tier is scripture and oral tradition and those things are linked they go together they can't you can't separate the two because you can't know what the scriptures are apart from tradition sweet all right thank you for that appreciate it mm. Yeah, so a lot of times Protestants want to set up an either or, like, oh, it's either you follow the Bible or you follow the traditions of man. So it's a both and, right? Ryan Harvey is in the chat. He's got pictures of him running and sprinting. So I hope he doesn't run me down. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh oh. Go for uh, it. Set me straight. So, um, Amaya Fizai uh, says, Of what nature are you partaking in in the Divine Eucharist? The uncreated energies, as Cyril says. Okay, so yeah, they would they would say though, like, like we're taking of Christ. So, how is the uncreated energies Christ? Because every energy is in hypostatic. It comes to us from the person that has those that nature, from which the energy proceeds. Got to run. El Californio. El Californio. Hey, Este. What you got for me, bro? You better hurry. There's a lot of arguments being made. Hey, fool. You barely, you could barely get on, bro. What kind of arguments you got? You got to unmute. El Californio, unmute, man. Unmute, bro. El Muto. L California, I'm you. Baja California. Baja California. Hey, what's up, Jay? What's going on, bro? Hey, bro, I left my wallet in El Segunda. What's up? 
Yeah, what's up, man? Yo, I wanted to tell you, uh, <coughs> Roman Catholics got valid sacraments. What do you think about that? Oh, indeed, bro. Time for me to go home. Smackdown. What does that mean? What, I mean, qual what, valid. What does that mean? Does that mean that the church, the Orthodox Church, can decide to accept the Roman Catholic priest and through vesting? Okay, I don't have a problem with that. Does that mean that? Uh, does that mean that the sacraments themselves are graceful outside of the church? How do you get that? Well, I guess what I'm saying is like, let's say you have confession in a Roman Catholic church. If your sins are truly forgiven, well, they're forgiven on earth as they are in heaven. And as you know, as far as I know, so it's not a question of valid. It's a question of whether they're efficacious in terms of the grace. So you're trading on confusing the, the words valid and gracious. Okay, but if it's valid, it's gracious because it has it has effect. No, it's not. That's that's the point I'm making. How do you know it is? Okay, so uh, how do you know it is? Um, how do you know that the Orthodox sacraments are okay? Two coque. Uh, what about ism? That's a fallacy. All right. Well, okay. And what about the Eucharist? Do you think Able, the Roman Catholics had a barely... real Eucharist? Barely a, a real Do you think? Do you think they got a real? The, 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 the true blood and blood of your Christ when no. they when they offer it? I'm not talking about the Norvus Ordo, obviously not. But like maybe. Oh, the but wait a minute. Right, or the Eastern obviously, right wait, hold on. Obviously not the Novus Ordo, but what defines valid sacramentology in Rome is communion with the papacy. Well, I don't know. I think a lot of people in the SSPX and uh, some other Eastern rites would, would so? take... Uh, who, who speaks for Roman Catholicism, the papacy or the SSPX? Because valid jurisdiction... <laughs> so having the keys and having jurisdiction and having illicit celebration of the sacrament in Roman Catholic theology also depends on being in communion with the Pope. So they might have illicit celebration, but you're saying valid... Well, it's valid in the in the Roman Catholic theology of uh, that. Well, let me let me rephrase that. Technically, you're correct that in the Roman Catholic system, the SSPX have a valid sacrament, but they don't have jurisdiction. Is what I was trying to say. So let me let me set that straight. But the Orthodox view of sacraments is different from the Roman Catholic or the SSPX position. But regardless, it's not the SSPX that speaks for Roman Catholicism. It's the papacy. That's what Vatican One says. Yeah, that's what Vatican One says, but I mean, pre-Vatican One, uh, I think you pretty much had the formulas uh, written in stone. I believe in like 1948 too. They had like a the the Vatican had a document. It was like sacramentus or the or yeah, well, or something. So like what? Like well, all all this stuff's a big contradiction. It's a big bundle of contradictions. So what, why are you? Well, who even cares what Rome and SSPX says? I don't care. Um, well, I think we should care because I think the most of the Western world is Roman Catholic. And so? if we want the oh. Western world to come back to, 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 to normality before, you know, the fall of Vatican II, um, I think... Well, I don't think the normality is is Vatican I Catholicism. I think normality is Orthodox Church, and we don't have the same sacramentology. So, there you go. I, I, I think I, I do lean more toward the Orthodox position too, but I, you know, what, do, what about the Orientals? Do the Orientals have valid sacraments as far as you're, when you're sin confusing, is you're confusing it? this acceptance of the valid celebration of a ritual and the church then saying that we don't have to repeat the ritual because now the impediment to the grace has been removed. You can be received by vestments or something like that. That's not the same thing as saying that they have the grace within the sacrament outside of the church, two different things. And the argument always hinges on confusing people with the question of valid. It's not a question of valid because that's the Latin idea of how you interpret the sacraments. Is it valid or not? The SSPX are valid. It doesn't matter in the Orthodox view because in the Orthodox view, if you're in schism, you can, it does the, the, the legal status of the sacraments doesn't even matter because you're outside the faith. Roman Catholicism says that you can have the, uh, the celebration of the sacraments and the grace without the faith. The Orthodox view is that you can't have the sacraments with the grace of the sacraments outside of the faith. If you surrender the faith, the grace is gone. That's the Orthodox view. That's not the traditional Roman Catholic view a la the late Middle Ages. <clears throat> yeah, I, um... Yeah, the, you know, I guess the, the problem here is the Roman Catholics kind of keep changing like their yeah. uh, 
the requirements for validity. And yes, I'm going off the Latin terms as far as like validity. Right, I know. As far as yeah. Like, so the that Orthodox Jews are not the same. So and then it listed if it was if they have jurisdiction or not. Right. Which you know, I guess in some Latin sacraments, jurisdiction is a requisite for right. validity. Right. Which is, does it actually take effect? Exactly. That's that was my point system. about the question right. of uh, jurisdiction. Because, for example, I'm, I'm going from memory because I don't remember everything about Roman Catholic canon law, and I don't even care. But so there's something about uh, in order for, for example, um, a, a schismatic bishop like. Does he have the office of the keys? And the question is no, because if you're, it, it doesn't matter about how valid and licit your ordination was. If you're not in communion with the Roman See, you no longer have jurisdiction, and that's different. So that would mean that a schismatic SSPX bishop, in the Roman Catholic perspective of the papacy, does not have jurisdiction. That means that his exercise of the keys is also not really the exercise of the keys. So do you see what I'm saying? Like, so if he hears your confession, uh, is your sins really forgiven? Well, I mean, if he's lost jurisdiction, I don't know that he can exercise the function of forgiving your sins because he's a, he, he no longer has jurisdiction. And forgiving sins is one of the elements of having jurisdiction. But I mean, all this stuff is inane right. and ridiculous. Like this is like splitting hairs over stuff when the papacy is like out here pushing like butt stuff. Like this doesn't even matter, man. They're pushing butt stuff. Obviously, that's not the true church. You know, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, no, I, I agree with you a lot of your position, but I guess what I'm saying is like, look, I don't agree with the butt stuff. I don't agree with a lot of the weirdo things. That okay, well, the, pa the papacy right? pushes it, so it's over. It's over. The papacy pushes they, they, it. It's over. But I guess what I'm saying, as long as there's some type of validity, some type of grace, like hidden away in the Eastern Rites or in the SSPX, like maybe it's bro, not it's not hidden maybe away. Maybe. It's not hidden away when the church is built on Rome. The Roman Catholic Church is not built on Eastern rites. But, but that's just this Vatican one, and that's kind that's of that's so it. You're grasping at straws, dude. Like you can't pick and choose which ones you want. I am Orthodox, by the way. I'm just arguing against you. <laughs> well, why are you arguing Roman well, Catholic positions if you're Orthodox? It doesn't make any sense. Because I used to be a Roman Catholic, and I guess so. You haven't gotten rid of all the Roman Catholic stuff. Is the issue then? Look, I guess what I want to say is this, dude. Like, when the Spaniards uh, uh, showed the Aztecs and the Native Americans in two continents how to become Christians, how to become Catholics, show them the priesthood, the sacraments, and all that. Yeah, again, so we don't have to make personal Christ judgments. Christ. Listen, we don't have to make personal judgments well, on all those people. All those people that they baptized. Dude, I, are you they, listening they, to me? They are they... Are you listening to me? Yeah. I'm answering your question. We don't have to make yeah, personal good. judgments on the, 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 the determinations of their eternal destiny. We can commend them to God. We don't know that. But none of that makes Roman Catholic sacraments suddenly gracious. Well, if it converted the Aztec Empire to Christianity, I think there's some grace in that, right? I never I mean, denied that there's grace. Again, I didn't, I never, no one could come to the Orthodox Church if there wasn't grace outside the church. That doesn't mean that they're the church, you see. Because the Orthodox view is that if you separate yourself from the church, you, you lose that membership in the church you're no longer the body i, def I definitely think that the roman catholic church is definitely schismatic and schism okay. schismatic and too, uh, okay, so the mistake here is thinking that like roman catholics think a la the uh, augustinian sacramentologists by the way it's not even consistently augustinian because augustine thought that if you commit the sin of heresy and schism you no longer are in the church even though he was, so the sacrament can be quote valid but you're not benefiting from it because you're outside the church. So he believes in no salvation outside the church. The qualification here, though, that's different, and I'm trying to tell you what the, the specific point of departure is, is that the Roman Catholic position thinks that you can have the celebration of the sacrament, it's the grace of that sacrament, outside of the faith. And that's the key point of departure. The Orthodox says, no, if you leave the faith, Athanasius says in his festal letters, you no longer have the celebration of the Eucharist or whatever. It's not the Eucharist. And Father Deacon, you could comment on this in regard to the way that the Orthodox Church treats uh, priests in terms of canon law. Are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. But what's no, that? Father what's that? Deacon. Here? Father Deacon. Bro, oh, uh, you're, uh, you sound like you're new to Orthodoxy. Maybe you should just relax and learn this stuff before you start just freaking out. Listen to clergy tell you this. 
Oh yeah, sure. Let, let, so what was the question? I'm sorry. <clears throat> why why don't Roman Catholics also have the grace of the sacrament? Because people have really converted to Jesus. And I'm saying you often make a really good point about Orthodox canon law and the permission to have the sacrament. Yeah, so why should those outside the faith have uh have more blessings and a greater privilege than those in the Orthodox faith. So if you go to the Orthodox yeah. liturgy, the antimates, those are what's under the gospel. Um, and then when the gospel is taken off uh, and set to the back of the altar, when the consecration on there is the authorized signature by the bishop. So the priest can't actually perform the sacraments um nothing would be efficacious because the church is where the bishop is as uh saint ignatius says so what's happened in orthodoxy before is a bishop can suspend a priest and he takes his intimates meaning the priest can try to consecrate the Eucharist all he wants, he has no par, uh, power apart from the bishop. So if that's true, then why is it that those outside of the faith have a greater prerogative? Like, oh, but they can do it. Do you understand that they're argument? Not even, they're not even connected to a valid bishop. Oh, he left. So I bring you on and he leaves. So I don't know, maybe his connection dropped, but I mean, he's not even listening to what... And I like the way that you put it, too. So what this means is the church and the faith doesn't matter. Yeah, the, the, this is what leads the Roman Catholic Church to say that if you're a Satanist, you can be ordained a Roman Catholic priest, Leave that very night become a Satanist, and for the rest of your life you can consecrate the Eucharist. This is what leads the Roman Catholics to say that an atheist and a Muslim can baptize you. This is ridiculous. It's their view. Because that's where the the view leads. Now, people, when we bring this up, okay, he dropped off, so I'm bringing him back. Uh, go ahead. Did you hear the argument? Do you want me to repeat it? No, he's. Let's see what he says. Are you there? El California. Oh, I see him. Go ahead. El California. I'll do the J. Yeah, Just unmute you. El California. Did you hear the? <laughs> Did you hear Father Deacon's explanation from Orthodox canon law? Yeah, hi, hello. Yeah, I heard some of it, but I got disconnected for a while. So basically, I'll make it really quick. Me, to, Look, really quick, the, it's a very simple argument. If an Orthodox priest has to get the permission of a bishop to even have the Eucharist, the antimon, the permission, then why would people outside the church have a greater privilege than an Orthodox priest? Makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess I was just arguing from the Roman Catholic, Catholic point of view of right. like, you know, all the, the right. So we learn, kind of you need to relearn, Roman you got to relearn your sacramentology. You can't map on Roman Catholic SSPX sacramentology onto Orthodox. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it's hard, man. I live in Spain and I go to a Russian Orthodox church and the priest has only been in the country for two years. He doesn't speak Spanish. He doesn't speak English. It's like mm. purely Russian. So it's yeah. like, I'm going to the church, but it's like, I'm really an internet Orthodox and there's like the Spaniards are all Roman Catholic. So yeah. it's kind of it's hard, you know? Yeah, I understand. But, uh, yeah, but just hey, stick, just you though, persevere. Jimmy. Your show's doing a, a lot of good for a lot of people uh, internationally, you know? So, Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I'm not meaning, meaning, meaning to be mean with you. I just thought you were, I, I thought you were, no, I, no, didn't, no. I didn't realize you were Orthodox for a second. I thought you were Roman Catholic getting, getting salty, but that's okay. No, no, no. But, you know, I don't know. I, I, I like to think that more people are saved. I like to think like half of the world isn't doomed, you know, especially. Uh, that well, we don't have to judge state, people's, we don't, know, right. We don't have to judge people's destiny. We don't know their destiny. God can unite them in his own ways to the mystical body of Christ. And I mean, he does this with the thief on the cross. So God has his own ways that he can uh, unite people to the mystical body outside the norm. But the normative way is through the, the Orthodox, you know, sacramentology and theology. So. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I agree with you. I've been Orthodox for about three years now. So, um, 
So yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting experience, and yeah, learning a lot of like, especially about like uh, theosis, uh, things Roman Catholics don't talk about. You right. know, I've noticed like how they uh, put the divinity of like Mary everywhere, and then you go to Roman Catholic church, and Jesus is always getting like beat up and whipped, and like he's, like <laughs> half dying. You know, it's like you go to Orthodox church, Jesus was always like God and his resurrected, glory, like doing yeah. things. Exactly. Yeah, resurrected, and Mary's like more humble, like a regular lady. She's not like crowned, like flying through the sky. You know, it's like. <laughs> like yeah, I think that those are those Catholics are. Too, that I'm starting to realize, you know? Right. Yeah, those are kind of like uh, you know patterns of exaggeration that we see in Roman Catholic theology. Exactly. I totally agree. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, hopefully, we didn't get too salty there. Um, Layman wanted to come back. Did you come back? Are you? forgot what you were talking about a minute ago maybe we couldn't connect what's up layman i'm you hi hi sorry about that it's okay. um yeah so so I, I i i'm a watcher of um like um the diamond brothers like batting catholic.com i i i know uh that may be like a bad thing but um they brought up a point about um saint leo the great talking about um uh, like the the light of the transfiguration coming off of like Christ's um, face and and the light being basically a uh, um, from his like specific to his human nature. Um, I was wondering, like, does that contradict the uh, the idea that it's uncreated if it's specific to his human nature? Well, it's specific to his human nature because everything that Christ does, he does in the two natures that he possesses. So this is the Kyrillian idea of the communication of idioms or the communicatio idiomatum. So whatever is predicated of either nature, whether it's walking on water, whether it's the, the uh, uncreated light that shines through him, it's also appropriate to say that it occurs in the one incarnate hypostatic Christ. So it's one Christ acting. And he acts, uh, as Cyril says, in both natures and by both natures. But that doesn't mean that his person is reduced to the nature. So um, there's nothing wrong with saying that the uncreated light proceeds from and through his human nature, because that's what it is. But first, the, the end of Paul's letter to Timothy identifies God as the uncreated light. So do you think that God is a creature? No, no. I was just thinking more about like his, his body. Okay, do you think... The, why would the, I mean, the light there is a, it's called the transfiguration because it's a famous passage showing his deity. So if it's a created human light, why would that testify to his deity? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know for sure. I mean, the only thing I can think of is maybe it's like his humanity kind of being brought up. Brought up? What do you mean? Like, like, um... Well, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe maybe being divinized, or in a sense, maybe like... Okay, but, so, John 1, the, the light of Christ is identified as the uncreated light contrasted with the light of Genesis 1, which is created light. 1 Timothy 6, Paul says that uh, Christ is potentate, king of kings, lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. So the light, as it's always used in the New Testament... Where is there ever any suggestion or reference to God's light being a creature? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, it's, it's not a creature. So a, a quote where uh, it's talking about... I'm assuming I don't have the quote in front of me, but the quote where it's talking about the eminence or the emanation of the light or the radiance of the light from his human nature does not mean that it's a created light because the uncreated light comes to us we participated in it through the human nature of Christ. Just like the Eucharist, Saint, if you look at Cyril, Cyril in Ephesus describes what you eat in the Eucharist, right? Do you think you eat uh, created grace in the Eucharist or do, you, do you, or do you eat, as Cyril says, the uncreated immortality and energy of the God-man? Uh, I, I, th I think the, the uncreated energies. Yeah, so it's over for Roman Catholicism because they teach that what you partake of is a supernatural creation. Do you want me to cite? Ought for uh, you? Uh, I mean, I, I can look it up, but yeah. I mean, no, I appreciate it. Oh. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, is there any other uh, energy passages or anything you'd like me to address? Um, no, I, I was more, it was really just, that's it. Okay. Thank you, though. Sure. 
Yeah, good question. Yeah, so... <clears throat> lost my note and ought where I've got it on my my letter so they or excuse me in my um that's the procession of the spirit that's not the grace here we go where's my note on grace here it is so what we got? <clears throat> Fundamentals of Catholic Theology. Sanctifying grace is a created supernatural gift really distinct from God. And because Roman Catholicism, as Ott explains in the first few chapters, defines God as identical to his essence, his attributes are identical to his essence, he's defined as an absolutely simple monad essence, the cause is unique to, uh, excuse me, the uh, existence is, is identical to the essence, I should say. Actus purus, this leads them to then conclude about grace, that grace cannot be anything identical to God. It must be a created supernatural accident in the soul. And that's explicit in what we just saw in ought. So that means that what you partake of is not an uncreated reality. It's a created reality. Friesen's back. Uh-oh. What's up, dude? Set me straight. Yes, sir. Unmute, man. Hey, hey, thanks for letting me back on. Hey, so uh, I was reading a bit of of the mystical theology of the Eastern Church by Lossky. Uh -huh. And I think it's a bit above my reading level. So, and I, I'm kind of from like a Protestant background. So what, what would be like some books you recommend? To yeah, just, I, I would uh, start with uh, Clark Carlton or something like that, like Clark Carlton's uh, trilogy uh, or um, Orthodox Church by Meindorf. Stannis, what's up, Stannis? Hey there, I was inquiring into orthodoxy and I was wondering what is the orthodox view about, I suppose, consuming media like K-pop? I, I mean, I don't think there is an orthodox view on K-pop, but I think that any media that, you know, significantly promotes degeneracy is something that we should probably avoid. Uh, let's see, who's next? Bart, or no, Bat Sallow. I thought I said Bart, Bat Sallow. Brett Sales says, I just finished reading St. Cyril of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy. Incredible book. Thank you for the recommendation. It's been a game changer. Thank you, Brett Sales, for that 10 bucks. Yeah, that is a really good book. Unfortunately, the author kind of went off the rails, but the book is still a good uh, classic treatment of Cyril. What's up, Bat? Bat Salo? Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, so um, I've been watching a lot of your videos recently. Uh-huh. And uh, I love your debates with the atheists. I think atheism is total nonsense. Uh, I was baptized in the Orthodox Church as a child, but I kind of left because I live in Scotland, which mm -hmm. is like hella atheist. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm heading back into it. Uh, and I was just curious, in your debates, you always say that orthodoxy is the only uh, is the only world that gives a proper account for all the things like logic and all the transcendental categories. Can you go into a bit uh, in depth as to how that is? Because I don't really get that part. You always lose me there. Why is it orthodoxy specifically? Yeah, giving an account means uh, justification, like in an epistemic sense. So as we talked about earlier in this discussion a couple hours ago when uh, we had an atheist or former atheist asking that question, Christianity presents a certain specific metaphysic, a certain specific epistemology, and a certain specific ethic. That metaphysic, for example, gives an account for how all of the transcendental categories, which are the preconditions of knowledge, how they work together, how they inhere and interrelate with one another, and where they're located, namely in the created world and its structure, patterned on the divine mind. So that's what I mean. Okay, and... Uh... One second thing. Uh, how do I talk to atheists who 
try and like science me like they like they say things like uh like the the bible says that the earth was created in seven days and stuff like that how do i refute them well i would start studying uh you know critiques of uh evolutionary philosophy and the evolutionary paradigm i would start with stuff from like uh dr sarfati i would read uh sarah from rose's book uh, Cre uh, genesis creation early man i would read uh um Titus Bruckhart's essays that critique uh, evolutionary philosophy from a philosophical perspective, because the problem with going to the the science papers and all like you'll never get anywhere with all of that. And really, science is built on philosophy, even though modern science people don't know this or recognize this. If you can go to philosophy, you can actually cut to the chase a lot quicker, uh, especially when you can explain to people that science isn't neutral. It works on certain presuppositions, preconditions, and, and paradigms. So the questions that we're talking about in terms of philosophy and metaphysics are actually prior to the doing of any science. So science is not bad or not a problem, but the interpretation of the data and the various theories of science can never get you to explaining or justifying the metaphysics and the epistemology that undergirds science itself, you see. So that's the route that I would go. Mm -hmm. But uh, specifically, uh, what... How would I answer claims about science that directly like go against, uh, say, the teachings of the church or the Bible? With what I just said. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, by that I mean that the debate would kind of go back to questions of epistemology, justification, what it means to know a thing, what can science actually prove or demonstrate? Because a lot of times, again, the people that we're talking about, the people you're dealing with, they don't know anything about philosophy. They think that it's kind of like what uh, weird theater people do sitting around speculating because they can't do science. And they don't even recognize that science is actually based on all kinds of philosophical presuppositions. And that's why every time we have debates with atheists and uh, scientism, soy men, they absolutely crumble because they have no idea about these topics. So Master Blue, what's up? Look for the bare necessities. What's up, Baloo? Mother Nature's recipes. Forget about your worries and your Here strife. Again. What's up? Can you guys hear me at all? Yup. Right. Uh, just had a quick question. What's your uh, interpretation of the uh, book of Revelation 14, 14? Uh, let's see. Do you think, like, it's Jesus himself, or is it, like, one like a son of man and how do you define how do you see the sickle in his hand is it the reaper do you do you imagine him being the reaper uh or do you imagine him uh um yeah, so supporting ideas about it's the same son of man always in the bible as jesus yes and riding on a white cloud right all that's the same descriptions of ezekiel revelation one and two yes as jesus The sickle just signifies that he is prepared to exact the death penalty on the enemies here. Earlier it says in the text that he has the keys of death and Hades, so he has the right to decide life and death. Are you there? Baloo, are you there, bro? Hello? Uh... Lost you. Can't hear you, dude. Nope. This guy's ready to debate. He just says, nope. <laughs> What's up, nope? Yeah. Hey, so I hear you talking all about this tradition and stuff. And you know what the Holy Fathers say about uh, having a long beard? Uh, where's the beard at, bro? Talking about all the traditions and stuff. What are you talking about? Having a beard. Where's your beard you at, You said bro? I talk about all the traditions and stuff, bro. Yeah, like the tradition of having a beard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you think that that's what makes an orthodox person is canon law about having a beard? No, I just think it makes somebody super based in trad if they have a long beard. Yeah. At least that's what Did the you wanna... thing to think of my local parish. Like they'll, they'll come in with a big long beard and they'll have like a prayer rope and they're doing the Jesus prayer. And uh, they're just like, man, okay. yeah. like, I'm a holy elder. Right. Well, I'm not pious and I don't have a long beard, so I guess I'm not really orthodox. So I can I concede yeah. your point. Okay, fair. 
So what else? What other arguments you got for me? Nope. Uh, that's it, man. I just think you should grow the beard out. Uh huh. Why is that? I just think it would make you look. You know, Augustine himself, the father of the Western Church, says, you know, that that's that's what you call someone when they're a man. They they're they're a bearded man. Do, okay. Do you have a beard? I do. Okay. So you're more of a man than me. You got me. I'm a- well, you're conceding a lot, and this yeah. is crazy. This is my first time calling in. This is my first debate with DJ Dyer, and yeah. and I'm winning. Do you think it's you think this is a debate? Uh, no, I don't. It's definitely a joke, but okay. I do appreciate you conceding the points. Well, how did I concede the points if you know that I'm not being serious? Oh, so you're not being serious either. Okay, well, it's been fun, and uh, I'll let you go on the more serious topics. Yeah, time to block. Oh, man, he left before I could block him. Yeah, I don't have any patience for the piety signalers. Look for the bare necessities. The bare necessities, I'm talking about my bare face. My shaven face. Because I'm not a fool, man. Because I got a, bare, a baby bare face. Not a real man. Atheism United. Uh-oh. It's getting real now. Oh, damn. What am I going to do? What's up, dude? You there? Hello? Atheism United? Hello, Jay. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. I had a question. Um, this is a question uh, yesterday we were trying to explain to ourselves what the Holy Trinity was. And we we looked at a mind map um, of what the, pers- the, the three persons are, like the Holy Spirit. The mind, is, ma- mind uh, map? Yeah, uh, not a mind map, but like an illustration. What it's depicted as persons and as energies. Mm-hmm. And I had a question for you. Okay. So from from the Father to the Holy Spirit, there is procession, correct? The Father precedes the Spirit, correct? All right. From the Father to the Son, there is generation. Correct. So. So if you look at the procession, um, and there is eternal manifestation, what is the difference between procession and eternal manifestation? It's the movement of the persons in the Trinity versus the origin of the persons in the Trinity. So, uh, in other words, one uh, talks about the persons, The other one talks about the energies, right? No. The movement of the persons versus the origin. And by extension, the energies also have the same movement. That's true. That's what... So manifestation is referring to both the the persons and their energies, how they move in the triad. Mm -hmm. So the the difference is origin versus movement. Yeah. Can you elaborate more on the movement? Why is it important? Because it, God is revealed as a triad uh, generating and proceeding. Mm-hmm. Okay, I understand. So the the procession itself, it's a vehicle, correct? Uh, it's, uh, I don't, it, no, it's it's the way, it's the mode in which, well, the procession of the spirit is his hypostatic origin. I don't know what you mean by vehicle. Um, I will give you the Google definition of it. <laughs> I know what the word vehicle means. I'm just, I don't understand your usage of it. A vehicle meaning that, um, it's, so here it says, uh, relating to the person of the Trinity, a vehicle meaning that, um, it connects it is like an arrow which passes from something to something else. In that way, a vehicle. Uh, I mean, if that's the sense in which you mean it, then that's what I mean by movement. Okay, okay. All right. That was my question. Um, I, I watch your show, and I agree with a lot of the points you're making. 
it's a pleasure being on the show. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Now to the guy in the chat. Again, mods, if these people take over the chat, just boot them, dude. If the guy won't come on, there is no debate. If you mute me, you're stoning me. Okay, well, come on and, and debate. I don't know what you're talking about. Muting you is not stoning you. That's it's not the same thing. So, uh, where are you in the chat? So, if CW doesn't come on, just boot this person. Yeah, I'm aggravated. I'm inviting you on. So, you're saying that I'm scared of the truth and all this stuff. So, <laughs> I mean, we've, you've, be, you've been given the link many times. So, if you're not going to come on, uh, you're just going to get booted. So, last chance. Uh, if I don't see... What's his name? Christ wins. Thank you, Chase. Just boot that guy. Uh, Cause he's not going to come on. Let's see. NAD. What's up, Nad? Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not me. It's just what? Uh, I think you, I think you got the wrong guy, but anyways, I'll just ask. Uh, I, I, he's not in here. So I, I, I'm going oh, to okay. you next. I don't, that guy's not uh, yeah, going to show uh, up. Um, okay, so so I'm Orthodox. I just I don't have any like uh, hard or like questions. But well, today's about disagreement. Like, uh, so do you have an area of disagreement? Yeah, or? I, I I don't have a disagreement, but I I have like some some like argumental questions about uh, like it's not it's more about I need to, to okay. What's understand your question? More something. So it's uh, about um, so. The sch there's there's schismatics and there's also the like um, some churches or autocephalous churches that aren't uh, agreed upon in some patriarchates like uh, so, like some churches don't agree the OCA is a church some do agree it's a church because you got you got uh, questions so, of canon law like i don't do canon law yeah. that's not my that's yeah, not so, so go I, go ask the priest I'm or something about the, the sacraments like there, there's uh, no nobody thinks that the sacraments are not valid so anyway i'm not trying to be mean but i don't do canon law stuff yeah maddie ice what's up maddie ice so it's open forum you can request to speak today is for just people that disagree i don't do canon law questions and all that kind of stuff not being mean to you just just not my my domain people in the chat you're welcome to come on debate go ahead can you hear me yeah okay uh so i'm just full disclosure i'm a uh, roman catholic inquiring in the eastern orthodox but okay. uh anyway um my i guess my first point that i wanted to bring up is in terms of eastern orthodox Yeah. Lost you, dude. Don't have any audio. Sorry. Try coming out and coming back in. Cody's back. Go ahead. You got to unmute yourself. Are you going to unmute, Cody, or what? Oh, sorry, man. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, uh, um, you know, and then Je I was, Genesis 6, like, um, I don't know if the Catholics believe in, the, like, you know, the, the fallen angels came into the daughters of men, or if, like, about the sons of Seth theory. Uh, do, you, do you know any more about that? Thank you for taking my call again. Yeah, I, I know all about yeah, it. I I do. Well, I know all about it. What do you want to know? Yeah, I, I thought the Catholics believe in the sons of Seth theory more well, than like the fallen angels. I'm not a Roman Catholic, but Roman Catholics don't have a, a set theory on Genesis 6. There's no dogmatic statement on Genesis 6. Uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting, like mm -hmm. Genesis 6. Very, mm -hmm. like That's one of my the most fascinating parts in the Bible for me is just, you know, uh, what's in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. It's very like interesting. It is Thank interesting. You, Jay. Yes, sir. Appreciate it, dude. Abby, what's up, Abby?
You gotta unmute, Abby. Unmute. Unmute. Unmute, Abby. Unmute. Or don't. N Novus. Now, Novus always... All right, so I'm going to go to Ethan because it's for disagreeers tonight, guys. People that disagree. So it's not the FAQs. There's plenty of places people you can find the FAQs to. Go ahead, Ethan. Hey, can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm a Protestant, and I've been a Protestant pretty much my whole life. Uh, probably about a year ago, I would have been full-on solo scriptura, stuff like that. But um, late last year, I kind of started getting into the Orthodox stuff. I mm -hmm. watched some of like uh, Father Trenum stuff, some of your stuff. Right now, I'm in a class at the... Uh, university i go to it's a church of christ university i go to and it's a, interpreting the bible class mm -hmm. and we started talking about soul scriptura and one of the arguments that my professor brought up was that because soul script like because scripture is inspired because it's inspired that necessitates soul scriptura and i'd never really heard that argument before but how would you answer that well it necessitates that scripture is authoritative. It does not necessitate or prove that scripture is the only final authority. And it also doesn't tell us which books make up the scripture. Right. Right. And that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, and like, I understand how tradition works and how like Orthodox is the Orthodox conception of tradition and everything. But like, even in talking with my parents who are staunchly Protestant, mm -hmm. they will be like, well, okay, you can rely on oral tradition. That's fine. But you don't know what the oral tradition is because it's not written down. So how would you respond <laughs> well, to that? Uh, well, how first of all, sometimes, it, sometimes it, hold on. So crazy. first of all, sometimes the oral tradition is written down. So we do have a, a text in the Orthodox church that are written down. And those are things like liturgy. So first of all, some of the oral traditions are written um not everything has it's not but if the idea is that you can't know it unless it's written then that would actually undercut uh abraham noah i mean we don't have any record of any of that revelation being written so i guess they didn't know god because it was all oral right yeah and i think a lot of that comes from at least from what i see like i'm still protestant i'm kind of in a position where i can't become orthodox yet because mm -hmm. i still live with them yeah they probably you know this yeah i understand I did, but but uh but yeah, like from what I see, like at least for Church of Christ, because they're very exclusive. They're like, we don't yeah. believe in any other denominations. We're the one true church, right. which is kind of weird yeah. to me. But I think it comes from like they look at history. And I, this is what I've done too. So I'm still kind of struggling with this is like looking back at history and being like, well, it doesn't fit my conception of my interpretation of scripture. So yeah, so it's it a blackout, be, right? There's a blackout right. until Alexander Campbell and the Campbellites. Right. Um, then one last question. Mm -hmm. Um Another thing that my professor mentioned, and I, I wanted to challenge him on this because I've been reading that formulation of the Christian biblical canon that she recommended. Mm -hmm. um, but I brought up how well, like the canon wasn't decided until later centuries. Right. And that seems to be a historical fact. Right. And he was like, oh, well, no, it, it was like it was agreed upon. And that's an argument I hear a lot from Protestants. Uh, like, okay. By whom and where? I mean, just right. saying that it's not an argument, it's an assertion. Right. Like, but that's something I still hear is like, well, it was already like agreed upon but the council just confirmed it and again like well you said, I, they have to demonstrate that so right demonstrate there right. where from whom what's the proof of this that's just an assertion right um and then finally if i was to join an orthodox church kind of where i'm looking to live in the future there's um there's an orthodox church that's in the kind of like the russian jurisdiction um like rocor or whatever it's called mm -hmm. and then um then there's a um american orthodox church would you say that like what would you say which one should i join like i don't know what american orthodox church is oca yeah it's oca versus so, what like, what was the other options um the it was like the russian orthodox church outside of russia um i'm not sure if there's like a yeah i would I, say typically sure i would say typically uh probably definitely go for the real core church um let's see moving on to aiden what's up aiden so again tonight if you disagree it's for you Bring on your disagreements, your challenges, your arguments for Roman Catholicism, papacy, Protestantism, Islam, atheism, Hinduism, Muslimism, Jim Jonesism. You believe in Jim What's Jones? Hello? Yes, sir. Oh, finally. Jesus. I'm sorry for last time. 
basically, I just have a ton of questions after reading uh, some of Manly P. Hall's work. But it's not the, uh, okay. But what is the argument or what? Uh, basically, Christianity is like super dogmatic against other religions, and I don't think it takes it into account what they're really trying to teach. I learned that um, in one of in the secret teachings of all ages, uh, they say that the polytheistic religions like paganism are actually meant to express elementals of the one God. So it is monotheism, essentially. Well, that's called henotheism. That's not monotheism. Hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't uh, deeply research all of it, but if you have multiple elements representing one God, as you do like angels working for the same God, isn't that essentially the same? No, that's why it's called henotheism and not monotheism. Hmm. Okay. Also, why, why, why would you think Manly P. Hall is a, a a viable source on this? Why Why would you think that he's who we would go to? Uh, basically, I I looked into how certain sacred teachings were taken and, and hidden, like like in the Masonic lodges and stuff. He is yeah, but, a high up Mason. Yeah, but you know that Masons lie, right? You know that's in morals and dogma, right? People lie. Okay, but I'm specifically talking about Masonic teaching that they oh. delude the public and the lower ranks. Do you think that's what Manly P. Hall was doing? Absolutely. If you read, Every, if if you read, read Secret Destiny of America, it's a lot of bullshit. It's made up nonsense. It's gibberish. Secret Destiny. Okay, but there were some things that caught my eye. He said that Jesus said that he okay. told his followers to be wise as serpents and that serpents were just a symbol of knowledge which i have seen many people agree with and that the serpent giving the fruit of knowledge to adam yeah, this or, is, a mean, word, is a word concept fallacy do you know what that is uh i heard you guys uh are you talking to basically make mistranslation no okay what do you mean so the word serpent in that context there's a trait that that snakes have which is to be cunning so jesus is saying not to be stupid and foolish, but to have wisdom and to have some cunning to operate in this world. He's not telling you to be like the fallen angel in Genesis. That's even worse than being wise, to be cunning? Telling your followers to be cunning? Well, like there's, nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong with being wise and cunning in the way that you deal in this world. That's what I think. I think that we have all of these symbols that we perverted and turned into like some crazy let's just cut to, let's just cut to the chase let's just cut to the chase freemasonry is bullshit so you're just arguing a bunch of bullshit how do i know how is it bullshit though because what exactly. it teaches is lies and deception and it doesn't even have a co coherent and ultimately but, it's, a, it's atheistic but it's really not though because it, it teaches you how to center yourself and and connect yourself what does that even mean divine, what, what does that even mean what's the divine basically god i mean Basically, because the, the, there's a million different ideas about what that is. Who, what's the God in Masonry? Ultimately, it ends I would up. Assume, it ends I would up be, assume something close to. The ultimately, it ends one. up being worshiping yourself. So it's just a stupid delusion, and that's why they tell is you. It though? Yeah, that's why they tell the that, seven, the seven that, sins. Listen to me. That's why to the, in Morals and Dogma, which is the Bible of Freemasonry, it says to delude and deceive. It is. It says to delude and deceive the lower ranks. So how do you how do you know you're not being deluded and deceived? I just believe that Manly Hall himself wasn't out to cause harm in the way that someone like Aleister Crowley was, like talking about. I'm well, a that's beast, just. I'm a oh. You don't think people can be one side of the coin, like uh, as opposed to everyone is evil. Everyone in Freemasonry is evil. The teachings of Freemason, I don't care what Manly P. Hall's personal life was. Uh, I'm saying the teachings of the, the philosophy and the, the teachings of Masonry are objectively false and easy to refute. Mm, I mean, is, anyone could say that about anything, though. If people no, I'm ready, to, I'm, ready to I'm, I'm ready to I'm ready to demonstrate a sky daddy that reincarnated as a as a, as a, as a man, but he's also the the. The spirit, the mother, so, it's like... So there you don't even know what Christian theology teaches. So showing that you're confused. So you have no idea what we even believe. So 
again, I get into it a lot. I mean, the Trinity. You have no stuff, idea what I, you're talking about. Here's the thing. I don't discredit any of that. I think that every religion has some piece okay. that is true. Left. That so let's talk about that. Everyone. Okay. How do you know that that proposition right there is true? Because, and here's the thing, there's actually starting to be physical evidence of these giant megaliths that no one knew how it was okay. built. How does megaliths giant tell you that that proposition is true? You don't even understand Every what I'm asking divine you. City that had any you don't even know what I'm talking about. No clue what I'm talking what do you mean? about. The proposition that there's truth in all the religions. I said, how do you know that proposition is true? Let's go to that. Let's start with that's let your me, start. Let me explain though. Let that's me explain my, though. Let me explain though. Let me explain Do you though. understand that your explain? answers, your answers. Can I explain? No, because your answers are not Bro, explaining how that proposition is true. You're not letting me get to it, though. Because it's not an answer. There are ancient, sophisticated pyramids on every That doesn't continent, answer the... No you don't even understand the argument. And the old... What? I'm going to boot you until you demonstrate to me that you understand the argument I'm making. Okay. You made a claim that all the world religions have truth in them. That's your That's your starting point, right? I want to know how you, as an individual, know that that is true. When you start going to the ancient world religions, that's your interpretation of the ancient world religion. That doesn't tell me that that proposition is true. I want to know how it's you know the same that. Thing language. It's all our interpretations. All of our interpretations. The, it's not the, all, the main. That's not true. That's false. Language. It is not all of our interpretations. The, all of the human beings do not interpret that to be true. So that's well, not that a thing that you can appeal basically to. Basically, a census thing. Like many a humans census. believe this is right. Many so. humans believe this is wrong. Yeah, so that is not so that's a fallacy. No that's a fallacy. How? Because it doesn't I mean, you could watch the laws in America, a Christian country change overnight. I mean, one one century You don't do you don't even know what we're talking about. You literally you're just like, talking. You're just talking. Do you know what I'm you don't even understand what I'm asking for? I want epistemic justification for the claim. Do you know what that means? I'm not a big word guy, bro. Yeah. I'm just so, I'm just these aren't good arguments. It's not about the words. It's about bad arguments. Do you understand that? I feel like you're blocking it out a little bit, bro. I mean, there's 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 evidence of ancient, sophisticated technology all around the world. No one knows who did it. None of that. Even if that's true, you don't understand. Sky gods coming down. You don't understand. Even if that's true, it doesn't prove the first proposition. How does? But you can you can look at the evidence. It's like an eighty-ton stone lifted into a, a, a complex. You don't even understand the like, argument. Why did they do this? And and those religions are going all the way back to Thoth, the Atlantean priest king, all of that stuff. Dude, this is all gibberish, all and it, it doesn't Atlantis. prove they're talking about solar worship <laughs> through Christianity, which is a pagan thing. It's a pagan thing. And you guys, you're like, oh, where's all the pagan? Where Dude, are all the pagan you, roots? Where did it you're go? not even, guys, you're not even, Church, you're not even about level one of understanding what the argument even is. You, you have no clue what you're talking about. And so I ask you basic questions, and you fly off into these claims about megaliths that has nothing to do with justifying no claim the claim. Megaliths. It's right there on the planet. It's right there it. on the planet. Do you, do you understand right that there. that's? You do you understand go, okay, that that is really a bunch of Jewish people with ropes? dragging things around you, in these do you understand that that's not an you don't even under, what do you think an argument is do you think it's just spouting out megalith stuff that's an argument for do you understand that that doesn't justify the claim no but i'm going back to these teachings that go that that none of that you're not address okay. it's not an argument do you not understand it's a fallacy all the things that you're saying in logic are fallacious moves what do you mean exactly the, so if you're going to make these arguments you need to learn those things first what do okay, i mean let me make you don't even know. Do you know? I have more written down on my paper. Do you want to go through You have things stuff? written down. Dude, you, if you don't know what a fallacy is, what's on your paper is not going to do anything for you. You're it. like a vocab guy. What are you doing? It's like I'm giving you an actual a vocab guy. thought and you're going, you don't know this word. You're an idiot. That's not That's not a debate either. <laughs> you're an epithetical, epilogical fallacy. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, I have all these questions. You're just Why making an idiot of yourself, you man. I'm sorry, you're making an idiot of yourself. Why did Jesus tell you to love your slave? Epithetical. That's not even a, you're making. That's not even a word. Epithetical fallacies. No, that's what I'm. 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 Imp I'm making an impression of you talking about. Yeah, but you're, blah, you're just blah, making blah, yourself blah. look you silly. That? You're making yourself no, look I'm silly. I'm giving you some real shit. But I, I, I listen can you, to. Can you tell me what a fallacy you, is? You say like the, the, the teaching of duality. Not, can you not tell me valid? what a fallacy is? Because you don't know the basics of philosophy, and that if you're going to make arguments, the basics of philosophy. You need to I'm know these things. You, 
I'm giving you my stance, and you're going, you don't know this vocab. How do you know It's not vocab? the vocab. You don't know the vocab or what the you vocab means. You read books. You've read like a million books. I'm trying to get some knowledge, and you're going, you don't know this word? What the hell, bro? You're trying to make I'm an argument. You're, you're too dumb to even know what we're talking about. You're trying to make an yeah, argument. I, this is the thing. You Christians, oh, you guys are so dumb. You guys are so dumb. Thousands of religions before you guys, before you guys got all So you're spurging out. Injury. Do you and know? Do you know what a fallacy is? You can't even tell me what a fallacy is. What is it? Bro, I'm not a book nerd. I haven't even. Ooh, yeah, so you just made a complete. This is so. This is what. This is what masonry gets you. This is what masonry gets you. Is this? Oh, because they. It's a complete goofus. Good grief. Oh my gosh. So you notice how people just like spurg out. They keep, you, you keep asking them the same questions. He doesn't even understand what a non sequitur is. And then he gets his feelings hurt because he thinks I'm using bad, big words to like insult him or something. If you're going to make arguments, you have to abide by the rules of argumentation. Those aren't arbitrary. They're not fancy words that people just made up to sound smart. It's just like playing chess. There's rules to chess. So likewise, in argumentation... There's rules to argumentation. And he doesn't even know that. He doesn't even know what a fallacy is. Just complete nonsense. What's up, uh, Day Gyre? Uh, hello? Mm-hmm. Um, I just had a question about the um, about churches in my area. Orthodox okay, that's, churches. That's not the topic today, man. But what? You, what, uh, what? Um, I got a question. And it's an argumentative question. Uh huh. What's up? Yeah. What is it? And he leaves. So. So we see by this example that Freemasonry and the philosophy of Freemasonry and reading Manly P. Hall, who, by the way, is a complete goofus. If you read, if you listen to his lectures on astrology, he ends the whole lecture course by saying that, by the way, the purpose of this whole lecture course is to get you to believe in socialism in the United Nations. So. So we're opening up to people who disagree. If you have an argument. And an argument is not arguing. It's not machine gunning out idiocy about megalithic marvels, which have nothing to do with whether the proposition that you started your argument with is true. See, maybe maybe there are aliens and megalithic marvels and all this stuff, but that doesn't mean that the first proposition that all the world religions have truth in them. I just want to know how you know that that's true. Maybe it is true. How do you know it's true? Well, megalithic marvels, that doesn't prove that proposition. I mean, it's like, Let's take a let's take an epistemology 101 class. Quit bitching about big words. I mean, come on, dude. You're an adu- if you want to be an adult and be treated like an adult, don't come bitching about me using big words. Learn the big words. It's ridiculous. So we got three people who've already been on asking questions, and I'm asking I'm looking for people who disagree. So you guys just want to come on. But who are the people who disagree? So you, I mean, you, you, people that spurg out, like you can't even walk them through an argument. They just, they just, they're like, just, you know, there's like, I don't know, a blender. They're like, they're like Taz, right? Like, like spinning in a circle, like Taz, you know, the freaking Hanna Barbera, whatever character. What's up, Novus? Yeah, I just had a question about that. Uh canonical jurisdictions because that's not what we're talking about tonight we're not i'm not trying to be mean to you the topic is not canons and jurisdictions i've already said that like 20 times it will be a challenge to orthodoxy (sighs) so they belong to the world council of churches they don't all belong to the world council of churches it's not true uh, there's multiple jurisdictions that don't so what are you talking about do the big five the russians do right um, I don't remember exactly which. I don't think Rocor does. There might be some jurisdictions that do, but what? Well, the Russians are the Russians are listed, and and so are like the top five of them are. So my question is for this: We in Orthodoxy go around defending Orthodoxy against all these type of what we call heresies, which they are. But we belong to an organization that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion, which the Georgian Church left because they were promoting homosexuality and women priests about 30 years ago 
So how do we reconcile? Yeah, I don't. I don't think anybody that? should be a member of that. But membership probably means that they go and they present papers at conferences. It's like, it's like the IOTA conference that uh, FDA goes to. Like membership in that does not mean that FDA supports everything that IOTA uh, does. But I agree that there's not there's not really any point in being involved in that. But they also contribute financially to it, which is the issue. Which is what? Which is the issue because they're supporting it. It's following a, a United Nations Agenda 2030. And well, it, hold on. Be, how do you know that? How do you know that the Russian Church gives money to the World Council of Churches? Because when you look up who supports the World Council of well, Churches, support it, the Church, it's the members of the Council. That how do you know that them. that means that there's monetary donations? I mean, if there is, I disagree with it. But does well, that, that? Well, that's what I looked up financially. Who supports it? And that's what at least it said. It's stating that I should say. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say that that's not a good idea. All right. All right, that's all I had. Appreciate it. Uh-huh. Now, I'm curious, Novus, because a lot of your posts talk about Coptic Christianity. No, I was arguing with a Coptic recently, an okay. Oriental. Okay. Well, hey, dude, if you, you know, if you don't like what we talk about over here, it's fine. Uh, pink. Sherpa? It's probably because I don't have a beard. Because really the only way to be orthodox is like how long your beard is. Like the length of the beard is literally like the test of the orthodoxy. Pink Sherpa, what's up? Hey, how you? <laughs> you're, a, you're a character. Oh, so, really? Yeah, no, you are. You're, you're cracking me up. Um... All right, so I have a question. Um, it, it's interesting because, like, I literally just, I went to, like, I'm Roman Catholic, and I went to, like, a catechism class after Mass today um, while my kid was at religious ed. And and we actually were going over this section of the catechism uh, regarding ordination and then... Um, you know, when a priest does something heinous, you know, their capability of still... Um, performing like you know the substantiation and all that uh -huh. stuff. So, but I that's not what I wanted to ask you. I had a question that was actually something I was going to ask in my class today, but I realize it pertains not only to Roman Catholicism but also possibly um, Orthodox Christianity, and that is like. Okay, so this is hard for me to articulate, but recently I was reading through, um, and I don't remember which part of the Bible it's in, but it's when um, Jesus rebukes the rabbis in the temple. That's uh -huh. like a pretty big event, right? Um, and chastises them for mm -hmm. a, mil a million things. But when I read that, I hear um, a message that is pretty much eternal that... Um, in all of your rituals, um, you can still be completely defunct. And, and that um, at that point in history, I won't speak about it today, but at that point in history, um, they had just lost all meaning behind um, all of the rituals that they were performing. Um, and, you know... It, yeah, I mean, many of the prophets say this. Isaiah says this. Jeremiah says this. You approach me with, uh, you know... So uh, my, hard question, my question is then, and I was going to pose this in, in my, in the class today, but, um, it's, I, we didn't get to it. We got stuck on another topic, mm -hmm. but is, you know, how do we walk that line? Because I feel like sometimes we lose perspective when we do these kind of debates, which I, I believe, believe me, I believe in our rights. I, 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 
I sense that you have some hostility to the, the Catholic Church. I personally would like to see us reunified um, at some point in history. <laughs> I mean, I will, probably won't live to see that day, but um, I would like to see, you know, the churches uh, unified again. So I don't, I don't have any hostilities at all towards Eastern Orthodox, any of the Eastern Rite churches. Okay, but the all. problem is that the reunification requires us to join into a spiritual communion with Pope Francis and the rest of the goblins in Rome, and that's the problem. Okay, well, you you don't need to insult me. <laughs> how uh, how was I insulting you by <laughs> saying the goblins in Rome? Because you're calling the people that I I care about very much. You're calling them goblins, and whether or not you yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, have you read Fiducia I, Supplicants? I mean, they're promoting uh, we Skittles. Haven't even, you haven't even answered my question, and and see, this is this. I mean, is you're, you're, I, I'm not mad at you. I'm just asking you a question, bro. If you if you want to, you know, keep it the you know above board. The, high look, high I'm not mad at you. I'm just I'm asking you. Look, you're the one. Hey, look, I'm not mad. I'm just asking you a question about. But you just the, you're just curtailed insults at me. I mean, I was going to ask you an honest you, question. The question: I, Are you so a goblin in Rome? You, you're not. You're not a cardinal. That's where you lose your credibility. Is because you can't just come and have yeah. like a mm -hmm. interreligious dialogue. Mm -hmm. it, it boils down to a dispute over but rituals. You took personal. It's not a dispute over rituals. You took personal. the question. Why don't though, you? Why don't you calm I'm down? Kidding. You're you're the one that's upset. You're okay. you're yapping. <laughs> Listen, calm down for a second. Just chill. No, I know you want to control your show, but you do need to let me speak. If if I mean, that's I'm explaining perfect. something. I'm explaining something to you. I'm not stopping okay, you from you speaking. You go ahead and try and explain something to me. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not stopping you from speaking. I'm explaining that if I criticize the goblins in Rome, that's not. You shouldn't take that personal. I'm talking about corrupt people in Rome. That's not you personally. Okay, but that doesn't answer my question. And you're kind of begging the question when you curtail insults instead of trying to have an interrelation. That's called. That's called okay. rhetoric. Are you familiar with rhetoric? It's where you joke in the midst of making an argument. <laughs> One, I'm a lawyer, and two, I majored in philosophy, and I went to Catholic schools for 16 years, and I have a law degree, so I really know what. Well, you can is. tell your right. But so, so joking is part of rhetoric. If you're mature enough, I would like to hear your your perspective on that very narrowly ta tailored question, which you don't want to address. I'm happy to address any of your arguments, and I do and it all the time, every day. First of all. That religious leader. Listen, I know that you're used to spouting out, but this is not your show. So chill out. Chill out for a second. Just stop yapping for a second, and I'm happy to answer your question. I won't because I'm trying to restate my question that I would like you to answer. And in all, in Can I point out that there's a, a thing I disagree with? I disagree with the way you worded it that it's a disagreement of rituals. It's not a disagreement of rituals. It's a disagreement of the theology. That's the first point. So it's not just rituals. Okay, keep talking. <laughs> you're, it sounds like you're on the right track. You're actually trying to answer the question now. Yeah, I've always been answering the question, but I like to make jokes when I answer the question because that's part of rhetoric. You should know that. You're a lawyer. You have degrees, right? I'm sorry, are you, are you trying to curtail insults again? You're a lawyer. You started touting your credentials. You said you know rhetoric. Doesn't rhetoric include jokes and jabs? I'm supposed to be a theologian. I mean, you should... And how to be respectful in a debate. Right? I know I don't claim to be a theologian. I'm a, I've debated the top people in the world. So you want to talk about credentials? I'm one of the top <laughs> debaters out there. Okay, bro. I mean, I, have I, I, is that is that true or false? You're a real funny character. You're a character. Is it true or false? Do you are you aware of that? I'm not answering your questions. I'm asking you the question. So go on and talk about it. I mean, it's a legitimate question. I'm interested so, in hearing your minus the insults again if you can do that if you're mature enough if you can let so go of your you can't Roman Catholic Church for so if I make a joke about right. listen if you said that my patriarch was a corrupt goblin I wouldn't take that personally I would agree with you do you see the difference there that you took personal something that wasn't about you I'm not answering your questions I'd like you to answer mine I mean I think in your mind you think this is a law court it's not it's a open forum discussion so what's your question What's your question? What's your question? 
<laughs> Are you going to unmute and ask your question? You've complained about me making a joke. What's your question? So you're not going to state your question. Hello, you're still here. I'm mute. What's your question? This is how, this is I'm I'm enjoying this. This is actually fun. Pink Sherpa, are you there? What is your question? So the point is that the papacy pr promotes today Skittles topics, which is a complete contradiction to previous papal teaching. So that's why I, ha I have such a disdain for the papacy is that I think it's an organized crime institution. And you took personal something that wasn't personally about you. Are you going to come back on or are you just going to sit here muted? All right, we're going to go on, move on from that. Seven, seven, seven. Unmute. Hi. Um, I got a minute to say something quick. Do you have an argument that you like to present about the topics listed? Uh, yeah, I was going to bring a, a different kind of idea to the, it's all related. So um, the Bible says that 666 is the number of a man. And uh, we have six protons, six neutrons, six electrons in our carbon atoms, in our melanin and DNA. It looks like six. has nothing to do with any of that. No. But um, sixes, they look like sevens in Hebrew and in yeah, Arabic right. and like ancient yeah. languages. And like that We're letter done. F is six letter, but it looks like a seven backwards. And then yeah. Jesus. This seven is uh, Jesus. schizo stuff. No. Goodbye. Roy R., what's up? I am not a theologian. I list myself as a comedian. And I'm happy to, I'm happy to transition. I'm going to transition into being today's stand-up. Okay. There's a lot of people out there trying to say that they is a religious leader. That's not me, okay? I am now officially calling myself a comedian. Do y'all hear that? I am the king of comedy. And Tristan Haggard and all of these players out here, all of these haters, they are nothing to me, okay? You heard it here first. 2024 is the year that truth comes to light. Royar, what's up? That's my cat Williams, by the way. That's cat Williams. That's called a joke for those that don't understand. Yeah. Uh, in terms of open God debate, you mean like, like debating on God, right? Yeah. Correct. Yes, sir. Correct. Yes, sir. Why? Are you there? Hello. Did you want to make an argument about the God or whatever, dude? We lost him. Try to come back in if you want to. Overlooked pictures. It's getting wild tonight. It's wild. It's, it's a wild Gnostic night. Go ahead. You got to unmute, dude. I'm about to just start getting ridiculous or ridiculous. I'm about to start breaking out the box wine, the Franzia. I'm about to start being a wine mom for y'all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fill up a big goblet full of Franzia wine mom wine. And I'm going to bust out Virginia Slims in between each of these fingers. And I'm going to puff them all until they burn down to my fingers. Overlook picks. Do you want to? Are you? You're, come on, dude. Unmute. Oh, I was waiting for a, a, a invite. I was enjoying your um, your, your um, bit there. But um, thank you, Mr. Dyer. Um, I'm not sure how serious. I've just dropped in. Not sure how serious the debate is really going. But I, I did want to try and serious things up a little bit. Um, when it comes to the the thought process of um, what does say, what does bracket into the type who believes and the type who does not believe for whatever reason. When it comes to the, the question of um, revelation through a world that's created um, and the role of faith, when, when it comes to, to an atheist, this is used an atheist, the, the extreme example, not an agnostic, but someone who actively disbelieves, 
when it comes to that sort of um, mind mindset or thinking, um, if if we posit the idea of a creator who, for whatever reason, requires something more than just mere observation, something that a machine could do, you know, to register its environment, this kind of thing. This idea of having faith beyond appearances seems to be seems to be critical. When it comes to an atheist way of thinking, if if they were to come up with um, a cosmology where there is a creator who, in some sense, is obvious, but is also hidden, there is some active step, some leap of faith, literally required, to cross that barrier. Um, what what other way uh, can we imagine such a such a sort of a, a cosmology occurring? That there seems to be, you know, if we are free free willed agents who in some way resemble something divine, but not entirely. You know, we have we have certain capacities, but we also have certain limits. Um, from an atheist mindset, what other game could be played by a creator who doesn't want servile, mechanistic, necessarily believing sub-agents? I don't know if this, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure this thought has occurred to you before, but I, I, it just occurred to me, you know, how would one, how would one as an atheist begin to presume um, such a world, you know, that there is some sort of hidden order that is, in a sense, waiting to be discovered, and that is part of perhaps the game. Does that make sense? I, I feel I've covered a lot of a lot of angles simultaneously, which is a bit confusing. I realize. Um, yeah, I'm not. I didn't follow you there. I just. Uh, I mean, if you're asking what the logical philosophical argument is as to why I would believe in God, it's the transcendental argument. So this is like a medieval sense of the the, the original. Is this a um, is this Thomas or is it um, no? Who, who, no, this would a Descartes or type thing. No, who, who, are we, who are you referring to when you when you mean that specifically? Um, I mean, there have been p plenty of people making transcendental arguments from, you know, ancient philosophers like uh, Aristotle to Immanuel Kant. But uh, the specific transcendental argument for God is people like uh, Bonson, Van Til, and some people in the Orthodox world. I'm not familiar with them. Is it possible to quickly nutshell that just for, for me in the room? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the idea is that only the the god that we we argue for the specific uh, type of deity that is triune and creates the world with structure uh and that metaphysical structure which underlies reality is itself sort of the grounding and the foundation for the possibility of knowledge so transcendental categories are held together function together interrelate with one another because they're grounded ultimately in the patterns and structures in the divine mind. So an omniscient God and the created order with the regularity that he puts into it is the basis for how we can have knowledge, ethics, and metaphysics at all. Okay, so the, the fact that the world that we encounter is structured and that we are structured um, not only implies but necessitates no. an order. Necessi no. no, Okay. I didn't make the teleological argument. I made the transcendental argument. I said that the preconditions of knowledge, all of those that presuppose some kind of order, some kind of mind, some kind of personal God to give us intentionality, to give us all of the ca the categories is only su f fulfilled and justified in the uh, Christian conception of God. Well, thank you very much. I've got, uh, I've got some new people to look up. You mentioned a thinker, I think an ancient thinker that I hadn't come across before about half a minute ago. Could you... Do you recall who you mentioned? It wasn't it wasn't Thomas, and it wasn't uh, Aristotle. Uh, besides Aristotle, no, you mentioned someone else that sounded like a German name. But... I said Kant makes transcendental arguments. Oh, before that, but um, I'll, I'll I'll go check out um, some online resources. Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, I have uh, many many talks. Uh, good questions there. Appreciate that. Many talks on transcendental argument for God. So you could also look to those where I reference a lot of the people and a lot of the uh, the literature and whatnot. Uh, let's see, Royar, did you? You were here, and then I lost you. You fell out. Hello? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Sorry, it, uh, it cut out last time. So, um, in terms of the Trinity, uh, we're open to debate that, I assume, yeah? Sure, if you want to. Okay, so is that is that pure monotheism? Well, monotheism is a late term, uh, and theism in the Christian tradition refers to the person of the Father, and by extension, the Son and the Spirit. Okay, so that would mean, that would make the Son God also, correct, or no? Correct, because God is a generic term that can pick out different things. 
Okay, then G- Jesus. Jesus. It, it would be correct to say that you think Jesus is God, right? Yeah. Okay. And by God, we're in understanding that God is all powerful and all the characteristics that God would be, right? Right. The word God picks out different things. It doesn't have one reference. Yeah, I, I'm aware. I'm aware. Well, like, well, you could stop me if I were like, God is all knowing. God is all powerful. God's not li- lacking in anything. Correct? Like, we can agree on that? Well, yeah, but God can refer to different things. So it depends on. What do you mean by that? The word God picks out yeah. different things. It doesn't have one reference. Like what does, I mean like God, like the creator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and God, we believe, can pick out the divine person, the divine nature, and the divine energies. It can also pick out an angel and a demon, and a human. So God doesn't so have a single So an angel reference. can be God, and a demon can be God. <sighs> the word God has different yeah. reference. That does not mean that I'm it not always... I'm talking about oh the God. word. I mean the being I'm talking God. about... I know. But I'm saying that okay. the word picks out different things even in God. It, like it can mean different things. Yes, I understand that. Even I, that, in I, God, it picks out different things. Person, nature, essence, and operation. Uh, uh, sure. Okay. So, God... All powerful, all knowing, right? We can agree on that, like very basic thing, unless I'm wrong. Yeah, but God can reference the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and Father, Son, and Spirit are all three all knowing. Okay, so they're all, all three of them are all knowing. Correct. Okay, then out of curiosity, why didn't Jesus know the hour? Yeah, if you read letter 235 and 6 of Basil, he explains why that, that's a misinterpretation of the text. It's a use of rhetoric. Because elsewhere, um, Jesus says, none is good but God. What was that verse number? Uh, okay. I'll look at it real quick. Letter 236 of Basil. I'm just saying that that's where he gives the explanation to this old Arian argument that Jesus didn't have omniscience. Because you understand there's other passages that talk about Jesus having omniscience, right? So it's a use of rhetoric, like when Jesus says, there's no one good. letter 236? I'm sorry. Of Basil. It's either 235 or 236. And I'm explaining. What's the chapter part called? Saint Basil, letter 235, 236. He gives an explanation, it's right around in there, of why and how we show that it can't mean that Jesus lacks knowledge. And Wait, the, is this not in the Bible? Letter 236 of Saint Basil is a theological writing about what I'm talking I'm just referencing the, the essay that talks about what I'm talking about. And it gives okay. a lot of the explanations that I'm giving you, namely that the words when it says that he doesn't know, are rhetoric, because in other places you have similar uses of that rhetoric, like there's no one good but the Father. Does that literally mean that nobody is good? Because other passages say that the Son is also good and the Spirit is also good. So it's a simple use of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Uh, In a sense, but ultimately, no, the Word of God is a person. It's a divine person identified with the second person of the Godhead in John 1. So the Bible is not the Word of God. Okay. Did you you didn't so you didn't hear what I said? I just answered oh, your no, question. I did. I'm just. It's a yes or no question. No, it's, it's not. not like That's maybe. a false dichotomy. You said, you it's said a fallacy. in between. That's very, I didn't like, say. I didn't say in God, between. God's word or isn't. I mean, I'm, it, this is a very simple question. That's a fault. No, it's called a fallacy of either or. Uh, this you know, is about. God. Do you know what the fallacy of either or is? Yes, it's what? either an apple or an orange. Right. And so, you're saying it's a little bit in between. No, I didn't say, I never used the word in between. Don't put words in my mouth. What I said was, I didn't say in between. You're putting words okay. in my mouth. I'm your, like, synonyms, man. Go ahead, go ahead, explain synonyms. that. Synonyms. No, I said very clearly that there's a sense in which the written texts are the word of God. And then I said that ultimately that's not correct, though, because the word of God is a divine person, the second person of the Godhead identified in John 1. being so you don't understand <laughs> basic terms so you're giggling all right you're done no, I'm not. I'm like, you are giggling right, right, right. Yeah, you don't you have no clue what you're from my perspective you don't know what you're talking right. about so again it's just people with no education no knowledge they can't do basic grammar when we talk about a word concept fallacy you see that you see the silliness of this so words 
have different reference. You're not coming back on, dude. We're done. <laughs> Goodbye. A word can have two different reference. This is called hermeneutics, right? This is how we interpret, this is science of interpreting a text. And every heresy, as St. Basil says, trades on ambiguity and heretics thinking that words have one meaning. Not every heresy is based on that, but it's a characteristic of many errors and heresies to think that a word only has one meaning. And people get tripped up on Jesus using a figure of speech. Jesus uses figures of speech all the time, right? Like cut your hand off if it makes you sin. Dude, Jesus trying to tell me to self-harm, dude. It's called rhetoric. We utilize, excuse me, it's called a uh, uh, figure of speech. We utilize hyperbole in literature all the time. Okay. When you go to read Dostoevsky, when you go to read Shakespeare, okay, if you're an educated person, not a random goober who doesn't know anything about how to read, you don't automatically take every text literally. That's why it takes time to learn texts and how to interpret them, to learn exegesis, to learn hermeneutics. And one thing you learn is that you don't go to a passage or a text, isolate that text and think that that's the one text by which all the other texts are interpreted. Every Arian, every Arian heretic does this. Jesus lacks knowledge, though. It says right there that these Jesus lacks knowledge, though. Don't use the big words on me, dude. It's a use of rhetoric, exaggeration, hyperbole. Just like when he says, cut your hand off if it causes you to sin. He's not literally telling you to cut your hand off. It's hyperbole. Just like when he says, there's none good but God. This is a grammatical thing. It's a term, it's a usage in literature. Do people not know that hyperbole metaphor is used in literature? Okay, so this, I'll bring you back on if you'll slow down. If you spurg out and spit out a bunch of megaliths, which doesn't back up the claim, then I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bring you back on. Can you calm down and have a conversation? Go ahead, Aiden. Are you there? You're unmuted, Aiden. Make your Masonic argument. What's up? Can't hear you, dude. Don't hear anything. So I don't know what what's up. You want to try again? Are you there? Aiden? Okay. You're, I don't hear anything, dude. So I don't know what's going on. Pope Francis is calling in. What's up, Pope Francis? Tonight, it's if you disagree... You're welcome to come on. Remember that disagreeing means that you're going to present an argument. You're going to present a case. You can question me. You can interrogate me. I don't mind. But we're going to learn to debate. So part of what we do in these exercises, in these live streams, is we're not just learning the facts and all that. That's good. We're also learning to debate, hopefully. And so un sometimes that requires pointing out that like, you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm going to keep pulling you back to the point so that you learn what we're trying to say and what real argumentation is. There's rules to debate. It doesn't mean you just spout out whatever you want. That's not what an argument is. There are laws to thought and critical thinking. That's what we're trying to elucidate here. And Pope Francis is going to help us do that. What's up, Pope Francis? You got to unmute, man. Uh, hello. Hello. What's up, Your uh, Holiness? How you doing? <laughs> What's happening in Rome tonight? Is all, did the did the uh, Skittles orgies? Did they just complete? Complete? Are they done? Is it over now? Well, uh, I actually do have something to say. Um, <clears throat> it 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 is an opinion um, and an argument at the same time, and neither of them. So I'm just going to share it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> go ahead, go. And it'll take a moment. Okay. So momentarily, I will be donating $5 to Jade Byer. There are 700 viewers here. I'm talking to you all. If you all, that is 
you all donated a few dollars would make a real difference. Five dollars is equivalent to the price of a hot and ready pizza. I encourage all of you to take a small step in good faith to promote this high level, no bullshit dialogue facility. I don't know what all that was about. Uh, John Johan Sig, what's up? I'm ha- I'm having fun, or I wouldn't keep doing this. this. Is tonight has been wild. I mean, it's like <laughs> Johan. Hey there, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it going? Um, so I believe in God, but I wanted to um just mention a uh, passing remark of Nietzsche's that like. He, in the will to power, he says somewhere, I was hesitant to call in because I don't have my books, but in the will to power, he says that, um, like, Paul was basically just experiencing epilepsy, and uh, if you uh, sort of take this remark and dovetail it with some remarks of uh, Robert Sapolsky's about, like, the resemblance between, uh, 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 sorry, Hindu cleaning rituals and also cleaning rituals in Judaism, and he has many other examples, and they uh, really uh, resemble... OCD behavior. So, like the argument, like I said, I happen to believe in so, God. But this, mo- this modern is, modern Judaism, yeah. a la rabbinical Judaism, is not the same thing as what was going on at the time of Christ. That's why Christ rebukes that stuff, and Paul left Judaism. So, how does this relate to Paul being a OCD? No, person? the argument is more so that all this phenomena is is a just a mental it's just mental stuff it's just mental illness it's something that's result the result of uh uh human beings on the spectrum of mental illness like th- that's the argument uh, like this, these remarks of nietzsche's in uh and also bring that together with these remarks of robert sapolsky's i don't want to give a long speech okay. and explain the whole thing you know? okay so christianity and religion is mental illness okay is that but wh- how is it interesting that nietzsche ended up dying of uh, going insane mentally ill but yeah, I know, man. Yeah, I started Voltaire. I know. Right. So, but what? But how does that? That's a that's a claim. How did? How does that demonstrate the claim to be the case? Well, um, I'll tell you this, Tag. Perhaps this is just a criticism of Tag. Um, like I said, I respect the argument. I'm not necessarily arguing against it, but it does sort of lack a volitional push into belief because, like, actual belief. Because at, at the at the core, it does seem like you're saying God exists because we are able to have this debate right now. But the fact that we are able to have this debate right now is so plainly, dully real and obvious there, there's an immense gulf between the psychic image of belief in god which is supposed to be an impressive something or other and the plain dull realization that we're just having a debate and uh, well, that's I mean, you, you're exists. using a lot of rhetoric and prose to call it plain and dull but the question is actually what's the logical and metaphysical structure that makes language and meaning possible so your subjective ideas <laughs> of re- large question um <laughs> Well, I mean, that's okay, go the, ahead. Sorry. well, that's what tag is. So that's how tag move. That's the movement of that argument. So whether you call I it, see, but calling yes, it, but can't you, I mean, sure. It, it is prosaic, I suppose, but I don't think that that actually removes it's, it's true. Well, you're like, using I mean, a lot of prose and using a lot of rhetoric yeah. that doesn't address or deal with the actual argument itself. That's like saying that math is boring. Suppose, so but math is boring. So two plus like, Math is boring, no, 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 so no, hold man. on. That's, that's not what I'm saying. That's, uh, that's, um, I, ne- uh, I didn't not say that's what you're saying. Chill out. I said that's... Well, it seemed like it. Right, I said ahead. it's yeah. like that. That's an analogy, okay? So it's not... You're not saying math is... Uh, it's to say that okay. the, the conversation is boring has nothing to do with the questions of preconditions. So the, the you know, tag, uh-huh. hin- tag hinges on the status of... The status of preconditions, giving mm-hmm. account for them. Oh, like, um, well, I, I don't want to keep repeating this. I happen to believe in God, so I feel sort of like insincere at the moment. But it just seems that this issue that I just – like I'm trying to dovetail this with the it, it picture of what's happening that Nietzsche and the Robert Sapolsky remarks. Like if – you know, it, it, Tag just sort of fails to push one into belief. And for that reason it, – it, and part of the reason is it seems required to Hold have on. the education you have, Jay. Hold to on. understand the Hold argument on. fully. But that this not, is a flaw. No, none of that has anything to do with whether the argument is true or false. So those are... It, it remains a flaw. It means it, it like limits Tag's ability. 
I suppose, to push anyone into, like, I mean, at a certain point... I mean, a lot of people have converted... Hold on. looking for proof. Dude, it's gay oh, to keep looking for proof. I don't think you understand Especially, what... You say that a lot. I don't think you understand. I mean, I, I do have a, a master's degree, but I may be... I'm also a little stoned right, right. now, though, so I'm at a weaknesses and strengths, and, and I'm not in my house with my books. So, anyway, c continue. I'm, I'm, I'm listening. What's up? Can't hear anything. Moving on. The 400. Uh, hey, Jay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hey, um, hey I was calling about, um, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, I'm working at a women's shelter right now, so I don't have a ton of time. Um, I was wondering when, like, during the week, um, we're able to do like more of these. I'm just connecting with some of your work recently, and I've got some questions. Did you have a not so much debate, but more like feedback? Uh huh. Um, and uh, yeah, so so if you could start with uh, like when's a good like? I think this is the second session I've kind of like logged into, listened to for a couple hours. Okay, so the topic, it's so it's a debate forum. What we do is we offer yeah. people to come on and give argumentation where they disagree with yeah. uh, Protestant ideas, Catholic ideas, Muslim ideas, atheist ideas versus yeah. uh, arguments that I might present. So okay. do you have that or not? Well, it would pertain to like I co-founded an abbey uh, based on like the uh, ancient Irish tradition. Um as uh, as obscure and veiled as that may be, okay. um, coming from a Protestant like background, um, last few years mildly enchanted with some of what's going on um, in the Orthodox tradition. Um, always kind of wrestling back and forth: Am I doing the wrong thing? Am I in the right stream? Um, so yeah, we're we're kind of uh, floating. A little isolated because we don't really have a place in Protestantism. Um, some things are attractive to me about Catholicism, but not many. A couple things, um, but I would it would be more a presentation or like a well, an interaction with you about here's kind of what we're doing, here's why, here's yeah. the. I mean that the uh, that's not really. That kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not trying to be mean or rude. Um, yeah. It's just not that's not my. I can't facilitate right or answer those kinds of questions. So. Um, okay. but you know, maybe you could reach, I, I would say reach out to like an Orthodox bishop or, uh, you know, the Orthodox church around you, but thank you for that uh, comment there. Jamirican. What's up, Jamirican? we got Jamiroquois in the house. Virtual insanity. Speaking of Jamiroquois, virtual insanity is what's happening tonight. I'm on that. I'm on that virtual insanity tip tonight. I'm dancing like Jamiroquois. Virtual insanity. What's up, Jamirican? You got to unmute. So y'all see how my patience has been extremely tested and pushed to the point of snapping tonight. I've been hopefully somewhat patient. I have really had to kind of really struggle to, to be patient tonight. So, uh, Jamaican, uh, you had your chance. Thomas, you, you came on. All you guys already have been on. And you guys know that it's it's disagreement night. Hick House. That's a good that's that sounds good. Hick House. What up, Jay? Mm-hmm. You been doing hey, the uh, Oh my bad. Oh shit. Sorry, uh, you go. I thought Roy R, I thought you already came on. Go ahead. Hickson, Hick, Hick, whatever, Hick House. <coughs> yeah, no, I was gonna say you're on a you're on a terror tonight. Um, I uh, in in thinking about what you've been talking about, I was I I figured you may entertain me for twenty seconds on the idea of you know say you know you and me are 
you know, spiritual beings showing a human flesh to you, and we're at a supermarket picking uh, a religion, right? And uh, and the question is, like, what 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 are your requirements for religion? Because, um, you know, I think everyone has their own. I don't know. Uh, you could look at the, you know, neurons wrapped around feelings from you know religion they're taught in childhood, or this, that, and the other. And so my question is, I don't know, to you, if you're, you know, say you're on the open market for religion or say no other religions exist and you're going to create one, you know, what is that, what do the priorities look like? You know, what are the, what are the need to be there? You know, like pure capitalist, you know, let's make a religion, which I sort mm. of think. I'm on the open meat market. That's what I'm saying. If everybody looks at, <laughs> if you look at these guns, you'll see the the meat market. Now Tristan's over there sweating and getting nervous. I'm sorry, Hickson. I don't under, I don't understand this. And we're gonna have to move on there. Uh, what are the requirements for a religion if we're shopping? I mean, I guess it's gonna depend on what you think religion is or what you're looking for. I mean, Orthodox Christianity offers to man. Um, you know, the pathway to eternal life, becoming like God, deification, theosis. That's that's what we believe in. Uh, but thank you for that question. Let's see. Now, somebody's in the chat fussing, saying, uh, Royar, uh, didn't you already come on? Like, everybody who's all fussy has been on. Flame, too. You already been on. You can come back on. Yeah, just make it. It's weird to me that people can't make. They just have no idea what an argument is. They just think it's like arguing or something. Go ahead. Hey. Mm -hmm. Wait. Is it me or Fraser? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so uh, you were talking. Um, I, I just wanted one quick question that I'm out of here. Um, you were talking about with that Mason guy about Manly P. Hall mm -hmm. and how his lecture with astrology at the end of that it mm -hmm. said that it was all about just promoting yeah, socialism joint, yeah socialism united nations that's the whole selling point yeah um what part was it i wanted to look it's further. like the last of the whole lectures on astrology so i don't it used to be on youtube i don't know if it's still there it's like the last, so the last of it the, his last lecture on astrology at the end does he just say it's about socialism yes and is that what Freemasonry is all about? So it's just... Well, I mean, Freemasonry is not absolutely necessarily socialist, but many socialist revolutionaries uh, were absolutely Freemasons. Absolutely. 100%. So the topic tonight, guys, is God's existence, Catholicism, Papacy, Protestant. It's not the philosophy of Freemasonry, unless you want to say that Freemasonry has a, the correct theology of God or something. Roscoe. Roscoe, you got to unmute. Can you hear me? Mm hmm. So I just got a quick question about uh, something you were talking about angels. Mm -hmm. I heard on the Go ahead. Did you, so, did you have a topic to debate about Protestantism, Catholicism, Orthodoxy? Oh, uh, no, I don't. Okay, so it's it's open debate. What what were you what what do you want to ask about? Uh, I heard you on another stream say that when the angels were tested, they were tested um, in just a moment. But I was reading uh, a book, The Religion of the Apostles by Stephen D. Young, and uh, he said that angels were appointed over nations and then they fell away uh, out of out of the uh, the the council of God. Yeah, the, uh, I agree with I agree with that. So, if they were tested in the moment, how could they fall out of that council, the divine council? Because the angels exist in the aeon, which is outside of time. It's a timeless eternity. Yeah, but how were they in the council and then out of it? Because that's in the aeon, the timeless eternity. It's not a it's not a thing in time. Okay, I don't know if I quite get this. Right, so if you read Vladimir Lasky's book, uh, Dog Orthodox Dogmatics, there's four pages in that book that deals with the aeon and what that means in Orthodox metaphysics. And this is something that contrasts our view with Platonism. So we have a uniquely no, uh, uh, Orthodox idea that there is a created eternity known as the aeon. And that's the realm in which the angels live and inhabit. So they, don't, they, they can be in time, 
but they don't exist in time the way that we do. It's called the Aeon, A-I-O-N. And many Orthodox okay. theologians, including St. Maximus, talk about the Aeon. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like people saying they want to come back, bro, if you didn't, mm -mm. I mean, you, you came on, you made your arguments. Um, it, it didn't work. Ryan Burr, what's up? Do you have a disagreement, uh, an argument you want to make? Nate says for $5, how do you keep up between the politics of the seas? I don't keep up with politics. I'm interested in geopolitics. We talk about a lot. Garrett, $64, $5. What do you think about the concept of panpsychism? Uh, no, we don't believe in panpsychism. That is a, a heresy that we would reject. Thank you for that, Super Chat. Ricky, $5. What's wrong with belief in the Roman Catholic sense of the Eucharist created grace? So that's two different senses. Obviously, the Eucharist is a created thing in the sense of bread and wine. The question is the grace that we get in that Eucharist is not created. So the grace itself, as Maximus, or excuse me, as uh, Ephesus and Cyril say, is the uncreated energies of God. And this is dealt with in the decree of Ephesus and the two letters to six census where it talks about uh, what we get in the Eucharist. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, so, um, like I've been looking around like the world around us and uh, um, does this not remind you of like 1920s Germany before like you know you know okay so the topic is well, protestantism to catholicism I, I i i know but that has like something to do no it doesn't so the topic is protestantism catholicism islam atheism i said at the beginning we're not here to talk about middle east politics we're not here to talk about tiny mustache man that's not the topic tonight uh so wooler what's up wooler Dr. Trillin sends $5 and says, uh, in regard to your debate with Jake, have you watched Khalil Adnani's cross-examination of Jake? Yes, I've seen all the discussions between those two. Uh, Dr. Khalil annihilates Jake. Uh, I'm familiar. Thank you that for that, Dr. Trillin. Oz, Ozpod, $1. I've seen a paper that was scholarly calling <laughs> St. Athanasius a Sibelian. Um, I'm sure you can find an academic paper that says everything. The, I mean, I had classes where uh, the entire class was about trying to prove Shakespeare was gay. So, you know, th that's what academics do. Can you explain this? I would just, uh, just read Orthodox sources. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. Octavian, $25. What trans, I mean, it's, it's absurd given how often St. Athanasius defends the Trinity, that he would be a Sibelian is preposterous. What translation do you of the Orthodox Bible do you recommend? Uh, I mean, again, I'm a big fan of the Orthodox Study Bible. I've been using it for many, many years. Um, you know, the, the 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 notes overall are really good. Doesn't mean they're always correct or infallible, but you know, 90, 95 percent of the time they're really good and correct. Guy, 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 guy. Three dollars. Could God have made a better world? Um, and this gets into Leibniz's arguments about. Uh, best of all possible worlds. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I think about that. Um, I'm not sure. True Pachamama Believer, $1. Are you or FDA aware of creationist books against evolution? Yes. I mean, there's hundreds of them. So I referenced many of them earlier. I thought there was one coming out. I mean, there's a, a lot of them. So I mentioned them early, earlier in the stream. Aquanimitas, one dollar. How do you convince a Mennonite that Christ recapitulated everything in the eschaton? Um, you don't, because a Mennonite's not going to know what you're talking about. Just fix the damn wheel on his buggy and move on. Just just love him by fixing his buggies and buying his meat. Cody Cigar, one dollar. Uh, fresh tap, breathy atheist guy is a requested speaker. Oh, fresh. I thought I'll let him on, but he didn't. So he was the breathy atheist. Um, I think he dropped off or we couldn't hear him. So if he's still there, he can he can pop back on. Guys, sometimes on Twitter spaces, if you come in, you got to like come out and come back in. I don't know why, but sometimes it works that way. BMX, shout out, longtime super chatter, big fan of BMX, since 10 bucks. Thank you so much. Bat dude, one, two, three, five dollars. I'm a Christian. One characteristic that I hear Protestants describe is that God is immaterial. Correct. How can the material universe come from the immaterial God? 
Well, it, matter comes to be out of nothing, ex nihilo. And the only way that we know that that's the case is because divine revelation tells us that that's what he did. But we're not ever told how, right? So the Bible isn't really describing the mechanics of creation. It's describing the what, not the how. So it's fine for humans to engage in scientific activities, which is the how. But again, the Bible's not a science manual on how God did this. It's just telling us what he did. So I don't know how. Aiden says, I have disagreements. Uh, uh, yeah, I know Aiden now. Maybe this was prior to you coming on with the uh, Masonic arguments. Khabib fanboy, $1. My mother is becoming a Messianic Jew. She's celebrating Passover, Sabbath, blah, blah. She and my Baptist church and her Judaizer friends are mad that I'm reading church history. Pray for me. Yeah, I mean, if you watch uh, Show Your Mom Lewis's documentary over at Orthodox Shahada about the continuity between Jewish worship and Orthodox worship, because Orthodox Christianity is the real Messianic Judaism. Nineveh, seven, 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 ten dollars $10. I'm convinced by the pizza argument of Pope Francis. Well, that's good. Uh, appreciate that. And also, I am not a man because I have a little bit of beard. So, by the way, what actually counts as an Orthodox beard? Like, what's the actual, like, do we need uh, centimeters? No, I can't use centimeters because that's Masonic. Did y'all know that the the decimal system, Jamie's in there laughing. It's true, though. The decimal system actually comes from Masonic dudes. So, we got to only use King's English here. And it's got to be basically a foot is like this, right? So, the beard literally pretty much got to be out to about here or I don't believe you're Orthodox. I'm just now beginning to maybe think Father Deacon Ananias might be Orthodox because this beer is pretty long. Uh, Tristan, no, no way, dude. Not Orthodox at all. Probably not even a man. Um, so basically, there's only like probably three Orthodox people in America because how many people actually have a beard that long? A handful, if that much. Paul Kelly, tonight everybody's being idiots, Jay. Well, Paul, I'm inclined to kind of agree a little bit, but thank you for that $10. Christus Victor, Christ Vicar on Earth, $5. Math problems, $5 plus 700 viewers equals, that's a lot of money, but I don't think we're going to get that much. Dyer, give me one more chance. Conservative X, Masonic arguments. Uh, Aiden. I mean, Aiden, Aiden, I don't know if you're still in there. You can come back on. I don't care, but you gotta, we got to understand what an argument is. And if you're just going to fuss at me that I'm using big words, then there's no point in doing that. Matt Belcher, $3. Can you show me where the church fathers speak of the Trinity as we know it and understand it today? Uh, oh, the church fathers of the first three centuries. Uh, well, you could start by going to the discussion that I did with um, Inspiring Philosophy. We did, I think, a two-hour podcast where we just highlighted... Um, trinitarian theology in the first and second century so we didn't even go into two to three hundred i don't even think we no we didn't go into the the third century so i mean there's a whole almost two hour podcast you could go watch inspiring philosophy j dyer trinity ricky again three dollars i can't wait for the debate with jake May the spirit uh, empower you. Well, I think the main thing is that, you know, the hardest part about these debates is reading these uh, really long Islamic texts. And so, you know, the Ibn Tamiya texts I'm having to read, I've got like four of them, but one of them, two of them I did, I've done. Uh, one of them is the really long one, and it's pretty dry and boring. So it's just it's just a matter of like, I fell asleep twice trying to get through this even to me a book so what's up wheeler um so yeah my question is how would you respond to the kantian objection of uh tag that it's the categories are just in the mind well i mean that would reduce to the problems of kantianism which is that his whole system could not be known because he can't know what's outside of his own mind so in other words uh, the whole system is undercut by not being able to know because other minds are part of the noumena. But you're just using the exact argument he gave, but flipping it to prove your argument. No, I'm flipping it to prove that Kantianism doesn't work. But how so? You're using a 
transcendental argument. Which no, is I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying that on its own grounds, Kant's system doesn't allow Kant to know if other minds work that way. Mm, but I don't think his argument is a question about minds. It's a, it's a you just said that what if the categories are only in the mind? That's Kant's position that the categories well, exist in the mind. In it's the mind. It's an epistemological question, not a metaphysical or ontological. So do you understand that if they exist in the mind, as Kant says, that's Kant's position, Kant's own worldview is undercut because he can't know if other minds work that way because other minds are part of the noumena. Well, we share the same nature as humans, so we each have our own. Uh, that goes outside of Kant's, you can't go there with if you're a Kantian. That's the noumena. You don't know that. Well, how can you prove that? the categories exist? Well, the you, the, hold on, that's a different argument. So my argument is that it's not Kant's argument. The categories have to be really existing metaphysical things, like Aristotle thought. Uh, why so? For one, because of what I just said why about is that Kant. Necessary though. Because there's no other way to structure it's, the logic of sentences. That's meaning. An, it's, it's a non sequitur. You can't no, it's just not. jump from that refutation to saying, "Oh, therefore, it actually exists." You're making a positive claim. No, the argument is that the by the uh, by the impossibility of the Kantian system, they must be really existing things. Well, if there's a disteleological world, then sentences aren't possible. So teleology must be a real metaphysical principle. Okay, well, can you go back to the uh, refutation of the Kantian system? How, how does not knowing... Are you not aware of, of the critiques of Kant? Like, there are already many, many critiques of Kant. And this is a very yeah. famous critique of Kant. Okay, but then the response would be, it doesn't matter if we don't know the the nature of other minds then he can't it. say that that's that's true he can't say that my that categories exist in the mind he only knows he about his own exist for you for the, the, are you not listening to what i'm saying are you not listening you can't it's an unjustified claim you don't understand how okay you're gonna have to actually like give an argument and not just assert your claim I'm not making an argument. I'm talking about Kant's own position not working on Kantian grounds. It's not me asserting Christianity. I'm saying that this is a classic critique of Kant. You're not aware of this? I am aware, but you're not articulating it. I am articulating it. <laughs> what do you mean? I just gave you multiple articulations that Kant's own claims about his own system go outside into the noumenal realm, which by Kant's definition you can't know. Do you want me to bring a professor in who can help you with this because he'll say what I say? You want a professor in here? That's an appeal to authority. No, it's not. It's, it's an policy. attestation. No, it's not an appeal to an authority. It's helping you out. That's I'm not it. saying it's true because Father Deacon says it. I'm saying that he will help you understand that what I'm saying is accurate. Okay, why don't you try explaining it in your own words, though? All right, we're done. Bill Veneer. Bill Veneer, unmute. Hey, Jay, how you doing, brother? Mm-hmm. Uh, just two quick questions for you. I'm not calling the debate uh, or uh, offer an argument or anything. But okay, but that's what topic is tonight. So uh, Protestantism as related to geopolitics. Again. I'm sorry, man. That is, I, I have multiple time, multiple times tonight specified that no, that's not what we're doing tonight. I'm not trying to be mean to you. Uh, you're welcome to call back in. So I do open it up for geopolitical discussions at times. Uh, Bayes quotes. What's up, dude? Thank you guys for the super chat. Oliver says a dollar. If we have free will, should we be scared of temptations? Um, I think we have to fight our temptations when they're temptations towards sin, the passions, but I don't think we should be afraid of free will. Go ahead, Bazed. Bazed guy. What's up, the Bazed guy? Tristan, the Bazed guy in the house. Hey, Mr. Dyer, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm trying to wrap my head around tag, but um, I guess I still don't understand. Couldn't the atheist theoretically just say that he presupposes, like his worldview just presupposes like all of those issues 
you know, the fundamental issues that you talk about a lot. Yeah, but it's not a matter of just saying that I presuppose or just you presuppose. We already agree that everybody has presuppositions. It's a question of giving an account for those presuppositional categories. So that's two different things. It's not just saying, well, I presuppose God. You presuppose categories. So I guess we're at an impasse. No, no, no. Everybody presupposes the same categories, the preconditions for the possibility of knowledge. And the question of tag is just, just who can give an account for those categories. Does that does that register or is that not clear? Um, I'm trying to think because I guess I recently watched your debate with uh, Dilla Hunty, and mm. I guess that was kind of what he was trying to argue, and I didn't really understand. Yeah, so Matt said the presuppositional transcendental categories just are okay, but that doesn't work in a debate. Just are what? And just saying something is is not a justification for how that thing exists. As Matt himself says, you should never believe in something that is empirically verified. He admits in the debate that transcendental categories are not empirically verified, and he says they just are. Just are is not an argument. It's not a justification. It's an arbitrary assertion. It means absolutely nothing in a debate. Just are what? Just are where? Does that make sense, or are you there? What's up? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I'll look more into it. Okay. Yeah, good questions there. Yeah, I think if you uh, go through like some of the discussions that uh, Father Deacon and I have had in the past about uh, like epistemology and justification, um, those talks that we did would actually be very uh, helpful for the topic that you're bringing up. Uh, we'll go to, we'll get a bunch of more people hopping in here. Zargons. You know what? I'm going to have to go TT. So I'm going to have to go TT. Um, y'all just hold on for a minute, but I got a, I got a message from our sponsor. Don't go anywhere and we will continue on. Cause I'm just in a mood. I'm feeling some type of way. I'm feeling some type of way. I'm feeling some type of way. And we're going to continue this cause I'm having fun. And you know what? I've just submitted to the fact that it's going to be crazy stuff all night long. I don't mind. It's okay. I just let's just let's just marry the madness. Bring it on. But look, I got to tell you about our sponsor first. And and that sponsor is Chalk.com, baby. I'm gonna put you on something crazy real quick. Now, all you Most people over here, just hold on one minute. I'm gonna go tea tea. guzzling synthetic dyes and synthetic sweeteners on the daily. They don't even know it. Goofy AF. There's nothing great about that. Do not listen any further unless you are an alpha or sigma male. This is important and there could be consequences. There's a new certified sigma male pre-workout powder for sigmas only. It is guaranteed to empower you to dominate your co-workers, fire your boss, aggressively gamble, or invade a small village. Chad Mode stands out from the crowd by excluding artificial flavors, preservatives, sweeteners, and dyes. We've even avoided so-called natural flavors, which are actually not natural at all, ensuring a clean and effective formula. Experience the pure goodness of Chad Mode, colored with organic blue spirulina extract, organic lemon, cherry, and organic maple crystals. Forget synthetic caffeine made in a sketchy Chinese lab. Embrace the natural power of organic green coffee bean extract, which will get your mind going and pump you up to the max. Chad Mode is made in America with all clean ingredients. The first clean pre-workout of its kind. Why are these people adding synthetic sweeteners to every single pre-workout when there are many studied downsides to consuming nasty fake sucralose? Each dose of Chad Mode contains the kick of a cup and a half of coffee, delivering a surge of energy alongside essential vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and herbal extracts. Chad Mode will allow you to fire your boss and dominate People do call in at times to try to like, you know, get you riled up. And 
it doesn't bother me. I'll just roll with it. In fact, I wanted that beard dude to come back. The dude saying that I'm not actually masculine, a man because I'm not have any He ran off. So, so nope, trying to trying to call me out. Basically saying I got a basically a gay beard. And that's okay. You know what, man? I, you know what? I just sometimes I gotta come out of the closet with my gay beards on. So Zargons, Matt, what's up, Zargon? So to debate, I would like to say that do Protestants and Orthodox hold as firmly to the conviction that the word became flesh? They do, but they don't. I would argue that they don't embrace the doctrine to its fullness. They don't see all the way to the bottom or draw, draw out all its implications. Okay, so, so who truly has the, the right answer on it? Catholics see God's continued enfleshment in the oil, water, bread, and Who Who and has the true answer, I asked you? The true answer? You said Catholics and Orthodox don't have the true answer on it, so I'm asking you. Okay, who does? Who, who's the, got the right answer? No, they have the they have the true answer. They they just don't hold as firmly to the conviction that word became flesh. Okay, who truly holds to it then? You? I mean, who? Who's got the right Not answer? Not me. The, the Catholic Church. Okay. The who? The Catholic Church. Okay. So we don't have the true answer, but the Catholic Church has the true answer. Yeah, what do you, I have no idea what you're saying. What what's the argument? Um, the argument would be that Catholic, the the way that Catholics uh, but um believe in the incarnation of jesus is more profound it's more deep it's more firm so wait, you're saying roman catholics have a better understanding than orthodox is that what you're arguing i wouldn't say a better understanding i would say just more rooted and firm in tradition can you understand that the orthodox church holds to the christological teachings of the first seven councils and the roman catholic church typically doesn't even know what those are most Roman Catholics. So I don't know where you would get that. What What's the correct Christological view that we're supposed to have here? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, dude. That God became, God became human so that humans might become God. Yeah, I mean, that's Orthodoxy 101. All right. Well, yeah, if that's the case... That's all I got to say. Okay. Gohan Bach. What's up? This is, this is wild. Good grief. OG Cowboy, $5. AI will reach super intelligence. Proposition one. This proposition two constitutes a mind. Refute this. Why would, first of all, Intelligence is not equivalent to uh, complex algorithms. AI is always only input data and algorithms. That's never intelligence. When we say that it's artificial intelligence, it's based on an anthropomorphic analogy that computers work like human minds. So it's another kind of like bait and switch word concept fallacy to think that because a computer works like a mind, that it is a mind. So putting in more algorithms is never going to make it conscious nor does it ever make it a mind so there's the refutation of what your point it trades on um um fallacy of uh well word concept fallacy gohan unmute bro this is just it's just too entertaining to not continue with this i mean we don't usually get this much wild feral activity I mean, hey, can yes, you sir. Hear me? Mm hmm. Well, what's up, first of all? Yes, sir. How you doing? Second of all, all right. So, real quick, was that I saw a screenshot earlier. Was the Pope really on this stream? I'm going to put you on something. Yes, that was really him. I'm going to put you on something. How long was he on? Was he really the speaker? Dude, it wasn't the Pope. Come on. All right. Look, I, I just want I want to believe. So, that's that was the first question up. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that was actually the most pressing thing. I'll pass the mic. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. Matt, what's up, Matt? Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, I just have a question mm. about... Wait. Go ahead. It's about an uh, atheist argument. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not really an argument, but it's a... Uh, it was... Well, my friend was arguing with an atheist, and he asked, if we were made in the image of God, then how can we sin? And I just don't know how to respond to that. Well, being made in the image of God partly means that we have uh, freedom. So that means we have the ability to choose different options. And unfortunately, in the fallen world, that means we have the ability to choose sin. So being made in the image of God does not mean that we are equivalent to God in virtue. We have to learn to choose virtue versus choosing uh, vice. Bayou Jarrett. What's up, Bayou? Yeah, so Aiden, do you want to come on the stream again? And I, I'm happy to explain these things if you can relax and not just machine gun. So and when Orthodox Christianity says that we become God, it does not mean what masonry means in terms of being your own God and, and apotheosis. So this is why words don't always have the same meaning. Okay, it's a word concept fallacy. So by you, are you there or what's up? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. What's up? What's I on just your wanted mind? to get your... Um your view what is your view of the nature of scripture and do you have like an evidential argument that you can provide to kind of substantiate that um i do believe that the scriptures are inspired i don't think they contain theological error i think that there are copyist errors i think most people believe that there are minor copyist errors but that the unanimity amongst textual scholars for the first uh you know a few centuries of the thousands of manuscripts in terms of the 90 to 95 percent unanimity amongst the texts, i think suggests that the uh veracity of the text i mean the new testament in the first few centuries is like the most attested to document in history it's even more attested to than plato's writings so if you're talking about like historical attestations to the veracity of the new testament i would say those kinds of things are examples of that but the reason i believe the bible ultimately would would be things like messianic prophecies being fulfilled very precise prophecies as well as philosophical arguments like the transcendental argument and so forth okay yeah because when I've seen a lot of Christians debating skeptics, uh, they it seems like they get backed into the most that they can say about the scripture is that it's, you know, mostly historically reliable. Um, and they I haven't I haven't seen Christians step into the ring with a skeptic and actually try and defend that the that the scriptures, the Old and New Testament are the literal word of God, you know, it kind of depends on your, your definition of inspiration. Do you believe that the Bible is, is equal to God speaking in, in every, right. every so part? So the, the word of God is the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, the, the, like the Messiah is the logos. They're identical. That's the one person that's present in Christ. So the word of God is not equivalent to a book. The book is called the Word of God because it's the revelation of the person of Christ. So it's not identical in the same sense. And that's, a, I mean, I'm not saying you do this, but a lot of Protestants commit the word concept fallacy where they think that because the Word of God is Jesus, Jesus is the Bible, right? This is like KJV uh, fundamentalist type people. Um, we, we, we wouldn't say that, but I do think that the Bible is uh, historically accurate and so forth, reliable, inspired, etc. So if... if someone were to convince you of an error in the bible what, what would that do to your faith well would again you be... it would depend on the type of error because i said there are copyist errors and i have a not a copyist error it's something that all them let's say let's just say theoretically every manuscript agrees this is the correct reading and it's some historical fact that is proven to be like Incorrect. Okay. Or and it, what's it where, where's, what's the argument? Where is this argument? 
Uh, it's a theoretical argument. I'm not making a specific okay. argument. I mean, I, I can point to there's the in the Gospels is where you're going to find the most. You have two different. You have three. If you're talking about the synoptics, you know, you have three different accounts of the same event, and this is where most of your you know quote unquote contradictions are going to. Yeah, rise I'm, from. I'm aware of many of these claims and many of the arguments, and there's a lot of scholars and there's a lot of argumentation that reinterprets and rebuts those things so that's why so for instance there, there's one in particular that I've, I've never really heard anybody address uh, uh well i mean i've brought it up before and people say well it's talking about two different events but i think if you read the context and it's clearly speaking of the same event you talking about the gadarene demon event. which one the gadarene demon event uh, no, this is the parable of the wicked husbandman. So at the end of the parable, uh, Christ says, uh, what therefore will the Lord of the harvest do to those wicked husbandmen mm -hmm. or something along those lines? Okay. And then, and then Christ answers the question. He'll miserably, he'll miserably destroy those wicked men and give the vineyard to another. Right. right? Okay. And then in, in another gospel yeah, it's account, in Matthew. it's right. Yeah, I believe it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right. And it, in, in one of them, Christ gives the response. He's going to destroy them and give the vineyard to another. Mm -hmm. And in, in another one of the gospel accounts, it's the, the scribes and Pharisees that respond. He asks the question, and then they respond. Mm -hmm. So in one gospel, and, and if you read the context, it's the same. I, I can't remember exactly what the, the context is, but it's the same surrounding context. Yeah, but so, the parable. Right, but Matthew's audience, for example, is... A Jewish audience and you've got other gospel writers focusing primarily on Gentile audience right so if there's a highlighting of the response of one group that's in Matthew's gospel it makes sense for example why it would point out things like scribes and Pharisees whereas uh, uh, you know the Gentile directed gospel might not talk about that because it's not rel as relevant to that audience so yeah, but so who said the response? Was it Jesus or was it the Pharisees? Because it depends on which. So this this one really got me because now you're, if Jesus said that, then one of the Gospels is putting the words of Christ into the mouth of the Pharisees right, or on. vice versa. And that's that's why it really caused me pause because I'm like, well, this is these are this is actually Jesus speaking here, so this isn't like. You know, he he crossed the sea and and he landed someplace he shouldn't have landed. So this is putting the the words of Christ into the the mouth of the Pharisees, and, and also just like the the view of you know, uh, I mean, it depends on how you look at inspiration because a lot it seems like a lot of Christian apologists and stuff when they even talk about the Gospel of John they're going to admit that a lot of this dialogue and monologue of Christ in there is, is rough approximations. These are not uh, word for word the things that Christ said when he prayed to the Father or something like this. And you pretty much have to argue that, well, just the Holy Spirit just told John what to write because no one can really understand exactly where he would get this type of information from. Well, but I mean, if God is God, why couldn't he do that? I mean, he could, uh -huh. but, but that's that, I mean, that's the same argument that anyone could, that's the same argument that a, a Mormon could make or, uh, well, yeah, but I mean, you know? yeah, but the fact that a Mormon could make that argument doesn't have anything to do with whether that might be the case here. Right. So I'm not saying it's true because, uh, other people could make that claim, but what I'm saying is on its own grounds, that's not a problem. So the fact that some other person makes that argument isn't relevant to this case. But I mean, by the so, way, so hold on, when, let's go, let's go to the first one. So I've got Matthew, uh, you know, the parable of the vine dressers pulled up here and you're mm -hmm. talking about at the end of the parable or. Yeah. Okay. So it's, end. okay. So it says like 45, the chief, uh, priests, Pharisees heard the parables and said he was speaking of them. They sought to lay hands on them. It's before that. Okay. It's when he asked the question, they said, what is he going to do to those wicked men? And he said, mm -hmm. and they said, he'll, he'll destroy them and give the vineyard to another. Mm -hmm. I think Christ answers in Matthew. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to, and, and he, 
and he, he tells another very short parable uh, after that. The stone uh, the builders actually, rejected, okay. Yes, correct. Okay. So it's before the stone that the builders rejected. Okay. It's right, right before that, like the verse before that. And you're saying that because in another gospel there could be the... Re- I mean, maybe Jesus has made this point in the past, and so they're repeating. I mean, Jesus does reemphasize and restate things. So I'm just not seeing why this would necessarily be a contradiction, but... What's the other? Yeah. Go- what's the other text? Uh, well, I, I don't. It's. I'd have to look it up. I'm on my phone. It, it might take me a second to do that. But if I just do a search for. So you're talking Sam, about the get, same parable in uh, what Luke? Yes, it's the same parable. It's the same. It's the same context around it. Like the all the the narration leading up to it is the same. Mm-hmm. So the argument that these are two different events. Uh, is a bad argument. I think I, I don't know why you would make that argument other than to just try and reconcile and harmonize. There's no other evidence that I've seen to do that. You know, it's the same parable. He asked the same qu- question at the end. The same response is given, but in one, it's Christ responding. In the other, it's the Pharisees responding i'm gonna try and pull it up here okay well i'm in luke 20 21 okay luke 20 is the luke's version of the vine dressers Yeah, so Matthew twenty one forty, when the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? Mm-hmm. And they say unto him. So in Matthew, they respond to Christ. He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and he will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen, which shall render him mm-hmm. the fruits in their season. So that's in Matthew. Mm-hmm. And then, um, let's see, so the... It's Luke 20. Okay. I appreciate you taking a look at it because, I, like yeah. I said, I, I haven't really gotten. Well, I mean, it's I'm not I've not heard this one. I mean, I've heard a lot of these over the years. I'm not this one's just not familiar to me. So I'm I'm always willing to take a look and see. Yeah, and it I says, that. yeah. So verse, uh, let's see, twenty, Luke twenty thirteen. The owner of the yeah, vineyard. So if you pick it, yeah. If you pick it up in like fifteen. Uh huh. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore? So here's the the verse again. Uh-huh. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? Uh-huh. And then Christ answers. So this one it doesn't say. And they said. So mine keeps the words in red, but we'll disregard that. You know the the red lettering because that's not inspired, right? Well, hold but, on. Uh, no, I, I, you're, you you missed me thinking of a, a KJV person. I don't I don't think that the non-red letters are uninspired i don't know where you've no I mean, I mean the 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 it being color-coded red is something that the the translators do i'm aware it's, that's their interpret saying that this is christ speaking so. i know because that's that's the it has nothing to do with is. yeah but that's nothing to do with like our theology but go ahead yeah so in this one uh it's Christ answering his own question, you know, what therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. So obviously that's not them speaking that answer. That was Christ. So this is, this is the same parable. Um, And if you look at the contact. Yeah, but like, I just don't understand why this is a big contradiction because you could have multiple people in an audience engaging in similar types of things, right? Like, for example, the way that the Bible describes the death of Judas, right? There's two aspects to the same event, right? He's hung and then his body falls off of the tree and it busts open, right? And then people say, oh, there's a contradiction in the way that the Bible gives the account of Judas's death when it's just two different descriptions of the same event from two different angles, right? One is the, the hanging. The second is the fulfillment of the prophecy when the, the hanging body gets bloated, pops and falls off of an open busts open when it falls off of the tree. And so what I'm saying is that 
you could have Jesus describing this parable and perhaps he's told this parable before and different people in the audience are replying to him and Matthew and Luke are highlighting different responses. So even this isn't necessarily a contradiction. So explain to me how they both how they both respond with the same response. How Christ responds because, so we're talking about the same event. Because it's a crowd of people, right? And you can have within a crowd of people, if Jesus has, for example, made the same point many times throughout his ministry, you probably have people that have already heard this. And so you could have Jesus and people in the audience both responding like, oh, oh, right. Like a, like when you're having a lecture and a lot of people are in the audience and then some people say, oh yes, this. And then you say, yes, this, right. Uh, I mean, I don't, that doesn't seem like a, a plausible or reasonable explanation to me because, because, because Luke is, is, he is writing down this account of Christ, mm -hmm. right? So, right. So but Luke's he, writing for a, Luke's writing for a Gentile audience. Matthew's writing for a Jewish audience. So what they, it, what they emphasize will be relevant in that regard. Sure. And, and I mean, there's other little things, you know, that I, I don't mind like wording differences or whatever, or emphasis different. I mean, it's not word for word the same, obviously it's, there's differences, but the, the, the problem is that, that Matthew has Jesus answering his own question and then Luke, or sorry. Matthew yeah, but I mean, this, the, again, this is like, why cannot, I mean, have you ever been in a large crowd of people where you're having a loud debate and a, and a discourse with lots of people? I've done, I've had it many times, right? And so if, for example, you've stressed something in the past, they can, the audience can shout something and then I can also say it too. So it's a, in other words, it's like a false either or, like it's got to be either way. And what I, all I'm saying is that, I mean, why can't there be, you know, the same, just the same phrase being said by both Jesus and by the Pharisees? Why does it have to be either or? Because that just seems, that to me, that seems weird. Like the, the more, but it's not weird if but it's not weird like, if both gospel writers are emphasizing different things for different audiences one for a Jewish audience one for a Gentile audience um but, uh, to me the more plausible explanation is so Luke was not present with Christ at well, this time we don't this know is, we don't know that well, as far as we know, he, well, uh, he, he, he that, went and interviewed on, says, people to says, write his gospel, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's picking up these stories from the, the eyewitnesses or the people that he's interviewing. I mean, does he say that at the, does he say that at the beginning of Luke? I don't recall. I mean, maybe that's what he says. I mean, or is it, are you saying that's what yes. scholars say? That's what he says um, at the beginning of, of Acts. But okay. he includes, he says, the former treatise, treatise that I written unto you, O Theophilus, uh -huh. you know, to take into account the things which we are assured, surely believe of. And, and he, he says that he, uh, yeah, he's got okay, a whole, this, like, this, introduction. Right, I'm reading it right here. I've got it pulled up. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, this doesn't say yeah. that he wasn't there, does it? No, it doesn't say he, he wasn't there, but we don't, he's not mentioned in the gospel account. So if he's there, he's, he's just, he, he's not mentioned, you know, he's, he's not like one of the, well, but I mean, there's giant people. crowds of people. So, I mean, yeah, so he could be there. Right. That's, that's true. But I, I don't see any reason to think he was there. I mean, we just, there's no, evidence, well, but I mean, no you're just saying, you're just was. saying that we know that he wasn't. And I'm saying, well, how, how do I'm we know that he wasn't? That I'm not saying that we, we know that he wasn't, but I, I think that he's, you know, he's writing his gospel, I think is the, is the longest of, of all of them, if I remember correctly, but mm -hmm. he's, and he's, he's got a lot of more like detailed information about different rulers and, and, and kind of specific historical mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Because he, he's writing he for, a a of, cause he's writing for a gentle audience. Yeah. So, so he's going and, and, this is this is why the view of inspiration is like and, and inerrancy is kind of difficult because Luke is, you know, when I first became a Christian, you kind of have this idea of inspiration that Luke just kind of sits down one night and it's dark and he's got a, 
a candle lit and, and God just inspires him and he just writes the gospel of Luke one night or in a couple of nights. But this is a project that probably took him months and months, if not years, to, you know, investigating and interviewing. Yeah. I mean, this is just like, I just don't, this, this seems like a weak one to me, honestly. I mean, I'm happy to look at this and I just don't see why it can't be focusing on different, uh, different persons saying the same phrase, which again, if we're talking about, let's say, let's say there's a big, um, debate that I have in person with somebody. And let's say that a bunch of atheists show up, a bunch of people that have followed my channel for a long time, the last three or four years, and they've heard me say a lot of stuff, right? And let's say in the course of uh, me telling a story, I'm talking to the crowd and they shout out something that's a phrase like, let's say they say, yeah, unmute, dude. And then I go, exactly, unmute, dude. And then two people are recording the event one guy records, and Jay replied, unmute, dude. And another guy records, the audience shouts, unmute, dude. Are either of those accounts false? No, they're both true. Just like the death of Judas, where he hangs himself, and then his body falls and, his bu and it busts open, right? It's not a contradiction. It's, it's describing the same event at the beginning and at the end of the event. Does that make sense? Why, why can't, why, why is that not a plausible way to interpret this? I think it's, 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 well, uh, to me, it seems ad hoc. Like you're just saying, well, they both said it. No, I'm just and saying, when, I'm when, saying that that happens in the course of the gospels when people repeat phrases that Jesus has already said. I mean, doesn't I mean the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone that comes up multiple times in the New Testament, right? Yes. Yeah. So I mean, like people have heard Jesus make and say these phrases and use these arguments probably multiple times throughout his ministry. For example, like he talks about, uh, you know, the kingdom of God will come, uh, and many many standing here will see the kingdom of God coming, and you know he says that phrase a lot, right? So we wouldn't yeah. we wouldn't conclude that. Oh, well, he only said that phrase one time, and then the other times he could have never said that phrase, right? I mean, why can't, I just don't understand why you can't have one gospel writer highlighting uh, a response from the crowd and another gospel uh, writer highlighting Christ saying the same type of argumentation or response like he does often. Yeah, I mean, you, you I think that's the only way you, I mean, there, so I've heard two responses, and, and one is, is the response you're giving now that, that Jesus said it and they repeated it back to him or something. And for some reason, Matthew wrote down, you know, what they repeated back and, uh, which, but if you, if you look at it, um, oh, so let me continue my thought. So Matthew decided to write them responding and mm -hmm. Luke decided to write him, him responding because they had different emphasis or something. Yeah. Um, well, or, I mean, or, or to say that they're just two different events, and both of those explanations are not as good to me as just saying, "Well, Luke, when he was getting his gospel information, that's the story that he got, and it was one detail of it was wrong, mm -hmm. or it was right." And Matthew, one detail that he wrote, you know, he said he said that this person responded, and it's actually this person. And my my thing is like, well, that's okay. If that's if they got if if Jesus didn't actually answer and it was them and one gospel writer said it was Jesus, like, that's okay. I'm I'm I can live with that. I'm not gonna abandon Christianity because of that. And I think of the view of the inspiration of the Word of God is like being God literally speaking. This is like this is God. God okay, so said, do you, you know? believe Some that? I want to say the Bible says they they say. No, God says this. God says this. And it's like Paul talking about Do something. you believe that uh, the account of Judas's death is a contradiction? No, that one's no problem for me. But it's the similar it's a similar type of thing, right? So like if if we're admitting in the case of Judas's death that one gospel writer can uh, emphasize the body falling and busting open and the other gospel writer can emphasize that he hung himself like by your logic, it should be either or, right? Because just like in this case, it should be either or. To me, it's more like one writer says that 
Judas hung himself, and another writer said that somebody hung Judas. No, it talks about so his body about falling. Same, it talks about his body right. falling and busting open. Yeah, so that's. I mean, I. That's fine, because it's it's two very different things that you can synthesize and harm, harmonize. Whereas this is, it's the same event, but. But, but again, have you ever been in? I, have, so, if you've been in an event where a lot of people are, you know, I mean, Jesus is the most controversial person in history, right? I'm not that controversial, but I've been to live events where uh, people stand up and yell at you, and they yell out, you know, things that you've said. Um, Bryson Gray came to a live event yelling things out. We were yelling back and forth. The crowd got involved. The other debaters got involved. So if a person was at that event recording, they have they might record emphases of, and Bryson Gray was saying blah, 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 and Bryson Gray was refuted by his own arguments, right? Um, other persons might record that, and Jay was replying to Bryson, blah, 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 right? So it's two different accounts of the same event emphasizing different things. Again, to me, this just doesn't... I would. I need a harder argue, a version of a contradiction. To me, this is just. To me, it just seems like a weak one. Honestly, I mean, is there a? I mean, if we already so if, go ahead. If you if you harmonize them, so that, then you basically have to say something along the lines of this. Christ asked this question at the end: When when the Lord therefore for the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Mm-hmm. And then uh, they say unto him. He will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Right. And, and so also, imagine a situation. And also, at the same time, Jesus says, uh, um, what therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do? He'll come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard to others. Mm-hmm. And then they give this long answer too. It's just like, it doesn't make any sense. It makes more sense. That they're just, they've got their sources and there's a little bit of a difference there. Like, I don't have a problem with it, but they both can't, I mean, I, I don't want to say can't, but they both don't seem, they seem to contradict. Yeah, so, in so what I'm saying, yeah, but what I'm saying is that if it's not on the surface a contradiction, that we have to assume that, that it can't be reconciled through emphasizing the crowd and Jesus saying the same thing, like... I mean, I've had that kind of thing happen in crowd argumentation. So, like, imagine that we're imagine. Let me let me give another example where it's maybe a little more applicable, right? Imagine I'm a, debating a bunch of Muslims, and one thing I've always said is that you know uh, God is one in many, and the Muslims always say uh, one 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 equal one, right? So imagine that I'm making fun or I'm provoking Muslims in a debate, and I say the Muslims always say one 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 equal one, and then. The Muslims reply to me, oh, Jay says the Muslims say 111 equal 1, right? Is it a contradiction if one person says that the Muslims said it and another person says that I said it? No, and I, I understand your explanation. Right. But I mean, I why, why can't that happen if it seems like a very common type of thing that happens in big crowd level debates? Uh, just because when I put them, when I put these two, when I put these accounts side by side, it, it, that just doesn't seem like the most reasonable explanation to me. And, and that's just my preference or anything. But I think the, the deeper point of this is uh, like, if you have a Christian who is convinced that there's a contradiction, all right, like, like I am. Uh, of, of one, even though it's small and pretty insignificant, you know, it, it's the most significant. It's significant to me because it's Christ speaking or not, you know, but so. So then, I, th- this sounds like it sounds like you came from like a Protestant evangelical background. And then you had the idea that there's this sort of mechanistic view of inspiration, like, you know, like they're possessed and they write the text or something like that. Like there's not a human element to it or something like that. I mean. Is that your background, like Protestant evangelical? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. And and, and the, the thing is, you're, you're taught that like if there's if there's one error, then it's all then it's all untrue. You might as well toss it in the trash can and you know eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. 
And I just feel like that's dangerous. And I think it causes people to, to have problems. They're like it almost caused me to have problems. Instead, I just changed my view of inspiration. And it's mm. not just because of this one text, but it, for a lot of just learning more about how the Bible was was written and, and transmitted and, and just realizing that, you know, when you read Christ speaking in the Gospel of John, that he, he probably didn't say those exact words. You know, it's probably something along those lines. And when people just say, you know, God said this and God said that, and they're, you know, reading from, I don't know, Ruth or, you know, Ephesians. Okay, and so what, and what is like, your view now? My view is that the, the authors of Scripture now, were... Now, what, what religious view do you have now? I'm a Baptist, so I'm a, I don't know how to, else okay, to explain. But hold on. But, so, but you were reading about the formation and history of the Bible, and you're a Baptist. Oh yeah, I, I love and and, not, and like secular okay, sources so, too, and not just like. How do you? How if you know about the history of the Bible, then why would you be Baptist? Because that has nothing to do with being Baptist. Like the Bible, who who put the Bible together? Like who formed the canon? Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I, I can't speak a lot to that. I know Catholics say that they did, you know, or whatever, but and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I, I'm talking more about, uh, you know, I was, uh, I've read about um, manuscripts and how they're discovered in, in Egypt and different places. And, okay, and, and that's uh, what. What is that? What are you talking about? Nag Hammadi? What do you, I mean? Yeah. And, what, but that, that doesn't have the, and stuff. That's the Gnostic. And so they find codexes. They find codexes that are, are like. I'm aware. You know, I know. Groups that, of books that are, are strange. It's like Jonah okay. and an right. epistle. And yeah, I would just. Other, okay, dude. Thank you. Book, you know? All right. I would say I'll look into the history of the formation of the canon, and that will raise interesting questions about uh, the church. Idra, Idara, what's up? Aiden. Um. Yeah, again, must, uh, Manly P. Hall's philosophy is not coherent, and I'm happy to address that, Aiden, if you want to come back on, but um, I don't see you in the chat, so. Idara, what's up? You gotta unmute. Oh, hi, I'm so sorry, I was on YouTube. Um, I'm gonna put you on... I just sort of I'm gonna put you on... I was going through the spaces. I'm going to put you on something crazy real quick. I want to participate because I've had some really interesting experiences. I'm someone that grew up as a Christian, but I was someone that was really curious if God really existed. Just something I really always wanted to know. And I sort of believed, you know, miracles and the stuff in the Bible should happen, but I just didn't know how. I mean, it just kind of seemed like... If it says that this is possible in the Bible, it should be true. But okay. well, do you have an argument think, about the topics, or? Oh, the topic about which faith is. Uh... All right, I'm not trying to be rude, but uh, so the topic was debate, right? Debating Protestantism, Catholicism, Islam, atheism, and so for people to come on, you need to have a, a question to debate, a topic to debate. Jack, what's up, Jack? What's up, Jack? What's up, Jack? We're going full Manson on y'all. What's up, Jack? Aiden sends a dollar and says, I've calmed down. I've ordered a dictionary. Apologize from crackhead Gen Z. I am conservative black man on X. I thought you were Aiden. So, Jack, do you want to speak or you just wanted to sit there for a long time? Elliot Smith. What's up, Elliot? All right, my neck's starting to hurt. I don't know how much more I can go. By the way, if you guys want to support uh, FDA, you can do so by getting the link to Lore Coffee, uh, an excellent Orthodox coffee brand that you see behind me. The link is in the show description. I'll also put it in the chat right here. Uh, Elliot, do you want to unmute or what's up? Hey, Jay. Uh-huh. Elliot. Yep. Hey, Jay. Next, How you doing? Good. You'll have to mute me in the background, dude. Can you hear me? Yep. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not an agnostic, or I've been an agnostic for most of my life, but raised Christian, kind of leaning back towards Christianity and deism. But I'm trying to figure out the orthodox perspective on creationism. And I know you're a creationist, I guess, but I'm trying to understand <clears throat> why is that critical to orthodox like faith to accept the interpretation of Genesis of creation? Because it ties into Christology and the doctrine of Christ and what Christ did as the second Adam. So Christ can't be like a second evolutionary Adam. He's got to be the same Adam as Adam. Okay. But why can't, so why, why, why can't you accept like a, um, sort of like a, um, what do you call it? Uh, I mean, there's other reasons as, as well. Like death is uh, unnatural. It's not a natural thing for orthodoxy. It's unnatural in Romans eight. All of creation is subjected to bondage. And so Christ's uh, recapitulation would be, um, undone if, um, if Christ isn't the second Adam, if he doesn't recapitulate all reality like Adam did. Okay, so intelligent design would not work like like God sort of starting the evolutionary process in motion that resulted in... Death like, is a result humanity. of the fall. It's not a thing that exists for aeons to produce Adam and Eve. Death is the result of the fall. So there would be no death without the fall. So it's not a thing that exists for aeons to produce Adam and Eve. Okay, so like all animals would would not die? There's no death before Adam and Eve. Therefore, death as a process of evolution cannot be the thing that exists for aeons to produce Adam and Eve. Okay, 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 I get it, I get it. Um, okay, so then I guess... I don't want to get into a huge scientific debate. But well, I mean, let, let's just, we can do like the philosophy of science debate because, I mean, I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm just saying like most of the time people that argue this stuff can never tell me why I'm supposed to believe in their theory of science. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a scientific process. You accept that you accept the scientific process, right? Yeah, I know. I'm asking about the philosophy of science. Okay, well, I don't know if I'm equipped to, to debate the philosophy of science, but I guess I'd, I'd just like to understand, like, how do you reject uh, modern science's, like, um, contention that the Earth is, like, four, four and a half billion years old based on radiometric dating? and Because all of, that, all of that is based on presuppositions baked into the measurements themselves. And the people making these claims are going outside of the bounds of what can be known from observation and making gigantic metaphysical leaps and telling me gigantic stories about the origins of the universe, which is not justified on the basis of um, a lot of times um, physics things that are occurring that can be explained on both models. So a creationist and an evolutionary theorist or a big bang theorist or whatever, they can both have equally accurate uh, descriptions of, of various phenomena so that uh, the phenomenon themselves are not going to tell us the gigantic age variations and differences so that's when i say how does empirical observation tell me a priori all of these gigantic uh descriptions of aeons of time and the people that i ask that question to can never even tell me about their epistemic theory to begin with or why i should believe in empiricism so for me, none of it philosophically gets off the ground because they don't even realize they're assuming all these metaphysical things and all these, all of these things that go way outside the bounds of what um, empirical sense data can actually verify. Okay, but you're so you're saying the scientific process itself is not undergirded by like a a proper philosophical basis. Yeah, I'm saying that most of the time, the average uh, biologist or life science guy or uh, uh, physicist, um, I'm trying to think of the people that I've had debates with um, from the science realm, um, neurobiologists, neuroscientists, um, like they don't know anything about philosophy. And I'm not saying that makes my position true. I'm just saying that when I start asking them questions about the scientific method, like they can't justify the method. But the method is supposed to be the thing that, in their view, confirms this idea of gigantic metaphysical truths. So how are we going to get back to metaphysical well, truths when modern scientism is premised on rejecting metaphysics? 
well, I don't think I don't think figuring out how old the Earth is is a giant metaphys- metaphysical question. It's just well, there you go. So there, there you just you just demonstrated my point that uh, science e men have no idea what metaphysics is, and they don't even realize that absolutely that's a gigantic metaphysical question. Of course, it is. Well, it has it has gigantic metaphysical consequences, but it, the science itself is when someone's conducting a scientific experiment or analyzing data or looking at radiometric evolution, you know, processes, igneous rocks. Okay. What do you think? Um, what do you think metaphysics is? What do I think metaphysics? Uh, I can't give you a definition of metaphysics, but so hold on. So you don't, you know that science isn't making metaphysical claims, but you don't know what metaphysics is. No, I, I think it has metaphysical consequences. Uh, I don't think I don't think a scientist has to be a philosopher. I mean, a, a grand philosopher of metaphysics, right? A scientist can just be doing scientific scientific experiments. Yeah, but right? that misses the whole point that I've just been making. That you don't realize when you're going outside the bounds of what the tool of the scientific method can tell you and what it can do, and you end up making these gigantic metaphysical claims. And that's the thing I'm calling into question. And then when I ask you what that is, you tell me you don't know what that is. Well, I mean, just just to get back to basics. Now, wait mean, a minute. What? So, yeah, let's back to basics. So how do you know that they're not making metaphysical claims if you don't know what metaphysics is? Uh, I, I, I don't know that they're... I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know that they're making... <laughs> 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 no, I don't know that they're making metaphysical claims. You're right. But I know that they're making scientific claims, right? So you're you're just... You're trying to poke holes in the scientific process by no, referring you to... No, you totally misunderstood what I said. I just said the scientific process is a tool for uh, doing certain things, studying the natural world. It can't give you the things they want to make it do. That's what I said. So I absolutely okay, so believe in that. So, so that's right, a... So, I, did not, I never questioned the scientific method. Okay, so just a basic question. So why, why does radiometric dating... Why cannot why cannot give you cannot give you evidence of the age of the earth in millions of years or billions of years? Because the I mean, methodology already has in the system baked into it the long aeons of billions of year date. It presupposes the thing that I'm questioning. That's why I said both models. Well, are you familiar? No, you're, hold on, are you familiar with what's called the underdetermination of data problem? Uh, vaguely, I mean, I, I think I get what you're, go vaguely. ahead and tell me. I think I okay, get what you're well, saying. What, what is it vaguely? Under determination of data. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're saying that the, you're drawing a conclusion from the data. No. Um, they cannot be drawn is what you're saying, right? No, it's a problem in epistemology where, uh, certain theories can be accurately and sufficiently explained by different models. And so piling up more evidences or more data, for example, is not immediately going to tell you which paradigm can explain the same data. So it's a famous problem in epistemology where um, it's a way to demonstrate or show that just having more data isn't going to tell you the paradigm of the data. And so that's why it doesn't work to say, yeah, but I can give you more and more examples of data, which proves the age of the date, which is ba- the age of the earth, which is based on the thing that's in question. So th- what I'm saying is that so like radiometric dating uh, or the similarities between like the, uh, you know, percentage of DNA that's shared between apes and man, both the creationist and the evolutionist model, both have sa- the, uh, both have explanatory models of the date, the same data. So it's what I'm saying is that data doesn't solve the underdetermination of data problem. Okay, but what what about when different strains of science, different disciplines of science, match the same theory? And in, in other words, they they corroborate well, the theory. Well, that I mean that depends on that's, the theory that's in not question. Persuasive? Well, it depends I mean, on what's in question. So, but that isn't going to tell you the metaphysical claims. That's what I'm trying to say. It's, it's never going to get you there. Yeah, I mean, I understand that it, if you have different disciplines of science and they all point to the Earth being 4.5 billion years old, um, that could be biogeography, it could be plate tectonics, it could be... Yeah, but radio- those models magic. all assume... The, the models already assume the thing in question, right? That's what I'm pointing out. 
So you're just point because all of the people producing those papers and those models already believe in the the long date thesis. And I'm saying okay, that. Okay, so you're. I mean, I agree with this theory, like when it comes to climate change, but I have a harder time connecting that. Oh, but wait a minute. Oh, so the system only lies about climate change. Does it lie about uh, gender studies or not? Is that like because I I can go meet a bunch of doctors that tell me that I can be a woman. I think it definitely lies about that too. Oh wait, 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 okay, but they don't lie about anything else. Is that right? No, I mean, I'm I'm open I'm open to the possibility that, but I mean, are you suggesting that it's it's almost like a unspoken cons- conspiracy about all these disciplines of science that are pointing to I'm this? I'm saying that here? they make the same mistake that you make, which is to think that looking at a piece of data like a rock or ge- uh, geologic structures itself a priori gives you an aeon's uh, uh, timeline of date when the same model of a creationist model can accurately and sufficiently explain that as well. So in other words, we're looking at, let's say, um, strata of, uh, uh, I don't know, like in the Grand Canyon or something, and we see these different layers of uh, dirt and whatnot, and, and, and one model says, oh, the only way that this could have been produced is over aeons of time. And I say, well, but wait a minute, um, there was a thing that opened up in South Dakota overnight. And it's basically a mini Grand Canyon that happened like that. So how do I know? So in other words, I might look at the thing that opened up overnight in uh, Montana or whatever. I can show you the the article. And I might look at the structure and the layers there and say, oh, the only way this canyon could have formed is clearly by, you know, 100 million years. There's no other way to explain it. Or one other example, the fly geyser. Why this, uh, you know, stalactite, uh, stalagmite structures like this, these uh, calcium deposits, they can only form in, uh, you know, 10 million years. That's a, that's how long it takes for it to build up when everybody knows the fly geyser uh, built up over 40 years. So what I'm saying is that the models themselves are going to reinterpret the data that's in front of us to fit the model. So every time you tell me that, well, there's another science uh a team that says that it takes a zillion years for the light from Zeta Reticuli to get to Earth. Well, God can create a universe where the light is already present from Zeta Reticuli. It didn't spin spin off from a single uh, Big Bang that uh, took a billion years to get here, right? You see, both models can accurately, sufficiently interpret data. And so more and more data, which is what you're talking about when you tell me that you can pile up science papers and science men, more and more data is never going to get you to proving the model that interprets the data. That's why philosophy of science is prior to doing science. Sure, but I think empirical science can also build models, right? It yeah, can go again, the other direction. No. You, so you just showed that you don't know what you're talking about right there. And I'm trying to be mean to you. But <laughs> by definition, yeah. empirical science cannot build you a model because models deal with prior to science things like epistemology and metaphysics. So maybe we mean different things about models there. I'm talking about worldviews. Yes, yes, we do. We do. Uh, Yeah. Okay. I know. I get what you're saying. So how far are you willing to go with this? I mean, the biblical, the biblical like story of creation. And so is the earth, would this take? I'll tell you what, how about, you tell me what the model is, right? So what am I supposed, I'm supposed to believe in uh, what empirical science, how does empirical science tell me, first of all, what happened uh, uh, on Earth one billion or one hundred million years ago? Um, th- I mean, I I could go. With, I mean, you want me to go into science? I mean, it would be through the geologic record. Oh, wait, whoa, 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 whoa! But that's not empirical data of what happened eleven million years ago. That's an interpretation no, of of evidence to, of evidence. Yeah. Well, it's an interpretation of objects, rocks layers of strata right yeah mm-hmm. and, and the, where, the, where 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 when you look when you, when you look at that strata or that rock where does any of that tell you a date it tells you a date based on the ratio no, no. Of so the... now that's interpretation so that's my point it, the empirical evidence in front of you does not tell you anything like that you interpret the evidence according to the paradigm and the question is how do you know you have the right paradigm maybe you do but how do you know that Okay, so what you're telling me is that we need scientists that accept the view that the Earth is about 10,000 years old, then they need to start doing science based on that paradigm, no. and they will figure it out. They will figure out that the rocks are really 
not that old? No, I've just been giving you classic arguments and examples from philosophy of science about how philosophy is prior to the doing of science. But everybody who does science doesn't recognize this and doesn't know what I'm talking about or what philosophers are talking about. They think they're just playing word games or something when they're asking real questions about the things that are underlie the scientific method. How what makes the scientific method possible? That's the things I'm talking about. And those I things mean, I find that yeah, that's fascinating. I'm, I'm, okay, but I'm guess what? Those things are not in the purview of the scientific method, so they can never get you to that. But did the but did science just go off the rails then? I mean, what happened? Why why have all these disciplines of science gone off the rails and and taken on this erroneous theory? I already explained earlier that science and scientists typically don't know anything about philosophy and so they don't know when they're talking about metaphysical claims that go outside the bounds of the limits of their system and their science but you're you're suggesting that there's a boundary that they shall not cross if the science takes them somewhere that crosses a metaphysical boundary they should not cross that boundary but that, no I mean, i'm that's saying that they need to give an account for what they're talking about if they cross the boundary and that they're not they're subject to their own limitations but they don't even realize that because they don't know what they're doing when they do it so it has nothing to do with all of scientists in the world going off course and buying into some grand conspiracy. It's more so that people adopted worldviews that became popular, normative, and were pushed down from the top, from Oxford, Cambridge, places like that, the Royal Society. They have pushed this materialist empiricist, par empiricist paradigm, which probably 95% of the West believes. And it's a nonsense gibberish paradigm, which if they understood it, would actually make science itself impossible. That has nothing to do with whether those people do science. So they can do science all day long and they can come to true conclusions. They can discover things in engineering and mathematics and whatever. That doesn't mean that they can give an account for or justify their system, their claims, their beliefs, or the metaphysics that underlie it. That's what I'm saying. Okay, that's fair. Can you just tell me real quick then, under your view, the Earth was created around 7,000 to 10,000 years ago. Is that right? Sure. And the, was the whole universe created at that moment with the stars and the... Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, have you not read Genesis? Yeah, okay, so, and the solar system as, do you, do you accept the conventional solar system too? Uh, what do you mean by the conventional solar system? I mean, obviously like heliocentric model, you accept I that, don't have right? any. I don't have any hard set view on any of that. Okay. Um... So, do you believe in? I mean, you accept? Do you accept space travel and like Mars and Elon Musk and all that stuff? Uh, I don't believe that we're we're gonna fly to Mars. No. Okay, but you but believe I do believe there is a Mars. Mars exists. You believe that Mars exists and that it is rotating okay. around the sun. Uh, of course, Mars. What? Like, why would I not believe Mars exists? Okay, I, was, no, I mean, I was, are you I trying to try troll to, me now? No, 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 no. I was just trying to. I was just trying to understand exactly your worldview on mm -hmm. on the nature of like the Earth and the yeah. salt and sun, all that stuff. Well, I mean, I I don't claim to be a physicist or any of those things, and I don't have to be a physicist to ask questions to people who make grandiose claims, right? So a lot of times, for example, people in the science sphere will say things like, you know. Um, outrageous wild uh you know claims require outrageous wild evidences and so i just hold them to the same standard and i say um you want me to believe that something came out of nothing and that you know various species who don't even have within their dna the ability to be another species produce other species because there was a mutation so to me that's a giant non sequitur leap that underlies a lot of these kind of ridiculous pagan myths i mean to me the idea that something comes out of nothing and that one species mutates into it transmutates into another species to me that's a uh, fairy tale stuff so um so my, what about microevolution uh yeah i don't have a problem with that i mean that's just adaptation we observe that okay so no, like, has anybody ever observed uh macro transmutation no um no they haven't it doesn't exist they haven't well i mean I, yeah there's gap you oh mean, but like wait a minute i thought you were an empiricist so where's the empirical observation of this you don't do metaphysics because that goes uh, up no where's the empirical of, of macro transmutations that you said yeah um i mean i'm not i'm not a hardcore evolu evolutionist in terms of human evolution but uh, i just have a hard time buying into um 
buying into the the Genesis story. That's all. So well, like, well, I I have a hard time buying into the conflicting, contradicting narratives of uh, uh, atheist retards who can't make sense of uh, basic metaphysical claims. So I'll believe your science when you tell me the philosophy behind the science. Understood. Can I ask you another question? What sure. What is um uh like in the Garden of Eden? So when when God created like all the animals and all the and the humans and or Adam and Eve, what um, you you believe that there was no predatory behavior between the animals? Like it, it didn't. Correct. The orthodox it, view is that the functioning of the natural world prior to the fall was much different than it is now. So it's a very metaphysically different world when uh, Eden was there versus the modus operandi post fall. So. Right. We didn't have, uh, you know, biologically uh, engineered bodies to, you know, try to chew uh, meat. Like, I, I wouldn't need incisors. The bodies were very different, and that's different than most, you know, Western theology of the fall and all that. So, orthodoxy is a, a much more um, cosmic metaphysical account of the fall and its cosmic scope than what you typically find in Protestantism and uh, Roman Catholicism. So, they don't they don't accept that view they they believe that animals were predatory who catholics uh most catholics uh believe in evolution post uh humani generis or whatever Pius the 12th okay so so what you're saying is the so we would have had microevolution after after creation to become carnivorous yeah i think all uh predatorial components and the, I mean, the very makeup of our bodies to, you know, take in nutrients from meat fats and our guts, all of, all of that is post fall configuring, so to speak. Okay. And do all Orthodox, uh, churches and priests, um, accept this? Do, do they, do they preach this? Uh, no, but I mean, what that doesn't really have anything to do with whether it's true or false, because you can read uh, Father Seraphim Rose's book Genesis Creation Early Man, and I mean I'm I'm holding to the traditional view. Okay, okay. So what are you a minority? Is that a minority view, or is that the majority view? Amongst priests or amongst laity or Orthodox, who? Orthodox, among, yeah, amongst Orthodox priests. Um, I don't even bishops. know. I don't even know. How, the, there's probably never been a survey of of most i would say probably most like american orthodox priests probably favor something like theistic evolution but i have no idea what the percentages would be they favor wait which one do they favor they would probably favor theistic evolution because they're taught in western universities okay okay um i i missed i missed the earlier part of the show what what were the recommended books on creationist uh science stuff well, the Institute for Creation Research has a lot of good stuff, like Doc, Dr. Jason Lyle. His books cover a lot of probably what you would be interested in. Um, but again, I'm not a scientist, so I don't I don't claim to. I mean, people give science this sort of like authority and this uh, power that they don't even really realize is like the emperor's wearing no clothes, and they think that I'm like I'm not anti science. I'm just pointing out that. What you think is science is actually just a lot of metaphysics and alternative storytelling. And I, I would say, you know, real hard science is stuff like engineering, like people using principles to build, you know, computers and, you know, the outrageous algorithms that go into making this, uh, you know, Apple computer. That To me, that's real science. But people that... Um, you know, speculate about what happened 11 million years ago and what, what the monkey was doing when it was fighting with the, you know, snake in the tree 11 million years. That's just all bullshit, dude. That's made up stories that I'm supposed to believe. And if they can give me an account of the basic principles that they're using to make these assessments, then I'll listen to them. But 99% of them can't. So why should I listen to people who can't give an account for their methodology? Isn't that, by the way, kind of being a scientist? I mean, I'm doing the science of investigating your methodology, whether it's solid or not. But isn't it funny that most of these people don't want to be questioned on their philosophy of methodology? Well, it, it's it's not that funny because they're not philosophers, right? They're not equipped. Oh, so I they mean, have assumptions that they're working on and they think that they're doing something. And when I call into question, they'd rather not answer those questions. 
Sure. I mean, they probably don't. They probably don't have a lot of time or inclination to study. Philosophy well, and they don't like even realize have. that they're doing metaphysics when they're doing science. Well, they don't realize that they wouldn't. I don't think they would accept that interpretation. Uh, but I mean, I, oh, I get what you're really? saying. I, I mean, you're you're saying. You're but saying you didn't know what metaphysics was, so how are you going to say that's wrong? I mean, give me a definition of metaphysics, real quick. Well, but wait a minute. You've been saying that they don't do it. I mean, metaphysics is what? The philosophy of knowledge? Is that what you would call it? No. So you just basically showed you have no idea what this is about. A, a, a pest, epistemology of, That's of knowledge? That's philosophy of knowledge. Metaphysics is not the is not epistemology. Two different disciplines. So anyway, okay. I'm not going to be, I'm not trying to be rude to you. I appreciate your questions. Can, We're just going to, we're going to move definition? on. Um, I've, right. I've covered that many, many times for many, many years. You can go buy my philosophy course if you want my free lectures. Um, but they're all, they're all, all that's free, free as well. Um, anyway, I can't do any more. This is, I'm super, super tired. Thank you guys so much, uh, for a wild night. I, I, I couldn't stop. It was just so wild. Right. Um, but if you want to support my channel, you can go to the shop at Jay's analysis and get my big fat red book. Um, I have some of my philosophical critiques of evolution in the red book. Um, you can also get my Hollywood books there as well. Like esoteric Hollywood one and